Pass. Make it.
Раз, раз.
Friedrich Friedhof uh, in the French army, and later he had to do it for the, um, after the, the Vienna Congress for the Kingdom of England, uh, for the new regions, uh, the Kingdom of Hanover in England, one uh, within this Congress. And see, so he did a long time, a lot of um, geodesy in Northern Germany, today's Northern Germany. And there is a, an interesting a sighting from Moshe Yammer, um, in the, of course written in the 20th century, that he, and namely Carl Friedrich Gauss, measured a triangle fixed by three mountains in northern Germany, the Brocken, Hoherhagen, and the Inselberg. And the length of this triangle are measured to 69, 85, and 107 kilometers. They're measured in meters already. And it was rarely to be mentioned that within error bars, he, Carl Friedrich Gauss, did not discover a deviation from 180 degrees. Uh, and that is the, the angle sum in a flat triangle. And he drew the conclusion from it that the structure of the true and real space, so far as experience permits a statement, is Euclidean. To show you that, this is our, uh, uh, an old bill, German Deutsche Mark, and you see on the back side this network he did in northern Germany, Carl Friedrich Gauss. And if we go now, and this is my second statement at the beginning, um, we can say Carl Friedrich Gauss, latest in 1816, was convinced of the existence of a consequently written non-Euclidean geometry. Um, although he didn't know anything at that time, later, of course, at three-dimensional Riemannian manifolds. And, and he definitely was aware that, and this is a sighting as well, if one could measure the sum of angles of an extrinsic triangle on Earth, and this is not along the Earth's surface, or calculate this sum from related measurements, then one could get a direct or indirect information of the space curvature around Earth. Um, but he was also aware that his instruments would not allow him to measure precisely enough. And that's what I like to bring in as a motivation why we uh, now, today, try to find better and better uh, instruments to measure the very weak gravitational fields in our solar system with satellites. And we talk about effects of 10 to the minus 9, not more, and weaker, and that's the problem, and that's what I like to talk. So the outline is, let's first discuss a little bit about space's laboratory. I'd like to give you a little bit of an introduction, a little bit of, about history of fundamental physics, mainly, of course, gravitational physics in space. Then I like to talk about quantum sensors in space, and um, like to apply it to acceleration. We have to measure time and gravitational redshift, time and navigation, communication, and optical links. This is important for time transfer, frequency, and at the end, applications in weightlessness. Um, today, we have space geodesy. It's not just geodesy. We do it in pump space. What you see here is uh, the GRACE satellites. These are two satellites forming a gradiometer in space at a distance of roughly 120 kilometers and linked by an optical link um, in between. And you can measure, you see that here, the Earth's gravity in an order of um, the, uh, more than 2,000 um, uh, uh, in the spherical harmonics uh, of the Earth's gravitational field. This is what we call today the Potsdam potato measured by the um, gravitation center in Potsdam. And um, this is what you see the Earth. Earth, so to, so to say, is the best known planet we have. All others are not as well measured. Mars with some, um, uh, Mars has maybe roughly two to 300 in the um, spherical harmonics, but all other planets are really badly um, uh, measured so far. Mercury is now better, two to two missions, uh, they are there. And um, so not more and more we learn about the gravitational fields of planets. Um, if we take space, a laboratory for fundamental physics, and we see we have the theoretical background, we have the models and theories, but we have a lot of inconsistencies in between. That's where we have discussed the last days, a lot of things. And then we have experimental confirmation uh, for general relativity, well confirmed. 
we have a precision cosmology up to today and a standard model of quantum physics, but we have a lot of unexplained phenomena. And what we now can do, we can go in space, and there we have indeed a unique laboratory because we have infinitely long periodic freefall, which is possible. We can do long interaction times with our uh, atom interferometers. We have large potential differences along elliptical orbits, as well as large velocity differences. We have extreme sizes of experiments and arrangements. This might be important for gravitational wave detection. And then we have undisturbed observation. We don't have atmospheres. And last but not least, weightlessness. And this is important. And the question we can ask is, um, if we measure something, it's not only just that we measure effects and um, maybe forecasts. We also can ask the question, how constant are our constants? This, I think, is a very important question for the future. And this can be done, of course, in space. And we have um, a discussion on that. Um, what are the constants? Are they really constant? And the question is, can we discover maybe new constants? An example could be maybe the introduction of um, a quantum constant. We can ask the question about um, can we increase the importance of them? Uh, can we um, uh, reduce them uh, to from one from more than one constant to maybe only one? And, and the other question is, uh, what about? Um, new ideas coming in, and so on. And there are many, many things we can discuss, but the constant of, of, of nature is, is important in the understanding of our basic physics, and I think uh, we can do it very precisely in space, more precisely than on Earth directly. And I'd like to give you a little bit of historical background what what happened. This is an experiment which had been done already in 1976 with the Viking landers on Mars. And it was uh, operated roughly um, eight years on Mars, six to eight years on Mars, two landers, Viking 1 and 2. And they measured when Mars was in conjunction to Earth, behind Sun, along the Sun rim, the what is called Shapiro time delay of the curve uh, of the curve, uh, Sun uh, solar gravitational fields curvature with an accuracy in a range of one part in 1,000 for the gamma parameter. This is the Eddington parameter for uh, uh, the uh, gravitational curvature. Um, There's a famous experiment which uh, lasted in, uh, uh, along all this time with these two um, mass landers in two radio frequencies. You always need two to um, uh, come out with the problems of the solar corona in X and S band. And this has been repeated with the Cassini uh, spacecraft uh, around Saturn and some years later, um, recently, by um, Bertotti, Yes, and Tortora, uh, this famous experiment, which improved the measurement by two orders of magnitude using X and K band. K band, of course, is much better for this kind of experiment. And uh, what you see here is the uh, einstein infeld hoffmann equation where all these betas and gammas occur. Beta is the linearity factor. And if we calculate all that with space experiments uh, had been carried out during the last, oh, we can say 50 years, no, not 50 years, but maybe 30 years, then we see that these two editing parameters, which both had been one, are met by experiments quite well. Okay, it's a question of the measure now here, but we can say um, we are in a range of 10 to the minus five um, for, for these two parameters. So we have a, 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 a good confirmation what we say is general relativity. Um, these are a short summary of experiments done within the last um, decades. Now, um, the question comes up, what can be done better? And I'd like to point to an old paper already published in 91. Quantum objects are fundamental for establishing a gravitational theory, a matter wave interferometry as an idea uh, to develop um, uh, new types of sensors that what we call quantum sensors, and that's what I like to talk now about. Um, 
what is a quantum sensor? And you can, uh, you can define it. We have, you can find a hierarchy of definitions. The first is to say the sensing principle is only based on entanglement of two quantum states. Then we have only a very small number of sensors, which is possible, of course. The other thing is that we say the sensing principle is based at least on superposition. This is also very, uh, it's, it's maybe not uh, what we really like to have. What I like to say is that sensing is based on all techniques which had been developed during the last decades in order to investigate quantum physics. And this definition then includes also atomic clocks, one atom sensors, and so on. And this is typically what we do today. And you will see that, in particular, clock development is one of the key parts in that. What is a quantum sensor? You need, on one side, an ultra-precise optical metrology. You see, we do it here. The delta mu of a no in, in the range of 10 to the minus 17. We have a, maybe a phase sensitive atom in the ferrometry. And then we need a detector part, a readout, and a comparator. That's what we can define here on that side. And for calibration, at the end, you need frequency comps. And all these tools are there and invented and um, existing. And the only thing what we have to do is we have to bring them to space and bring them out of a very um, uh, well-defined laboratory environment into a very much disturbed space environment. So we will see that clocks work four to five orders of magnitude worse in space than on ground. We will see that this is all disturbed by changing fields and, and um, uh, magnetic fields, electrical fields. This is one of the biggest problems we face if we go into space and on satellites. I like to give you an example. Um, this famous experiment is gravity probe B, and it was the first direct measurement of geodetic and lens tearing, lens tearing precession in space. We have this, um, uh, if we have a spinning space, if we have a, 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 um, if we have a gyro in a spacecraft orbiting, orbiting the Earth, that here, yeah. then we can measure two gravitomagnetic effects. A bigger one, which is called a geodetic precession in a range of 6.6 milli arc seconds per year. And the smaller one, uh, no, the, the, the bigger one is the frame dragging precession due to the fact that Earth is rotating. And this is 30, 40 milli arc seconds a year, roughly. And a much smaller effect, which is the geodetic precession um, of um, perpendicular to this movement is the geodetic precession. And the question is how uh, it has been done. Um, this experiment had been proposed the first time already in 1959, so two years after Sputnik. So at, definitely at that time, the Josephson effect, Josephson effect had not been known. And um, nevertheless, later, there was a proposal to measure exactly this spin change with a Josephson magnetometer, Josephson junction magnetometer, uh, a superconducting quantum interference device. If you have a, a sphere like that and a superconducting coating, then due to the meissner oxenfeld effect and the, um, uh, the, uh, the steady conditions, you get a very small momentum. It's called the London moment, which can be measured. And then uh, uh, in a superconducting circuit, this can be done with an accuracy in a range of milli arc seconds per year. To give you an idea what is a milli arc second, take a human hair from a distance of 15 kilometers and go from one rim to the other one. And this movement within a year will be measured with a satellite today. I think this is a, a, great, uh, a great development and had been done with this gravity probe B experiment and uh, the uh, 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 principal investigator had been Francis Everett in Stanford, and this experiment uh, uh, could uh, confirm the geodetic precession with an, uh, with an accuracy of 0.5% and the lens tearing precession with an accuracy of at least 15%. And um, I think it's a triumph of what we can do with today's um, measurement techniques, particular quantum measurement devices. If we go further on, we have to discuss clocks in space because clocks are important. 
um, for geodetic measurements, for gravitational measurements. And the first atomic logs had been launched on board enough star satellites in 1978. This was the precursor of what is today GPS. And um, up to now, we have worldwide more than 150 GNSS satellites uh, launched and, and are active in space, presently roughly 150. They are active and um, they are distributed along many of these satellite navigation systems. You all know them. NAFTA's GPS, Galileo, Beidou, Jonas, and INS, and, and, and many others. And we have clocks on board of these satellites, mainly rubidium clocks. They're mostly used with a precision of 10 to the minus 14. With, um, and uh, cesium clocks, as well as hydrogen masers. And this is a laboratory in orbit. And the question is how we can use this lab. Unfortunately, they are all on circular orbits. We would like to have them on elliptical orbits or very strange orbits, but they don't fly them They're because it's much easier to have a formation if all satellites are on circular orbits. It's, uh, nevertheless, the idea was to have maybe one of these relatively cheap satellites in a retrograde orbit, maybe on a high elliptical orbit, but it never happened because space agencies couldn't um, discuss this and didn't like to discuss this. Nevertheless, sometimes, I come to that in a second, um, we have luck and then we can do measurements. What are the relativistic effects on these GNSS things? Um, take, let's take a satellite like a GNSS satellite uh, in a circular orbit between 19,000 and 20, 70,000 kilometers. These are the typical orbits of them. And then you have, let's say, we take a, an orbit of 20,000 kilometers which um, corresponds to what we have in Europe in, with Galileo, then uh, the velocity, the orbit velocity is roughly four kilometers a second, which is a small part in C, but reasonable. The time shift from special relativity in this orbit is roughly seven microseconds per day, and uh, the time shift due to gravitational redshift is roughly 45 microseconds per 24 hours. And the resulting distance error per day would be 11 kilometers. And everyone is sitting in a car would say, okay, this will never work in my car. But it's wrong, this idea, because this result comes only if the time from C3 satellite is compared with the ground clock. This is what we now do. We compare four clocks from four satellites at the same time, and then the relativistic errors are completely negligible. Now, the system has been planned for navigation, but meanwhile, we use the system as a worldwide time standard for all the bank transfers worldwide. It becomes more and more important as a worldwide time standard. And that's the reason why one needs clock correction on the satellites um, in order to use these clocks as a worldwide time standard. And um, this was not taken into account at the beginning but now it's taken into account, and that's the reason why these clocks run a little bit slower than on Earth. And you see that here, instead of 10.23 megahertz, we, are, we run them a little, a little bit slower um, in space. And um, if we would, these two effects make the same, that they just ca cancel out, we would have to fly the satellite in a 3,000 kilometer orbit. And uh, this is not possible because then we are in the Fadellen belt and we have many, many other disturbances and it would become a problem. Um, usually these satellites can only be applied to navigation on Earth because we have what we call differential GPS in all our, in all our countries. But nevertheless, the main problem we face are the clocks and the clock accuracy uh, on board these satellites. And um, sometimes we are lucky and this happened in 2015, when uh, the European Space Agency sent, not the, not the European Union, sent up two satellites uh, and uh, the, the rocket was uh, missed the orbit. And we ended up with two satellites in the wrong orbit. And they flew a, a high elliptical orbit with a perigee of 13,000 and an apogee of 26,000 kilometers uh, at an inclination of 50 degrees. And later on, this had been lifted up to bring it out of the Van Allen belt to 17,000 with a 
uh, with a height difference of roughly 8,500 kilometers. And then you can do the test we like to do, I mean, we can test of the gravitational redshift with so far no attained precision. And we originally expected the precision um, uh, of one part in a million. At the end, you will see we ended up with one part in 100 um, because of disturbances. And you can also do tests of universality of the gravitational redshift because you have different clocks. You have rubidium clocks and hydrogen masons on this. And this has been done and published. And uh, you see the results are better than all measurements before, but not convincing enough, in my opinion, because the uh, rubidium clocks um, uh, are um, in indeed uh, much more disturbed than people expected. They work for navigation, but not for precise measurements. So what we need are clocks. They are on long-term stable, not only on short-term. And um, if we have to develop clocks, you see here the different clocks and the Allen variants of this. These are rubidium clocks. These are uh, cesium clocks. These are hydrogen mesas. And what we would like to have are clocks that would be stable over days and days here to apply them for gravitational physics measurements. This is not possible. Nevertheless, we did a lot to develop new clocks. This is one of the new clocks. We are just in tests. It's Compasso. It's a compact, highly stable laser optical clock, uh, which um, is based on an iodine standard. And you see the clocks. This is the clock performance here, this blue curve. Um, it, no, no, this, this, sorry, this, um, this green curve is approaching what we can do with um, um, active um, space mazes, and uh, sometimes better. And um, in particular, in this short-term range here, and this is what we hope uh, the future, but there has to be done a lot in the future. We also have to do a lot to apply them in optical links and laser ranging, uh, because um, at the moment, the main, the bottleneck is not the clock only, it's also the transfer, the time transfer. So we need a higher bandwidth, and this is only possible if we get optical communication. Uh, optical communication, in principle, can be done all over the solar system. Uh, then you need um, signal photon detection. And there was some experiments done in the past with um, some satellites. The most convincing was the experiment on the, on the Mercury a satellite messenger. You see, it was a two-wave experiment um, where they could come up uh, with um, a correlated um, measurement over at 24 million kilometers with the message spacecraft with single photon detection. And then this guarantees us um, a much higher um, bandwidth for the time transfer of the signals. And what we have, these are these kind of optical links. They are now more and more in, in development. I show you here one uh, the German Aerospace Center had done. And the present technology will enable us telemetry areas up to 30 terabits per second. This is much, much more we can attain with microwave links. And this is the precondition for further um, application of um, better clocks in space. Better means with, high with more high precision. We need this bandwidth uh, to do this kind of experiments. You can do experiments, of course, also with entangled, uh, um, in entangled state for communication. And you all maybe know this Quest experiment, the quantum experiments on space scale, Chinese Academy of Sciences did. And um, uh, the idea was an implementation of long distance quantum communication networks based on this high speed quantum key distribution between a satellite and the ground station. And so far, they could do uh, the, the best bell test uh, up to now uh, over distance of roughly 1,200 kilometers. The problem is you are limited by the horizontal line. It's not going all around the world. And that's the problem because you need a direct link. And this is limiting the experiment for further application. So what we would need is, I come to the end here, yeah, um, what we would need is um, in the future, the situation that we can store signals in quantum memories. This is one of the uh, things we like to develop for the future, and uh, that we can store information in the satellites. They go all around the Earth. And these quantum entanglement experiments have been very successful. 
and are so far the very best tests we have. Um, but what we really like to have is uh, this kind of devices, atom interferometers in space. Why? Because um, in weightlessness on satellites, this interrogation time, the interaction time within an uh, uh, atom interferometer can be extended by orders of magnitude due to the fact that we have a coherent atom beam going in, which is cooled down to temperatures in a range of uh, nano Kelvin. And then uh, this time uh, is decisive for the um, uh, measurement of the phase difference, the Sagnac phase, uh, in, a quantum, uh, in an atom in the ferrometer. And there have been done a lot of experiments in the, in the past, and the most successful at the moment is on space station. This is the called Atom Lab. But we also did this kind of experiments in the past on broad towers, as you see here. And meanwhile, on space station, where um, uh, NASA established the called Atom Lab, which is running since um, roughly five years now on board of space station, uh, where we can do all these experiments. And it is really um, amazing to see what happens with these kind of um, measurement devices. To give you an idea here, these are what we produce, are Bose-Einstein condensates, cuddle them in to get the atom lasers for the um, interferometers. And then uh, we have um, here in this case, uh, that was one of the first experiments we did. You see, this is a typical Bose-Einstein condensate after 50 milliseconds. We could just in four seconds, in one second, we could extend this object um, uh, to more than a centimeter and could um, show that this correlation is um, the, the, the interrogation time is lasting more than 10 times longer uh, in a small drop tower experiment than usually on ground. And you can apply that just to give you an idea. Uh, this is, uh, has nothing to do with uh, gravitation, but with temperature. You can use this for measuring temperature or reducing deep temperatures. What you see here is also a drop tower experiment um, carried out in the drop tower in Bremen by a group of the uh, University of Hanover and uh, Bremen. And what you see here is they attained so far the deepest temperature, maybe in universe, we have no idea, because we have no other proof, in a range of 40 pico Kelvin. And this is um, done with this kind of devices. And I think this is a, a convincing proof that this kind of devices are really working and can be applied in the future. I'd like to finish with a statement of Carl Friedrich Gauss. He said, we must admit with humility, while number is purely a product of our minds, space has a reality outside our minds, so that we cannot completely prescribe its properties a priori. And um, I like to change this, because I think more dimensions are always a challenge and need new rules and tools. Thank you very much. By the way, Basil was in Bremen when he was a young guy and uh, learned to observe uh, stars. He was never on university when he became a professor in Kaliningrad. Or to at that time, it was a Prussian university called um, Königsberg. He was never before in a university. And um, unthinkable career, but it's possible.
Thank you. And again, thank you for the much for this meeting. So, and of course, Yeah, you're right. I didn't mention that uh, because you did it before, <laughs> more or less. <laughs> I mean, of course, this is important to say, okay, that we base all the units now on quantum devices. Why not measuring it if quantum devices work? But you're right. No problem. Have you a type six? No, I have a uh, yeah. Just a minute. I will copy this. Only one PDF.
There is a problem with this device. This is what it said. That um, maybe we can just uh, try to uh, get it. Continue without scanning. Maybe it Yerevan? should be Yerevan 23. Uh, I would be happy if we could just uh, uh, you're throw it. Uh, you're talking in the morning, after the session. It's uh, in the morning after um, coffee break. Uh, yeah, after coffee break. Can we check that it's working? Yeah, it works. Or not? No. So there's a problem. That's what I thought. You would have a lot of That's all I think. Okay, I think. Just uh, maybe okay. you touched uh, in touch screen. Just mm -hmm. one click here and only. It should work. Yeah. Okay. So I, th I think, I you think you when live is not a problem. Yeah. Whatever. So there's an empty slide. Um, and what was it? It's I think it will be okay. Okay, it's a very nice one, it's the shadow. <laughs> I, to be honest, uh, I'd like to have that one. Is that important one? Uh, it's a nice one. <laughs> um, maybe it can be show that by video or something else. And if I take my laptop? Laptop, yeah, you can bring, you can try on it. Do you have another stick? Maybe you can put it. Uh, do you have an HDMI? Mm -hmm. Oh, you, mm -hmm. you, you talk about. Mm -hmm. Oh, it would work. Yeah. Yes, it works.
жизни я буду так, и в жизни там будет, я буду вот так. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So, um, as you all know, we have now real pictures of shadows of black holes, which were taken by the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration. Recently, nonetheless, I decided to show you here by way of introduction, uh, actually what I think to be the first um, illustration which shows the shadow of a black hole. This illustration was produced by Jean-Pierre Luminet by hand on the basis of calculation, but then he draw it pixel by pixel uh, by hand. And what you see here is a Schwarzschild black hole surrounded by an accretion disk. The accretion disk is distorted by gravitational lensing. And the shadow is the black disk here in the middle, which is bounded by a thin, bright ring. And uh, so this, this black disk, this is the subject of my talk. And what I want to talk about is how to calculate the size and the shape of this shadow, not only for a Schwarzschild black hole, but also for rotating objects like a Kerr black hole or other ultra-compact objects, and taking the plasma into account. So I, I assume that the light rays are not light like geodesic, but that they are influenced by a plasma. And uh, so that's uh, uh, what I want to talk about. So I will begin by talking about how to describe light rays in a plasma. So the most convenient way is to use a Hamiltonian formalism. And if you want to solve the equations analytically, then you need a condition which is... Um, which gives you an additional constant of motion, which is usually called a Carter constant. So I will talk about um, the criterion for existence of such an uh, additional constant of motion. Then I will consider non-rotating um, uh, objects like Schwarzschild and other spherically symmetric and static spacetimes, and in the last part, the Kerr spacetime. I will give specific references uh, to each case later, but as a general reference, I want to uh, uh, yeah, advertise my uh, review uh, with uh, Oleg Zubko, which appeared last year in Physical Reports. 
And uh, this, uh, the last part of this, rep uh, of this uh, review is uh, on plasma effects. Okay, so uh, light propagation in the plasma. When I say plasma, I only always mean the simplest model of a plasma you can imagine. It is an electron ion plasma, it is non-magnetized, and it is pressure-free. The pressure is negligible. That's what the plasma people usually call a cold plasma. And then the light rays in such a plasma can be described uh, very conveniently by the set of Hamilton's equations with this Hamiltonian. So the first part is the term which you know from the geodesic equation. And then you add something which describes the plasma, that's the so-called plasma frequency. And this is essentially the electron density yeah, with, uh, with a uh, couple of factors in front of it. So the denser the plasma, the bigger the omega p. Yeah, if the omega p is zero, then of course you get the equation for light like geodesic. And uh, that this is really the, the right uh, set of equations for um, a light rate in a plasma. This can be derived from Maxwell's equations. So you have to, um, uh, uh, to uh, build a two fluid model for the plasma, and then you can rigorously derive this set of equations for the light rays. This was first done on a, on a curved space-time, really rigorously, I would say, by Reinhard Breuer and Jürgen Ehlers in 1980. Uh, they even did it for a magnetized plasma. If you are satisfied with a non-magnetized plasma, it's much easier, and there you can find the derivation in my book. Okay, so that's a set of Hamilton's equations. That's a Hamiltonian. And now you see, if you look at this first equation, you calculate the derivative, you see that the velocity is given by this expression, the tangent vector to the rays, and if you reinsert this into this expression, you see that the rays are time-like. Yeah, if omega p is different from zero, this is negative, so this means the rays are time-like. In a medium, in a plasma, the rays are time-like. They're actually time-like geodesics of a conformally rescaled metric. Okay, maybe even more familiar to you is uh, this equation h equals zero, which we call the dispersion relation. If we decompose uh, the form momentum into a spatial part, that's a, a spatial wave covector and a temporal part with respect to an observer field, ui. And uh, then uh, this uh, dispersion relation takes this form. Maybe this is uh, more familiar uh, to some of you. And uh, well, if you have the dispersion relation, the relation between omega and k, then you can form the phase velocity as you learned it in school. And you see that in this case, it's always bigger than c. But that's no reason for concern because the phase velocity is not a signal velocity. Yeah? The phase velocity in the plasma is bigger than C. And you can also form the index of refraction in the usual way as a ratio between the vacuum speed of light and uh, the phase velocity in the medium. And you see this is always smaller than zero, uh, smaller than one. Uh, also, you read from this expression that um, uh, yeah, the propagation is possible only if the frequency uh, at which you observe, frequency with respect to your chosen observer field, is bigger than the plasma frequency. If it's smaller, then the light ray just gets stuck. It uh, cannot pass through the, through the medium. And you also see that if omega is much bigger than the plasma frequency, then you can neglect this term. And you have essentially the same situation as in vacuum. So the plasma effects are interesting if the frequency is bigger than the plasma frequency, but not very much bigger. And uh, just to give you a few numbers, you see, uh, for the solar corona, for instance, the plasma density, uh, the plasma frequency is uh, around 100 megahertz. So um, this is bigger than the density in the ionosphere. So rays with this um, um, uh, frequency can still pass through the ionosphere. You can observe them here on Earth. And if we now consider <coughs> a plasma in the neighborhood of a black hole, then it should be at least in this order of magnitude so that it can be observed on Earth. And um, uh, yeah, but it should not be very much bigger. Uh, so, uh, sorry, the frequency at which you observe should then not very much bigger as this plasma frequency, because then you can neglect uh, the plasma effect. So the, these effects I'm going to talk about are relevant if the density of the plasma is fairly high, at least as high as for the solar corona, and the frequency at which you observe is not much bigger than this frequency. So in the optical, you can completely forget about plasma effects. Okay, now uh, let's talk about um, uh, solving this set of equations, Hamilton's equations. And I'm interested in the case that my space-time is stationary and axisymmetric. That's the general form of a stationary and axisymmetric metric. And I also assume that the plasma density depends only on R and theta, so it shares the symmetry. And I want to ask, uh, do I have enough uh, constants of motion for complete integration? And with this assumptions alone, the answer is no. 
you have uh, d by dt is, uh, so the t is um, uh, uh, the t direction is the symmetry direction, phi is the symmetry direction, and you have the Hamiltonian itself as a constant of motion, make three. But you need a fourth one in order to integrate the equations. And the fourth one comes from separability, so we have to require separability in order to get this fourth constant of motion. So you write down the Hamiltonian, write down hamilton jacobi equation, and you require that the hamilton jacobi equation admit solutions which split in this form. Then you say you have separability, and uh, this is uh, equivalent to saying that you can rewrite this equation, the hamilton jacobi equation, in a way that on the left-hand side you have only a function of r, and on the right-hand side only a function of theta, so it must be a constant, and then you call this the Carter constant or the separation constant. And uh, the necessary and sufficient condition for separability was worked out in this paper by uh, uh, Barbara Betzikova, Yuzhi Bichak, and myself. And um, uh, it came out that there are three conditions. The first two conditions uh, concern only the metric. The third condition concerns only the plasma frequency. So the metric coefficients B and, B and D must uh, be of this form. This defines you a function f of r. With a function f of r, f of r and theta, you can form these left-hand sides here, and they have to split into a function depending only on r and a function depending only on t. These are the conditions on the metric coefficients. And then the plasma density must be of this form, function of r only, function of theta only, divided by this capital F. So the interesting thing is, because uh, the splits into conditions on the metric and conditions on the plasma frequency, that you see immediately that separability holds for light rays in the plasma, if and only if it holds for light light geodesics, it holds without the plasma, and the plasma density has this particular form. So if separability doesn't work uh, for vacuum light rays, you don't have to start thinking about a plasma. It can never work. Yeah? It's an, I would say it's a non-trivial result. It was not to be expected. Um, anyway, if you work this out for the Kerr metric, then, of course, as you all know, the vacuum light rays do have, uh, do have a Carter constant. So the only condition is a condition on the plasma frequency. The plasma frequency must have this form. And actually, this condition was already uh, worked out in a paper by myself and Oleg Zukko in 2017. So what we did with uh, Barbara and Hirschi was actually generalizing this result from the Kerr metric to arbitrary stationary and um, axisymmetric space times. So I, I should mention that uh, if your space time is, um, and your plasma density is uh, um, uh, spherically symmetric and static, yeah? if everything depends only on R, then the separability condition is always satisfied. Yeah, you don't need additional conditions. Okay, let's uh, begin with uh, Schwarzschild, just to remind ourselves what's the shadow in the, the vacuum in, the vacuum, uh, in Schwarzschild spacetime. Here's a metric. As you all know, there's a horizon at 2m, and there's a light sphere at 3m. Yeah? And the light sphere is unstable. This means if you perturb the initial condition a bit, a bit then the light ray goes away from this sphere. So conversely, if a light ray comes in, it may spiral asymptotically towards the light sphere. And that's a crucial um, yeah, feature which uh, leads to the construction of the shadow. If you are the observer here and you send light rays into the past, then there are ones which go to the horizon. There are ones which are just deflected and go to infinity. And the borderline case are light rays which spiral towards the photon sphere. Now assume that you have light rays anywhere, but not in this region between the observer and the black hole, then you would associate darkness to these light rays, brightness to these light rays, and you see that what you see in the sky is a black disk of angular radius alpha shadow, that's this angle here, and that's what we call the, sh uh, the, uh, that's what we call the shadow. Yeah, so the, angle, the angular uh, radius of the shadow is constructed in this way. And this can be worked out analytically very easily, because this light ray must have the same constants of motion as um, the light rays which uh, circle around at r equals 3m. And if you and, um, yeah, work out this condition, then you get this equation for uh, the angular radius of the shadow. It involves the mass of the black hole and the position of the observer, obviously. And this formula was first worked out by Singh in 66. He didn't use the word shadow. This was not around at this time. But what he calculated is exactly what we nowadays call the shadow of a Schwarzschild black hole. So if you are uh, um, at a certain distance and, uh, from the black hole, this part of the sky is dark. If you move closer, more, uh, a bigger portion becomes dark. If you are 
directly on the light sphere, half of the sky is dark. And if you approach the horizon, then more and more of the sky becomes dark. In the limit, actually, the entire sky becomes dark. If you're standing just outside of the horizon a little bit, then the entire sky is dark. OK, I should also mention that the Schwarzschild black hole produces infinitely many images of every point. If you have a light source here, observer here, there's one light ray which goes direct, then one light ray which makes one turn, one light ray which makes two, term, uh, two turns, and so on. And the same the other way around. So what the observer sees here from this light source is, that is two infinite sequences of images. One sequence on one side, that's what we call the primary image. All the other ones cluster very, very closely on the boundary of the shadow. Then here's a secondary image, and there's also this uh, second infinite image on the other side. Now, you, now assume you have many light sources. Then each of, it, each of them produces this infinite sequence of higher order images. So all of them together give a bright ring around the shadows. That was a ring which we have seen in the drawing by, um, uh, by Lumine. Yeah? So it's, it's, it's practically the, the contour of the shadow, which is uh, outlined by this um, ring of higher order images. OK, let's uh, talk about numbers. So with the Singh formula, you can calculate um, the angular radius or the angular diameter of a shadow if you know the mass and the distance. So for the object of the center of our galaxy, you get 54 micro arc seconds, approximately. For M87, you get this is three times uh, as far, um, uh, three times the, the distance is uh, three times as big, but the mass is also three times as big. So it's the same order of magnitude. And you get something like 40 micro arc seconds. And that's uh, more or less exactly what the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration um, uh, brought out. So it's in complete agreement with this, uh, with this formulas. Now let's uh, introduce a plasma. If you have a plasma, and we assume that uh, the um, uh, plasma frequency, this means the density of the electrons, is, is uh, spherically symmetric, then uh, you can, uh, again, easily solve the uh, the, equation for, uh, the equation for the shadow analytically. So here's a Hamiltonian. We have a constant of motion um, uh, PT associated with a, 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 a staticity. And uh, yeah, if you divide by C, you get something with the dimension of a frequency. And this is um, related to the frequency actually measured by an observer with this four velocity, that's a static observer, by this formula here. So one often says that omega naught is the frequency at infinity. By this is meant that if you are at infinity, if R is infinite, that the measured frequency is the same as the omega naught. Yeah? So that's the meaning of this constant of motion. And uh, the formula for the, where we need to need know what, what happens with the photon sphere in order to construct the shadow, and this is most conveniently written uh, with the help of this function, which involves uh, the plasma frequency here. And uh, the photon sphere is then just determined by uh, vanishing of this derivative. And the angular radius of the shadow is given by this equation. Again, you calculate this by equating the constants of motion of the ray with the constants of motion of the limiting ray. Yeah? And actually, this formula was given uh, yeah, already a couple, of years, a couple of years ago in a paper together with Oleg Zubko and Gena Bisnovati Kogan. And uh, let's do an example. So if this is your plasma, we are still on uh, Schwarzschild space time. If this is your plasma density, so let's assume it falls off with r to the power 3 half. You introduce a factor beta naught here, to, which gives uh, the density of the, um, of the plasma. So the bigger beta naught, the denser the plasma. And then you calculate the shadow for different distances. The distance usually falls off. So the, the plasma makes the shadow smaller. Yeah? There's only one exception if you are very close to the black hole. Here at 3.3 m, then it becomes a little bit bigger in the beginning. Yeah? But in all other cases, it becomes smaller. So generically, I would say, the shadow becomes smaller if you have a, have a plasma. And um, uh, this can be done quite analogously uh, also for um, other spherically symmetric and static space times. Let's assume an arbitrary spherically symmetric and static space time. Again, a circular symmetric, uh, spherically symmetric frequency. And then the Hamiltonian is this. You have these constants of motion, the omega naught, and also you have also the p phi, of course. And um, as a general relation between the real frequency measured by a static observer and the omega naught is this here. So it's this coefficient here, the GTT, which relates the two things to each other. This is constant. This is not a long array. Yeah? 
and uh, the condition for the photon sphere then uh, looks like that. So you have symmetric coefficients B and A. The metric coefficient B doesn't occur. The GRR, the B does not occur in the formula. And that's, uh, um, uh, yeah, that's a condition for the photon sphere. And if you have determined the radius of the photon sphere from this equation, then this gives you the shadow. Again, this is uh, worked out in this paper I've already mentioned. And uh, we do, uh, you can do this not only for black holes, you can also do it for other compact objects, for instance, for a wormhole. That's a famous Alice wormhole. It's Homer Alice. It's not George Alice and also not um, John Alice. It's an American physicist by the name of Homer Alice. This is a spatial topology of the space time. Assume you have an observer here and light sources here in this area, but not on the other side of the wormhole, so that no light comes through the through the mouth of the wormhole, then the observer here would see a shadow in more or less the same way as um, one would see a shadow of a black hole. So not only black holes cast shadow, yeah, they cast shadows, this is really important. Also other ultra compact objects cast a shadow. And the condition for the photon sphere in this case reads like that. And for the angular radius of the shadow like that. And the interesting thing is in this case for the Alice wormhole, if you have a constant plasma density, the plasma has no effect at all. Yeah, the plasma effect drops out completely. So on an Alice wormhole, you cannot uh, distinguish uh, a constant plasma density from the situation without a plasma. Okay, this was just for the sake of illustration. And uh, now let's come to the, uh, to the rotating things. So the most important rotating metric is, of course, um, the Kerr metric. And uh, I've written here for you the metric again. And uh, a part of the geodesic equation uh, this is uh, the theta and the R components of the uh, geodesic equation in the so-called MINO parametrization. So the dot means derivative with respect to the so-called MINO parameter. And uh, you have now constants of motion E with, uh, that's uh, the associated with the T symmetry, L associated with the phi symmetry, and the important thing is you have a Carter constant. Yeah? It was found in 68 by Carter that there is a hidden symmetry, a symmetry which is not no. Uh, a constant of motion which is not directly related to the symmetry of the space-time. So with the help of these constants of motion, you can reduce the geodesic equation to first order. And now you can ask yourself, what happens with the photon sphere? In Rothschild, we have the photon sphere at r equals 3m. And this was crucial for the construction of the shadow. What do we have in the curved space-time? What we have is not a photon sphere, it's a photon region. It's a region filled with so-called spherical geodesics, geodesics which stay on a sphere, but which are not circular. And you find them by setting this equation here, that's the r dot equal to zero, and the derivative, which gives you a double, r double dot also to zero. And then you have to take into account that this thing cannot be negative. So you get this inequality. If you evaluate these three conditions, you get the equation for the photon region, uh, inequality for the photon region. Yeah? So that's a set of all points through which such a spherical geodesic exists. And if you plot this, this is here for an extremal black hole, then you see the following here is the horizon, the outer horizon. And the photon region is this uh, reddish uh, part. So it's, uh, yeah, it's kind of a torus yeah, around the, um, the, the axis. So, so each point of this reddish region, you have a geodesic, uh, so, yes, a light like geodesic, which stays on a sphere. The phi motion can be fairly complicated. It can even turn back. Yeah? For some time, it may go in the forward direction, and then it may turn back. But uh, the, the theta motion is simple. It just oscillates between the boundaries of this region, and yeah, the r coordinates is constant. Yeah? And these, um, uh, these spherical geodesics can now serve as limit curves in exactly the same thing as the uh, same way as the circular geodesics served as limit curves in the Schwarzschild case. So you have to calculate the constants of motion for each of these um, light-like geodesics. You have to assume an observer somewhere here, and then you have to find which light rays starting from the observer into the path have the same constants of motion as, the, as these limit curves. This gives you the boundary curve of the shadow. And uh, this is, comes out that the shadow is no longer circular. Actually, the shape of the shadow for a curved black hole was first worked out by Jim Bardeen in 73. Uh, he had an observer at infinity. You can also do it for an observer anywhere outside of the horizon. And this was done not only for the curved space-time, but for a much bigger uh, class of space-time by a PhD student of our group, Arne Grenzebach, was published in this PRD uh, 2014. So here's what comes out. 
So you determine the constants of motion for the limit curves. You relate the celestial coordinates of the observer. So the observer has a, sees the celestial sphere. So he associates uh, um, uh, latitudinal and longitudinal coordinates to this. And these are also related to constants of motion. And now you equate this Ke with this Ke and this Le with this Le, and you get the boundary curve of the shadow theta and psi parameterized with this radius r of the limit curve. Yeah? So you get really a curve in the sky. And uh, yeah, I, I think you have all seen these pictures. This is how it looks like. So for an extremal black hole, observer at 5m here, fairly close to the black hole, dangerous. And uh, an observer in the equatorial plane, then you see this characteristic flattness, flattening, which is a dragging effect, of course. And if you look at a, at a certain angle, the shadow is always symmetric. That's interesting. Even if you look at a certain angle, yeah, the shadow is always symmetric with respect to a horizontal line. And if you look directly from the top, then uh, everything is uh, circular again. Uh, you can also uh, derive from this formula, which I've shown on the preceding slide, uh, uh, an exact expression for the vertical uh, diameter or the vertical angular radius, which in lowest order is the same as the thing formula. Yeah? So the thing formula gives still, if you are far away from the black hole, which we usually are as observers, uh, it uh, gives still a, a very good uh, value for the, uh, for the um, uh, diameter, also for the, curve, for the curve shadow. Okay, now let's switch on the plasma. So it's again the curve metric here. Now we have a plasma frequency which depends on r and theta. Yeah. This is the Hamiltonian, and we have constants of motion from these conditions alone, only uh, the, uh, the omega naught and the P phi. There's no K. Yeah? So we have to impose an additional condition, namely the separability condition, which I have shown you, in order to get the necessary uh, uh, additional constants of motion. And uh, so the plasma frequency must be of this form. If it's not of this form, you cannot calculate the shadow analytically. You can always do ray tracing. Yeah? That's, of course, for sure. But you cannot do it analytically. And, but in this case, if the plasma frequency is of this form, you can write down the photon region, the inequality for the photon region analytically. I don't expect you to learn this by heart. I just show you this formula yeah, to, show, to show that it is uh, quite elementary yeah, and um, quite explicitly. So this formula uh, can be found in this paper with, with Oleg, which I've already mentioned. And uh, now you, do, you play the same game. Yeah, you calculate the constants of motion for the, um, for the spherical light type geodesics. You equate them with the constants of motion, which relate the celestial coordinates to the, to the constants of motion, and you get the boundary curve of the shadow. And uh, in our 2017 paper, we have a couple of examples. Yeah, I want to show you only one example which uh, uh, shows an interesting general feature. This is, well, from a physical point of view, maybe not a very realistic example. Let's assume the plasma density is constant up to infinity. This is not really realistic, but let's assume this for a moment because then the calculation is easy. And um, uh, let's introduce, um, uh, oh, no, yeah, I already called this constant value omega c. So what matters now is, of course, the ratio of omega c to the constant of motion omega naught. Yeah? So only this quotient enters into the formulas. So if you make the plasma denser and raise the, uh, the frequency at which you observe by the same factor, you don't change anything. Yeah? It's only this ratio which matters. So you can observe in a very dense plasma with a certain frequency, or you can then lower the density, and if you, then you also have to lower the frequency, then you have the same effect. And so what do you see for this simple example? If the density is really high, yeah? So this qu uh, quotient here is bigger than one, which means that uh, the, uh, the light rays cannot reach infinity because this is a measured frequency at infinity. So if this is bigger than one, then the plasma cannot propagate. Okay. So uh, we have here this cross-hatched uh, uh, region, which actually cannot be entered by the light rays uh, in this case with the frequency of this value. So we have a forbidden region. That's the first new feature, which did not exist in vacuum. Then we have, in addition to this uh, reddish uh, region here, which shows the unstable uh, uh, photon, uh, sorry, um, uh, the unstable um, uh, spherical light rays, we have also stable spherical light rays. So these things can be approached asymptotically from infinity. These things cannot be approached asymptotically, but light rays can oscillate about it. And they are stable with respect to perturbations. So that's a new feature. And actually, these two new features, the forbidden region and the stable uh, 
and I praise always come together. Yeah? And if they are present, then you have uh, quite, funny, uh, quite a funny new aspect which puzzled us, Oleg and me, for quite some time. So if I, if I now show you pictures for the shadow, I begin with a small value of this quotient, and then I crank it up, up to this value, and even bigger values. Then you see the following. That's for very small plasma density. Yeah, so the shadow looks, uh, this is for an extremely black hole. Uh, I didn't write this here. But that's for A equal M, yeah? So uh, then we have the, the shadow in vacuum, which we know already. Now, if you make the plasma density bigger, then you have this green thing here, so the shadow becomes bigger in this case. And then, happen, then something interesting happens, the shadow breaks, and it forms these funny fish tails. Yeah? And then it, yeah, it bends over, and it continues in this way here. And we, as I said, we were puzzled quite, for quite some time what to do with these fish tails. Is it really possible to observe these funny things? They occur in this situation, if the plasma density is big enough so that we have the stable orbits and the, and the forbidden region, and the observer must be here in this region somewhere where the unstable photon uh, orbits exist. And uh, then we have three types of orbits. In the vacuum case, we have only the ones which go to the horizon and the ones which go to infinity. Now we have the ones which go to the horizon. We have the ones which go out and come back and go to the horizon, and the ones which oscillate around the stable uh, uh, um, photon orbits. And this makes the situation much more complicated. And now if you, you really have to tell me where the, where the light sources are. If you have light sources here in this region where the stable uh, orbits are, then actually the shadow looks like that. So that's uh, the fishtail situation. But actually, the shadow is not bounded by the fishtail. The shadow is bounded by this region here. So we have on both sides of this boundary curve here, we have actually darkness. So we were a bit disappointed when we found out that the, shadow, that the fishtail shadow can actually not be observed. What you observe in this situation is actually very similar qualitatively as uh, without, uh, 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 without uh, <coughs> the plasma. So with this somewhat disappointing uh, result, I want to conclude my, co my uh, the talk before the chairman hits me. Thank you for listening. Excuse me, on what? Magnetized. Ah, okay. Yes. Yes. Uh, so if you look at the Breuer Ehlers paper, which I have quoted, they really work this out. You can also get a Hamiltonian formalism for the rays, but uh, it is very complicated. It's an eighth order polynomial in the momenta. And the most important qualitative feature which you get is that you get birefringent. Yeah? The medium becomes birefringent. So uh, if you send a light ray into this medium, it will split into two, yeah, depending on the polarization state. And that's actually what we expect if we really have dense plasmas around a black hole, because we expect strong magnetic fields associated with black holes. So I'm talking together with Oleg since uh, six or seven years about uh, working out a magnetized case, but until now we never really endeavored. <laughs> Oh, no, no. Oh, that's an important point. It doesn't matter. The motion of the plasma doesn't matter into the equation. Only the density enters. The density the must density. depend on the coordinates, as I have given it, on R and theta only. But the motion can be arbitrary. That's the funny thing with this kind of plasma. I see your point. But actually, the plasma frequency depends. Because you have the plasma density, yes. Density yes. Plasma so, do you take the Lorentz invariant? No, that's a Lorentz invariant. The omega p is a Lorentz invariant. When the plasma, uh, the plasma Yeah. No, 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 no. The omega p is, uh, okay. is independent of this. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, by the way, this kind of medium was uh, discussed uh, in the book by Singh already, 1959, but not mentioned uh, uh, that it is related to a plasma. I, I'm fairly sure Singh didn't know this. He just considered a particular dispersive medium uh, yeah, for, for the fun of it, without knowing that it's related to a plasma. But he discusses the features in some detail. Yes. And uh, do you have any uh, disappearances or situations how large is the black hole here and what is the size of the shadow in kilometers or in yes. Uh, 
Yeah, actually, I've shown you the numbers for the, uh, for the two uh, objects which have actually been observed by the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration. Here it is. So this is millions of masses in the case of the object at the center of our galaxy and billions of masses in the, the case of M87. And uh, yeah, the, the size of the shadow I've given here, the only meaningful quantity is the angular size. It's what you see in the sky, yeah? So it doesn't make sense to ask what is the, yeah, the linear diameter of the, of the shadow. This just doesn't make sense, yeah? I'm sorry? That's, that's what's written here. It's micro arc seconds. Yeah. So I've written here that the usual uh, comparison which you make that this corresponds to a grapefruit on the moon. Yeah. So what the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration achieved was getting a resolution which would be able to see a grapefruit on the moon if there were a grapefruit. Yeah. Uh, no, the Hamiltonian is not a density. I'm talking about particles. Yeah, yeah, no, it's a Hamiltonian as an ordinary classical mechanics. It's not a density. Here, this Hamiltonian, it's not a density, it's a function on phase space. Uh, that's on an arbitrary space time. Here's a, a space time metric, it can be any, any uh, Lorentzian metric. Of course, of course. Everything is fully relativistic. Yes, of course. I'm doing general relativity. Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. Non-quantum. Non yes, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, here, you must, must put it on that side. Yeah, on this side. Yeah. Here. So. Should work. Yeah, so uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for the invitation. And uh, I must say I'm happy to be back again in Yerevan. It's now my third time here. Uh, and it's always very enjoyable. Now, um, I would like to tell you a bit about uh, black holes and alternative theories of gravity. Of course, of course, we know that um, you know, general relativity so far passes every test, and uh, still we may want to explore some theories uh, going slightly beyond uh, general relativity. So I would, after a brief uh, introduction, basically discuss um, Einstein scalar theories, and here I will focus on those theories that uh, contain a Gauss-Bonnet term, because uh, yeah, it, most work has been done on those uh, in connection with black holes. And uh, having some scalars uh, that gives some nice results, but uh, I will motivate to go a bit beyond and uh, not only have a gauss bonnet piece, but also a Ricci scalar in addition. And uh, yeah, let's see what's going to happen then. Um, yeah, these are the black holes we all know and all love, the Kerr black holes, and uh, they have very special properties. So uh, we say a Kerr black hole has no hair, and we mean that the full space time is completely determined by just uh, two numbers, the mass and the angular momentum. For 
per black holes, we know there's an upper limit uh, on the spin and uh, we cannot exceed it, we would end up with a naked singularity. Um, we have now lots of measurements from the various runs uh, of gravitational wave detectors and uh, our results, uh, they match perfectly uh, within the known accuracy currently uh, what is observed. And uh, as we just heard uh, uh, this nice talk by Volker about the shadow, we have observations of these two supermassive black holes and their shadows. And here you just see a comparison of the size. Uh, our small uh, black hole here in the Milky Way, you see this is Mercury's uh, uh, orbit and this is the shadow size but uh, M87 has this thousand, more than a thousand times bigger black hole. And then, yeah, here we have uh, uh, the orbit of Pluto. So it's, it's much, much bigger. Now, if we go to alternative theories of gravity, then anything uh, that we know, and we know really a lot, and uh, also as we have seen in this conference, we're getting data, data, data. Um, uh, everything that we know must be fitted. So it's not so easy to construct some uh, reasonable um, theories that would uh, give no deviations from what we know within the observational limits, but still give some new effects so that might be interesting and possibly observable with uh, future observations, but also possibly, hopefully, uh, yeah, get rid of some of the problems that we do have with general relativity, like we cannot really match uh, our standard model of particle physics uh, with uh, general relativity. So we always have to look at the solar system. We have to look at strong gravity and possibly find some effects there when we study black holes and neutron stars. And of course, there's also cosmology. And uh, yesterday, the last talk yesterday, that was on cosmology, on uh, the same type of theory I'm uh, talking about. So we should also, with these theories, kind of fit cosmology, we uh, should not get anywhere into problems with our cosmological observations. Now, the communities are fairly separate, uh, typically those that do black holes, neutron stars, strong gravity, and those that do cosmology. But I think in recent years, uh, we're kind of getting closer together because we know if we want to look at some theory of gravity that might really go beyond Einstein, then yeah, we, we should fit early cosmology and also um, now, today, and um, uh, our um, compact objects. So the theory I would like to discuss, um, because it's a well-defined theory, it's theory that gives uh, nice effects for black hole, is uh, Einstein scalar Gauss Bonnet. And uh, we have seen this uh, yesterday in Stefano's uh, talk already briefly mentioned. So we would start with an action which has a Gauss Bonnet piece coupled to a scalar field. We could also couple, and we have coupled to a vector field, and uh, that's also possible, but the scalar is the simplest. Now, if we uh, then look, uh, here we have a coupling function and the gauss bonnet it's a quadratic piece to, which uh, in four dimensions wouldn't uh, yield anything if we wouldn't couple it. So it's the first Lovelock term. In five dimensions, it does give important contributions, but in four dimensions, yeah, we basically um, need a coupling uh, function here 
And the resulting set of equations that you obtain are second order, which is nice. So it's a subset of Kondesky theories. It's motivated by various theories, like string theory is giving such terms. Uh, when one tries to renormalize gravity, one obtains such terms. And so, well motivated, reasonably well defined, I would say. And uh, yeah, uh, Wendeski, after formulating his beautiful general theory of second order field equations for gravity with additional terms, he moved uh, on to become a painter. So these are the equations uh, of motion that one finds. Uh, you need not really uh, look closely at this term. It just means we have an additional peak uh, from the ghost bonnet term here with a coupling to the scalar field. And the main focus of my talk will now be on that scalar equation. In the scalar equation, it looks like a Klein-Gordon equation, right? Uh, if we would have a um, Klein-Gordon equation, we would have a minus mass squared times scalar field. So uh, that's the main point already. And therefore, the choice of this coupling function, this is really crucial for what we find for the black hole solutions and their properties. And there are basically two possibilities. One possibility is that uh, the Schwarzschild black hole, that the Kerr black hole, they do not remain solutions of the theory. So we only find scalarized solutions solutions that have some finite scalar field. And the other pos possibility, which I will mostly talk about, this is that GR solutions remain solutions, but we have additional solutions. And uh, it's this uh, coupling function which tells us uh, what we have. Now, since we had this nice talk yesterday, let me start uh, with the uh, first, which corresponds to a dilatonic coupling as predicted by string theory. So here we have these two coupling constants. String theory would say gamma is equal to one. Uh, and uh, uh, then we just look at what are the solutions for black holes in this system. Here we have the radius of a black hole here the mass, and then a Schwarzschild black hole would just be this line. We can have them with any mass uh, and radius, and we have the simple relation between them. When we have uh, now the coupling to the gauss bonnet piece, uh, and it's uh, this type of a linear coupling up here in the exponential, then this changes, and uh, what one finds is such a set of solutions, and they have been found by Jutta Kanti and collaborators long ago. Uh, so these are the static uh, solutions, and you see there's a limit somewhere where, uh, yeah, it doesn't continue. We don't go for a given coupling constant. You see the scaling with the coupling constant here. We don't go to zero. We have a minimal mass uh, that we obtain. Uh, in this type of theories. So there's a lower bound, and it's a theoretical bound because it follows from the equations, and this is happening also for all the other coupling constants. There's always a theoretical bound, and uh, yeah, as we heard already yesterday, there are quite a few um, observational bounds on this type of theory, but this is an, a theoretical additional bound, which means uh, now if you observe a small black hole, and uh, yeah, then you can check, uh, is it allowed by the theory? Or yeah, it gives some bounds. So small black holes also give a bound. Uh, because below, below this uh, minimal mass, and the scalar field would become um, some imaginary function. So um, it doesn't give any a reasonable solution anymore. Now one can, of course, and uh, that's important, rotate those solutions. And then here we have the area 
and here we have the angular momentum, uh, always scaled uh, by the mass. So um, then here for zero angular momentum, this would be the set of uh, uh, solutions we've just been looking at. And this is the Kerr limit because uh, as you saw here when we approach large masses, large uh, uh, radii, then we approach structures. The same is happening now when we approach uh, large uh, masses, large uh, um, areas, then we approach Kerr. And uh, um, this is now our domain of existence and you see one can slightly exceed this Kerr bound, but only slightly. Um, the shadow, yes, it's a bit disappointing. Not much is happening here. Uh, one can look at um, gravitational waves and to study yeah, the waveforms. This has been done by some colleagues and they have used them to obtain new bounds. And uh, yeah, what we have done is just look at the ring down and one does that by looking at the quasi-normal modes and study those quasi-normal modes uh, to say something about the ring down and possibly for future observations with higher accuracy with future uh, observatories like Einstein, we might uh, find new bounds here. Now, there are many, many bounds from various uh, directions on this uh, Einstein, Dilatan, uh, Gauss Bonnet theory. So, um, people started looking for different ways of obtaining scalarized black holes, but it's not easy because we have all these no-hair theorems. And uh, uh, only a few years back in 17, uh, a new way was found, namely to do something very analogous uh, to uh, the scalarization of neutron stars, uh, where it's a very uh, compact objects, very compact matter distributions that can give rise uh, to a scalarization as shown by Damour and Esposito Perez. Here, for a black hole, there's no matter. And this is so why it, it was realized only so late. But what we have for a black hole, this is strong curvature. And a gauss bonnet term, this is a, yeah, a higher order curvature term. So we could have curvature induced scalarization. And this is precisely uh, what uh, was then exploited. Uh, interestingly, at the same time, uh, three groups uh, came up with the same idea. And uh, now we look at this uh, type of equations, but we say GR solutions remain solutions. So we want the scalar field uh, to be vanishing. Uh, because for GR, it ought to vanish. Uh, and so to be a solution, this must be allowed by this coupling function. So the coupling function must also vanish when the scalar field vanishes. And now we have, uh, for in the static case, a very nice and strong source uh, of curvature for scalarization. And when we look at uh, our scalar field equation, and just remember, yeah, just remember that yeah, it looks like a Klein Gordon equation with minus the mass squared times uh, the scalar field and possibly higher order terms. Uh, then we can extract, yeah, there should be something like uh, an effective mass, effective mass uh, in terms of this uh, uh, Gauss Bonnet piece, which is a positive piece. And now there can be some instability induced, the tachyonic instability, the effective mass squared can become negative when the curvature is sufficiently strong. So it's happening uh, for the smaller black holes where the curvature is uh, much, much stronger than, and when the coupling constant is uh, positive. So scalarized uh, black holes can exist and they have been constructed 
And uh, here you see for two such coupling functions that allow for this type of uh, scalarization, uh, you see uh, what is possible. And uh, what we have here is, uh, does not really work this thing so well. Uh, what we have here is, I take it out. Um, that uh, uh, all that beautiful color, what you see, forget about it, because whatever is colorful uh, is not realized as a black hole. Only the black lines that you see here. Those black lines, uh, this one, there's some, I don't know. Uh, something is unstable here. Some instability. I, know, I, uh, I will talk about uh, instabilities, <laughs> lots of instabilities. But, uh, uh, instabilities arise already uh, down here. What, what you should see here, if it's stable enough, is... Uh, Uh, no, I, I want the, the pointer if possible. And this is most important, having the pointer. <laughs> yeah, okay, um, something is still unstable, but uh, maybe, maybe I can continue now. Uh, so, uh, in this type uh, of coupling theory, uh, which was inspired by neutron stars, uh, as you may know, uh, inspired by this uh, Damour Esposito Fares uh, model, you have um, a set of fundamental black holes. And uh, you see here, there's the Schwarzschild black holes. We have the scalar field at the horizon versus the horizon radius. And uh, here, the same for a much, much simpler coupling function. And uh, so for the simpler coupling function, you see um, the shape of the fundamental mode is somewhat different. Uh, the shape of the fundamental mode is bending upwards and not downwards. And this is the same as uh, yeah, for all the unstable, uh, radially excited modes. But uh, for this coupling function, it seems like uh, yeah, that we have a stable, uh, a stable fundamental scalarized black hole. Now, um, when we, we can study the stability, and we did study the stability, and we studied the uh, quasi-normal modes, and for the low angular momenta, the monopole, dipole, quadrupole, octopole, we couldn't find any instability. So we concluded that uh, these scalarized black holes would be stable. And uh, now they are static, of course, for observations, what we want is rotating black holes. So how can we rotate now? It's quite interesting for rotation, uh, something new occurs. Let's look at our equation for the scalar field. And uh, the Gauss-Bonnet piece, the curvature piece, now if we include rotation. And here, this A is just uh, yeah, the specific angular momentum. And then you see with a minus sign, uh, it's entering here at two places, and with a plus sign here, which means, only? No. Oh. Uh, which means that uh, we do have uh, um, e two possibilities. Either we have uh, uh, induction of uh, and uh, an increasement of scalarization, or we have a suppression of scalarization. Uh, and it depends then on the sign of the scalar field. 
Now when one studies um, uh, these rotating black holes, one finds that uh, here uh, one may have a possibility to distinguish the, uh, and put new bounds because when one looks at the size of the shadow, one can have a black hole with a given mass and a given angular momentum, but with a much, much smaller shadow. So far, yeah, uh, we ha don't have sufficient observations. We would have to know the spin of uh, M87, let's say, but uh, this is not determined uh, so well. Um, the new thing I want to talk about, and I have only two minutes. I No, thank you. Uh, the new thing is, um, let's say, cosmologically motivated, uh, because in these theories I discussed so far, we always had a vanishing scalar field at infinity, uh, which means we somehow have to make sure there's no scalar field surviving from the early universe. And it means uh, very strong fine tuning in the early universe. In the talk yesterday, we also saw, um, yeah, um, scalar field was switched off. So how, what can we do now in, in order to uh, have a, a, a mechanism that naturally cuts down the scalar field early in the universe? And uh, colleagues in Nottingham they came up with the suggestion, let's include another scalar coupling to the uh, Ritchie scalar with the same coupling function, but a new coupling constant. And then it just happens naturally when the, the usual set, but now with the scalar fields of the equations are evolved, that uh, the scalar field uh, shortly after matter domination goes to zero. So it looks a very promising theory because things happen naturally. And then one can do the whole thing again, and this is what they did. They looked at the static solutions. They found branches of static solutions. They looked at stability with respect to uh, uh, vibrations, monopole vibrations, and the solutions uh, above a certain coupling constant were stable. And then we thought, okay, now we rotate. And so when we rotated, we found a big surprise. Different from the cases we studied before, the, the, there was something very strange going on in this very nice theory, very well motivated theory, namely, we had too many solutions far too many solutions, and then we, we looked and tried to find out what's happening, and uh, the solutions have some new type of instability. So there's a quadrupole instability appearing, even though it's monopole with respect to L equals zero stable, and we have two branches of static solutions that are deformed, prolate and oblate. And uh, <clears throat> then we still had too many solutions and tried to make sense of them. And then we found two more branches. And uh, yeah, what is it? We have a hexa decupole instability. So the next instability appeared with L equals to four, here you may see it better again, prolate and oblate. And the question is, what's happening next? If we continue studying, um, was completely unexpected and not really physically well understood, and I'd like to get some comments maybe from you. Why does this instability occur? And how does it continue? Uh, it's, it's bad news, a bit like Volker's end uh, of the talk. Uh, this very nice theory, which is kind of uh, getting rid of a number of problems, now leads to new instabilities, but possibly these uh, 
solutions are stable. We don't know yet. Uh, so maybe the solutions would be just prolate or oblate. Uh, it has to investigate, but it will be very difficult. So I'm at the end. Thank you very much. Uh, no, <laughs> no, I don't agree. Um, the, um, the evolution uh, would be maybe cosmologically, it, it could influence, uh, the scalar field could influence uh, uh, here uh, the um, BBN scenario, let's say the Big Bang nuclear synthesis, because uh, it would contribute to the energy density. And then uh, you might need more neutrinos or something, or less neutrinos, because, <coughs> yeah, uh, already at uh, this uh, time of the nuclear synthesis, you, uh, you want to have something that does not really interfere with what you know. So um, the scalar field should already then not be dominant. Uh, you have to kind of cut it down to nothing, but it should not be dominant because you might influence the um, BBN. Uh, and later, later having a scalar field present uh, uh, that is not just localized around a compact object, that can cause you very different uh, problems. Like, uh, yeah, um, when you look at the speed of sound, uh, it's not. <laughs> the speed of gravitational waves and the speed of light. Yeah? Uh, you have these measurements now. Uh, the scalar field, if it would be present and uh, present in this evolving universe, it might uh, have some very strong observable effect there, which might rule out the theory. So it wouldn't work for that. Also, yeah, it, it, it should really be sufficiently localized uh, uh, and uh, you wouldn't want to have too much dipole radiation because then your uh, new neutron star binaries, uh, they might uh, produce too much radiation. So it, it's lots of problems that might be caused by the presence of a scalar field. Uh, and therefore, Yeah. 
Yes. And uh, it is a new thing, a completely new idea. Yes, this is also what, uh, yes, what we thought, um, having these dashes. I mean, this is different feeling which uh, uh, you have in the cases. So good morning to everybody. I hope you can hear me with this. And uh, first of all, thanks to the organizer, Schnur Kaluzon. And I'm in particular happy to be here because I gave my first talk in, in astrophysics 49 years ago, 250 meters away in this direction at the Irvine State University when I, where I did my diploma thesis. So uh, this was about nuclear matter in uh, neutron stars and then over a period of uh, gravitational theory, inflation, etc., I came back uh, to cosmology and in particular to cosmology with constraint simulations. So what I'm going to show you is the result of uh, a project which we started some 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And it is basically contrary to the last talks, you are not going to see many formulas, probably the number of formulas is something around zero, and, but you are <clears throat> going to see plots. And at the beginning, I want to show, since this is a Seldovich meeting, I want to show a few photos of Seldovich. So this is Seldovich and his wife in Einstein's summer house in Kaput. He visited our institute several times and the guests of the Academy of Science, uh, of German Academy of Science, uh, stayed from time to time in this summer house in Kaput, which is next to Potsdam. And as a young postdoc, I was very proud when I was invited to come to the summer house to talk with uh, Jakob Seldovich about cosmology and scalar fields and all the universe and that stuff. So he was very happy to be there and poured into the guest book that this was a wonderful time there. And I realized the first time that he is also perfect in German because when we were talking together, we were talking basically almost all the time in Russian. And from this guest book, I realized that we could have done it also in German. So this about Zeldovich and the Zeldovich meeting. <clears throat> now coming to that, what I'm going to talking about. So, as you all know, uh, the cosmic uh, microwave background shows us that about 13 and a half billion years ago, uh, there was basically a very homogeneous universe with very tiny fluctuations. And then we started to evolve. And what we see today is uh, large scale structure, small scale structure, filaments, voids, all the different uh, galaxies and in the galaxy stars and down to the solar system. So the question is, how does, did all these structures form in the universe? And we know that this tiny uh, fluctuation too by gravitational instability. And we know also that besides this gravitation, uh, gas dynamical processes played an important role. So if we want to describe the formation of structure, we need to take into account the gravitational law, and we need to take into account the gas dynamical processes, and all this is quite complicated. We cannot, we can write down formula, but we cannot solve this formula, so we need uh, to understand it with the help of supercomputers, millions of computing hours, and if we do that, we know that about 70% of the total energy in the universe is unknown, is this lambda term, which we can handle very simple as a lambda in Einstein's equation for the background uh, evolution of the universe. And about 85% of all matter must be dark. And this means that the dark matter is mainly 
driving force for the formation of large-scale structure. So we need to have a better, a good understanding how dark matter behaves. And this ends up in computational astrophysics with dark matter. And on top of it, then uh, the evolution of a bionic matter, which needs to be handled. This is an old story about dark matter. Very often, uh, different plots are shown. What I like most is this one. This is from uh, 1942, long before everybody of us was on this world. And in this time, <coughs> Ort already uh, said that he needs dark, oops, that he needs uh, dark matter in order to understand uh, the dynamics in the, in the galaxy. And in this time, it was also impossible for him to do all these calculations by hand. So this is what I personally like very much, that he said it is a pleasant duty to express my gratitude to the members of the computing staff of the observatory. So to persons who are sitting with these mechanical machines and doing all these calculations for him. And now we do basically the same. We write at the end of every of our papers, we would like to thank uh, the Leibniz Rational Centrum in Munich or in any other Rational Centrum for helping us, uh, for giving us millions of computing hours in order to solve uh, our problems. Near field cosmology, what do I have in mind? What we know is that the local, we know best the local neighborhood of, uh, of, the, of the Milky Way, because Milky Way, around the Milky Way, uh, there are plenty of galaxies. There are galaxies with very different uh, sizes, with different masses, with different histories, evolution histories. And uh, if we want uh, to understand uh, that how this environment of the Milky Way has been formed, we need to have the initial conditions for our simulation billion years ago. And this is uh, the problem which, is, which we are trying uh, to solve in uh, these constraint simulations. Because uh, in the constraint simulation, we start with observations today. In our case, these are, the, uh, these are observational, observational data which we get uh, from, uh, from Brent. And these observational data, they come into this constrained local universe simulation as input, and they lead then to something uh, which looks really like the local universe if uh, we consider the output uh, of, the, of the simulations. So this project, as I mentioned, is a long project which we started with Yehuda and Gustavo and Anatoly Klupin. Uh, some 20 years ago, and uh, now uh, it's mainly driven by Jenny and Noam and Alexander. So this is the reason that in this executive board of collaborators, we always order the names not by, uh, by the names, but we order the names by the age. Because typically, at least in, in my field, and probably in your field also, uh, the young people, the postdocs, the young postdocs and the students are doing most of the work. So this is why it starts with Jenny Soos, who was a student in Potsdam. She was a student, did her PhD in Potsdam and is now permanent in, 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 in Lille. Noam uh, did his PhD, uh, did his postdoc in Potsdam and is now post permanent in Potsdam. Alexander is now permanent in Madrid. So this is basically the core team and a few old guys which started with that stuff years ago. So this is this plot again. So in, in, in the local universe, we have in our simulation coma. We have Virgo, the well-known uh, clusters of galaxies. We have a great attractor, and we have Perseus. And this was a simulation which has been done uh, by Anatoly. Uh, and um, parallel, Another simulation has been done by Gustavo in a much smaller box. And now, as you all know, if you put the initial conditions uh, in the same initial conditions in a, some box, <coughs> then you will get different distributions of uh, the large and different formations history of the large scale structure. And the interesting, what we realized uh, in 2008 or so, it was that 
if we do it with this constraint simulation with the correct today observed constraints and we run simulations with different uh, random speeds in the very beginning, uh, 13 billion years ago, we forwarded today, we see basically the similar structures. It's of course not exactly the same. You would not expect that you can run in simulation with billions of particles and you get exactly the same uh, due to the randomness in the initial conditions and due to the fact that the observational constraints are a few hundreds or a few thousands and the input is a few billions. But you see basically the same structures, these kind of filaments which have a similar behavior and in some place uh, the local probe. And this is why we believe that we are able with these simulations to reconstruct the local universe and then to study in the simulations the evolution of the local universe and compare that with observational data, which we have, of course, only for today. The mathematics and the physics behind is the Wiener Filter, which has been developed in the 90s, the hoffmann riebach algorithm by Yehuda, uh, the velocity data, the first velocity data, uh, the first observational data, which we were using for the plots what I have shown, for the simulations which I have shown, there are the radial velocity fields from these uh, observations, plus nearby cluster positions. What we are doing now is we are using uh, the, from Brantali, uh, the Cosmic Flows 2 data, uh, which are many more than we had originally, and later on Cosmic Flows 3 and Cosmic Flows 4. So this is a few, uh, few thousand, uh, this is a few ten thousands. We use, in addition, reverse Seldovich approximation. I mean, this is one of the problems. If you have the, uh, the data today, uh, you can reconstruct, basically, the linear density field today. You can reconstruct how it looked a uh, billion of years ago. But one of the open questions is, where was it? And this is done with a reverse uh, Seldovich approximation, so we know, basically, from the uh, line of sight velocity and the Wiener filter, we can reconstruct the 3D velocity and put the initial conditions back. And then one of the technical problems is the grouping of velocity data. So if you observe a cluster of galaxies, you have the fingers of God. The fingers of God are, of course, not something which uh, reflects the large scale structure, so you need to group this uh, data together. You have Malmquist bias. This is an observational bias. You need to correct for this. Yeah, and then if you, if you have done all these steps, you can do this simulation and you can start to study something. And one of the things that we have studied is the reionization of a local group. So you can observe the ionization, of course, but you cannot observe the reionization of a local universe. So the prediction is from these uh, simulations that the Milky Way and M31 are sitting here somewhere between Fornax and Virgo, the progenitors of Fornax and Virgo. And the question, the open question was uh, whether these clusters, the progenitors of these clusters, help to ionize uh, the local group or whether the local group does it from inside outside. And the result of this simulation was that the uh, local group does the reionization from inside outside by itself. And then one can uh, discuss in more detail the reionization as a function of environment and compare, for example, in different of these realizations, how uh, in constraint simulations, Milky Way and uh, M31 Andromeda uh, behave compared uh, to uh, to the other randomly selected objects, and you see that in the, the random, uh, the constraint simulations predict that our environment has been reanalyzed relatively early, a few hundred uh, million years earlier uh, than, than we are so on. So the next, what we are doing is the Hestia project. So this is a high resolution environmental simulations of an immediate area. This is the idea to, to go further, to run a couple of uh, simulations to find the best representations of the evolution of the, of the local group and then to study in detail the local group. 
what we are using in this case uh, are the CF2 data, uh, the grouping, which, which I already mentioned, and bias correction, which Jenny did when the initial conditions uh, were calculated by uh, Carlesi and Pilipenko in Eduardo Carlesi left uh, science, unfortunately, and then Sergei Filipenko in Moscow uh, continued to do this. <coughs> we did uh, 100 megaparsec box, and in this 100 megaparsec box, we have selected uh, two regions in which we run uh, the uh, simulation with effectively 8,000 cube particles. So that we go down to a resolution of 1.5 times 10 to the 5, uh, in dark matter and in gas a little bit less. And these are hydrodynamic simulations, what I mentioned, so the large scale structure and the formations are of this uh, local group. This is basically due to the dark matter distribution. And if you go then on top of the dark matter distribution, if you insert gas particles and you follow the gas dynamical evolution, you get something like that. No, this is still, uh, this is still dark matter only. Again, you have this structure, what you have seen in one of the former plots. The Virgo cluster, horizontal in this XY uh, supergalactic coordinate, and filament, and in this filament, the local group, which moves towards the Virgo cluster and the local void, the well-observed local void. And if you now, with the next step, uh, insert also the uh, gas and uh, baryons in general, then you have, uh, for some reason, this doesn't like me. This one? Doesn't like me either. Anyway, uh, you see this disk uh, structure of uh, Milky Way and Andromeda. You see the gas distribution and uh, then you can study in detail the distribution of these uh, dwarf galaxies, the infalling satellites, the plane of satellites, and uh, all that. What is an interesting point is the merging history. What I said already, you never, you, you cannot observe uh, what, uh, how the Milky Way has been formed. You can predict it by the simulations. And in this case, you, oh, now it works again. In this case, uh, you see the scatter which comes from the simulation compared to that what you would expect. The mean is, uh, this line is the mean what you would expect uh, for many, many, many uh, halos, uh, galaxies of the type of the Milky Way. So what you see is that in our environment, in this high density and uh, low density environment, uh, there is a kind of delayed uh, evolution here. So it forms earlier and then it stays a little bit more constant. So this is a prediction which again has an influence on the galaxy uh, properties of the nearby galaxies also. So another uh, topic what we studied was uh, the Virgo cluster is the most nearby cluster, the best studied cluster uh, in the universe. <coughs> this is again uh, first of all, in simulation, which gives an impression of this uh, cluster with the different substructures, and again, this kind of more or less horizontal line. And then, again, what one can do with this constraint simulation, one looks uh, for the expected merging history of this object and sees that, again, this object has a different uh, um, merging evolution history. So this is the evolution of the mass. This is what you would expect in the mean, and this is what you get from the constraint simulation for a Virgo-like object. Zone of avoidance. This is something what observers know very well, that in, in the plane of the Milky Way, you cannot observe. But if you have a constraint simulation, you can run a number of constraint simulations, and you can look what would you expect in this zone of avoidance. So this is that what you don't see. If you run a number of unconstrained simulation and uh, construct uh, the mean of them, you basically, basically will see nothing. This is what, exactly what you expect. 
because it is in any of these con simulations where objects are distributed in a different way. If you run a number of constraint simulations, you will find in the mean, in all of these uh, constraint uh, simulation uh, an object, uh, observed object, and you will find also something in the region which you cannot observe. So from the simulations uh, came the prediction that there is a structure extended from the north one to the south on uh, a galactic plane. So this was a nice paper of Jenny at all in 2017. Now coming to the last point, to slow. And slow is uh, simulating the local web. And unfortunately, it is not only simulating the local web, but also slow because these simulations took really a few years until they were finished and analyzed and still some students and postdocs are sitting on them. Again, uh, the starting point where we see have two data, a grouping and bias correction by Jenny and, uh, and ICs. So she did also the ICs. The box is 500 megaparsec. The DM only simulation has 6,000 cube particles, and the hydrodynamic simulations have two times 3,000 parti cube particles. So, two times means always that we have dark matter particles and gas particles. And later on, within the simulation, depending on the environment, these gas particles form stars. What we see here is the full sky map of a projected dark matter distribution from slow. So, you see. Virgo and Coma and Centaurus and then the other half, uh, Norma, Fornax, Perseus. So all these known clusters uh, exist in this simulation and now you can compare it uh, with observations. So on the left-hand side you have observations from top to down to MRS. This means uh, stellar distribution, ROSAT, X-ray and Compton Y predictions from Planck. And on the right-hand side the same uh, in in the simulation, and when you see, you can zoom in the observations or in the simulations in the certain regions and make a detailed uh, comparison of the predictions from the simulations and that uh, what you see, what you observe. This is uh, the local group environment in, oops, sorry, the local group environment in slow. The main result is that uh, we are living up to a distance of about 20, 10, 20 megaparsec in an underdense region. That would mean that the very local uh, Hubble constant would be a slightly uh, larger, but slightly. It has nothing to do with the Hubble tension, which has been discussed a couple of years ago. And uh, so this is something we are working now to get with the larger data set of Cosmic Flows 4 an explanation of the local density, the local environment, uh, the local mean uh, density in a larger, up to larger distances. So with this I will stop on time. Uh, my uh, talk and just summarize that I hope I could convince you that these kind of constraint numerical uh, simulations are a useful tool in cosmology and uh, that in particular cosmic flows, these are um, surveys, these surveys of uh, local velocity data uh, are very useful in order to get uh, these simulations. In particular, velocity data have uh, the advantage compared to position data, that velocity data basically uh, reflect the real, the full gravitational, uh, uh, the full density, the full gravitation, because the uh, velocity uh, data of this galaxy comes both from the dark matter distribution and the, uh, um, and the stars, the stellar, and the bionic distribution. So in this respect, we are not as biased as other data might be. Thank you.
This is Virko. It's Virko. So this is Virko. So it goes, it, it, it says, uh, make a passing. Yeah, I mean, I have shown only this plot, and we have done also different plots to a larger distance in the comparison of the clusters. But this is still uns uncertain because, uh, I mean, we see also in a kind of an under density up to 50 megaparsec. And uh, this is still a bit uncertain because the, the data, which, uh, what we have used for this kind of reconstruction, is CF2, uh, the median distance of the uh, data is 70 megaparsec. Now, if we go to CF4, the median distance is 100, and we have plenty more data. So we hope to see it more contingent. Hmm. Hmm. I mean, observational, this is Virgo, and this is the local void. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, a slumped term. I mean, we, I mean, uh, these kind of simulations are basically Newtonian physics on the expanding background. So the input is the expanding background, the standard uh, standard model, Planck cosmology, Planck values. On top of this uh, Newtonian physics, which follows the evolution of structure, the problem is the problem is that uh, the data, and this is what you were talking about, uh, the data say that uh, the Hubble constant, the local measured Hubble constant, is 75. The global one, and this is the input to the simulation, is 67. This is from Planck, and we believe that Planck is correct. And uh, we are not sure whether this local uh, 75 is simple and incorrect. So there are many possibilities, in, in particular the, uh, the probability that uh, the letter, uh, the distance letter is not really correctly, the zero point is not correctly chosen. So this makes, this makes the situation difficult. But in the process of, uh, of co uh, constructing the initial conditions, we try to correct for this uh, difference between the observational data and uh, the underlying higher Hubble constant. And we think that we have, we think, <laughs> we believe that we have corrected it in the right way. You said yeah, that you had this uh, voice in discussed long ago in Sandwich. And uh, he proposed at that time since it was clearly already that the Hubble constant could depend on this structure. Hmm. This and, uh, and what you are proving is that really what we need is uh, the definition of the, uh, like Sandwich said, of the Hubble tension. The old Hubble tension between Sandwich and, and yeah. This was my
Okay, we have a change in the program. Uh, Lobanov is not at the meeting, therefore we ask uh, San Pio Kim to present his talk. He will be our last speaker of this morning session. I may use? Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> It is my honor and pleasure uh, to give a talk at uh, Zeldovi's meeting. I though I also invite a couple of times to attend, but that was in the middle of semester. Spring semester, I could not make it. Now, finally, I did it. <coughs> uh, I would like to uh, thank Lemo, Gregory, and Narek for organizing this wonderful workshop in three years after pandemic, four years. <clears throat> Actually, the title of uh, my talk today is Neutron Star as Strong Field QED Laboratory. This is the elaboration of the talk I gave at uh, the previous Italian-Korean symposium two, two years ago, Magnetar as Strong Field QED Laboratory. But since then, with my uh, collaborator, I elaborate the whole scenario and the theoretical framework further, so you will see many new interesting uh, results. Okay, uh, here I'll talk about the physics when we have electromagnetic theory beyond Maxwell. Maxwell, linear theory. So this means that uh, entirely we need new physics, so-called non-linear electrodynamics. The question is when we, we have to include, detect the physics from non-linear electrodynamics. That is when uh, first uh, magnet field, uh, magnet Lengths or electric lengths is comparable to or shorter than the characteristic length scale of physical systems such as plasma. There is a characteristic uh, length scale also in condensed matter. Then the electromagnetic theory, proper electromagnetic theory, uh, become nonlinear. We have to include some. And in Minkowski space time, the characteristic length scale is the Compton wavelength of electron or charged particle. Then QED loops contribute to Maxwell theory to, to have a new proper theory, so-called strong field QED. I'll talk about this strong field QED today. Now, uh, what, what is the criteria for electric and the bank field strength for that. There are a uh, simple physical way to understand that. That is that when charged particle, electrostatic potential of charged particle over one quantum wavelength equivalent to equal to rest mass of that charged particle, that will give you a critical field. The other way is that actually the energy density of electric electromagnetic field per unit quantum volume equal to the electron rest mass and the density. Ah, sorry, actually that is the field and density that will give you the same criteria for a critical field. Uh, in other words, for electron, uh, you have a critical field 10 to the 16 volt per uh, centimeter for magnetic field, 10 to 13 Gauss. That is huge beyond uh, the, the terrestrial uh, limit so far. And the intensity that is 20, uh, 10 to 29 watt per square centimeter, that is so huge. In such a, a strong electromagnetic field, we have new physics, so-called vacuum polarization effect, 
Another is electron positron pair production. It's a kind of some electron positron bomb just because uh, when you have critical electric field strength, then each Compton time and for each Compton volume, you have electron positron pair just pop up or produced from that. So really huge number of electron positron pair produced by such a critical electric field. So in reality, in physical situation, we cannot achieve such a uh, critical electric field just because of this reason. We cannot go down. Uh, however, uh, magnetic field can go beyond, even beyond the critical field. That uh, today I just focus on the physical processes uh, in near critical or super critical uh, magnetic field differ from those in uh, weak field QED. The strongest field on Earth actually that is achieved using ultra intense laser, that is Korean uh, optical laser uh, facility, achieved 10 to the 26 watt per square centimeter. Still, you see that there is a gap of 1 million in terms of electric and magnetic field strength. Three order still lower. That is uh, not enough to produce electron positive pair spontaneously out of this uh, laser. However, uh, still strong enough to may test the kind of vacuum polarization impact. I'll talk about that, just focus on that. Now, a couple of years ago, the ATLAS actually accelerated uh, red ions and just passing cross by the, the electric field between this uh, cross by the uh, red ions produce really huge electric field, 10 to the 23 volt per uh, centimeter. However, this is cannot be calibrated, cannot be controlled. So, though for the first time they argue that uh, they uh, could see light, light scattering. However, that is not controlled experiment observation. Using really high intense laser, we could control all parameters. That is uh, later on in my conclusion, I would like to advertise and propose uh, laboratory astrophysics using ultra intense laser and high electron beam lines. Uh, this actually summarized what kind of physics we, we can expect when we have a strong field and also high energy electrons. Actually, I quoted from uh, uh, Bing Zhang's uh, review article that here the current status Which one is the laser? Oh, okay. Oh, thank, you. Yes, thank you. Here, the Corex chip uh, is using two uh, GB electron. Actually, that is the laser weak field acceleration. We do not have uh, electron beam line, but still using petwater laser, possible to accelerate the electron to, to GB. And now for petwater laser, that has a strength 10 to the 23 watt per square centimeter. Actually, on this line, the uh, vertical axis, that is the power of laser, and the horizontal axis, actually, that is the electric field strength seen by accelerating electron. Then the current status here, uh, roughly four, four or five petawatt laser, and the chi parameter actually just because accelerating or high, highly moving electrons have additional uh, gamma factor. That gamma factor enhanced electric field seen by electrons, electrons themselves. So we, we have such a really high chi uh, parameter. Now, uh, Korean colleagues and Korean team is proposing a $1 billion uh, 
under the cathode laser facility. And if we have 10 or 20 GB electron beam lines, that is the perfect uh, facility to simulate laboratory astrophysics. That is my goal and my Korean colleague's goal. Instead of looking at or we can simulate extreme condition for astrophysical uh, phenomena such as neutron star collision. But uh, as, you, uh, as you know, it's a matter of budget. One billion dollar for 100 petal laser. But my Korean colleague already proposed to government. Now, uh, on the other hand, I just mentioned about the labor uh, laboratory uh, strong field uh, laser facility. However, in the sky, in the heaven, we have a really supercritical magnetic field. That is highly magnetized neutron star, in particular, uh, magnetars. They have magnetic field over uh, critical field. Uh, theoretically, there is upper bound for magnetic field of a neutron star that come from that the whole gravitational binding energy combust into magnetic field energy. So that uh, that bound gives 10 to the 18 Gauss for neutron star. That is huge. Also dynamo about that uh, how to how can neutron star achieve 10 to the 15? As I mentioned. Critical field strength is four times 10 to the 13 Gauss. So here, some the sum of neutron star already have the believed, you know, believed to have 10 to the 15 Gauss. So super critical already by factor of 50, the highest one. And also magnetar has been identified or observed. In uh, there are some proposal to use this highly magnetized neutron star as the QED laboratory. One of them is Compton Telescope. The other is actually that is ongoing project, Chinese uh, European project, enhanced X-ray timing polarimetry. And there is a nice review article about that. This is the, by measuring the period change of uh, high magnetized neutron star, you see that some of them already, that is 10 to the uh, 14 Gauss, so over critical magnetic field. So we have a candidate. Precise observation of this neutron star or high magnetized neutron star, then it will be possible to reconstruct electromagnetic field of neutron star. This means that we can better understand and better model the neutron star or magnetars. That is the uh, scientific goal. Actually, this is a catalog, and uh, Vicky Caspi, uh, she was awarded the show prize for this contribution, magnetars and the neutron star. All these have magnetic field strengths, uh, larger or stronger than critical field. Some of them in particular here, 20 times 10 to the 14, that is 50 times, 50 times uh, stronger than critical field. Now question is, how do we understand the photon propagation or uh, physics in such a really strong electromagnetic field background? Uh, here, the, the Cartoon, actually, that is the multipolar uh, configuration of magnetized neutron star. This is entirely challenging, uh, challenging uh, physical problem. Uh, the uh, GW170 uh, actually, that is the first observation of gravitation wave coming from collision or merge of two neutron stars, the unknown physics is that at the moment merger, actually electromagnetic processes, 
that is unknown just because it must be super strong or that is just because two colliding two neutron stars have strong magnetic field but at, at the moment merger we expect a really huge and super strong magnetic field and this electromagnetic field will will change the physics for gravitational wave uh, emission and other other so to properly uh, lay out framework for this merger of two neutron stars we need configuration and understand the physics in such a strong magnetic field this is the uh, current status on the left hand side this is uh, year old uh, years old of uh, the uh, catalog and right hand side this is the some proposal uh, even the European community they proposed I guess a so-called jet what uh, laser facility that will be really yeah, big money require big money such as tens of billion euros and uh, this Wednesday uh, Shangnan mentioned that the uh, his group, uh, his collaboration actually directly observed ten, more than 10 to 13 Gauss. That is that close we call critical field. Just because critical field is 4 point times 10 to 13 Gauss. So, so that is very close, near critical field, already directly observed, uh, he argued that. Now, uh, let me explain some of the theoretical thing. Actually, that is this we call strong field physics. Uh, actually, this, there are many proposals, top down and bottom up. But uh, today, I'll explain about the bottom, uh, the bottom up, uh, strong field QED thing and the explain about by vacuum by represents and polarization and X-ray polar polarimetry. And the other part of this strong field QED, that is the electron positron pair production, uh, so-called Schinger mechanism, Lemo and uh, Orge and Gregory and other people already gave a talk related to this shingle process or uh, Oleg will give a talk later on and about this one I'll give a talk next week next week in at Pescara about the, the tape production or emission of charged particle from magnetized black hole or charged black hole and the work this is a new part actually Lemo you need this scenario to complete your, your proposal, 50 years old, your proposal, I suggest magnetized black hole may explain, may uh, give you a physical kind of the, uh, the basis for your proposal for GRB. I'll talk about that uh, next Wednesday and your center. But today, I'll talk about different thing. And this is the summary of nonlinear electrodynamics. All belong to uh, Prebansky class. There are others, high, uh, high derivative terms involved. Uh, we can, you can construct such a term, such a Lagrangian, but uh, let me just focus on this, this type. Heisenberg Euler, QED uh, effect fraction also belong to that. And there are top down such as the von Impelt, uh, string theory uh, like von Impelt action and mod max, actually that conformal invariant action. And uh, Bronikov, Kiro, actually he used this nonlinear or uh, electric dynamics to find regular black hole solution, so-called Bronikov black holes. But I will not uh, go to that. Actually, most people uh, use this box diagram 
to explain about the vacuum by deep regions, but as I mentioned that the magnetic field strengths of magnetar or high magnetite neutron star have near critical or supercritical. There you cannot use this box diagram. This box diagram comes from this diagram, and the first one is actually charged linearization terms. So uh, that one actually discovered by, found by Heisenberg and Euler in 36, 1936, before QED era. And later on, uh, Julian Schinger introduced prototype integral method to complete this QED action. So we call uh, Schinger, uh, Heisenberg Euler and the Schinger effect action that is given by this expression. Now we have Maxwell term and the pseudo scalar term and combination of them enter into one of effective action. This is complete one of effective action. By one of effective action, I mean uh, summing all these infinite diagrams of an even number of uh, external, photo, uh, external photons. Then just because of this structure and uh, in particular when uh, we can find a Lorentz frame where electric field and magnetic field are parallel to each other, then actually in that frame, in that Lorentz frame, we have uh, poles. These poles il explain electron positron pair production. Actually, uh, there is a relation between imaginary part, vacuum persistence part, and uh, pair production. Uh, higher number of pair productions, pairs. Now, uh, let me briefly explain. Time is learning, learning up so fast. Uh, now I have less than five minutes. So let me uh, just finish all, all this theoretical one in less than five minutes. Yep. Actually, uh, QED action uh, in supercritical field, either electric field or magnetic field here, Epsilon and uh, uh, better, actually the ratio between electric field to mass, critical, critical field, or magnetic field to that. That is given by, actually uh, obtained by Littles and uh, Dietrich. Actually that has the magnetic field square term, actually that is Maxwell term times log of B square. It does not grow like a power law. It grow like additional factor grow like uh, log, log of B square. We uh, divide by uh, some dimensional uh, parameter. And two loop action has similar form, except for there is additional factor alpha, just because two loop means that actually we have internal lines, internal virtual photon lines, then that will always give alpha. So combine these two QED loops, then two loop uh, contribute small, just percent, uh, the alpha over pi. So we, it is quite safe to use one loop just because of this reason, even for supercritical magnetic field. Then I better to skip all these things. Then actually, the, at the 17th Italian Korean Symposium online, I, with my collaborator that is, will be published in AIP conference proceeding, uh, introduced just because most people studying modeling a strong field, high magnetic neutron star, actually using only magnetic field part. Just because of a highly spinning of a neutron star, electric field are introduced, induced. So this induced electric field actually give wrench effect. That means that actually the pseudo scalar does not vanish. In that case, that is deeper from purely magnetic field case. So that is the physical motivation. Now, 
uh, my collaborator Chalmin team and I, I use uh, the introduce uh, this the, uh, formulation and actually found that one of effect vector uh, including the induced electric field coming from highly rotating magnetic field configuration, then it has additional factor. As I said, we need very precise observation of X-ray polarometry in the future in order to reconstruct electromagnetic field uh, configuration, intensity and direction and other. That is essential ingredient to uh, model, a theoretical model, the neutron star. That is the motivation. So you see that some, some difference. You, you, may, you may say that that is only that of 20%. However, precise observation and measurement is needed for this uh, X-ray polarimetry and the reconstruction of electromagnetic field. And this is the well-known result in weak field limit when electric and magnetic field are subcritical. This is well-known, even though uh, in laboratory, uh, uh, still too early to observe this vacuum by refrigerants. And uh, some claim that actually for the first time, see the observed vacuum by refrigerants from the neutron star, actually vacuum polarization effect, but there are some debate about the uh, plasma effect. As, uh, Volker mentioned the strong field QED is the simplest one. Once you have electron uh, positron plasma or other ionized, ionized plasma, then actually physics become very complicated. So anyway, now I'll briefly explain about what changes. Actually, uh, when we have both electric and magnetic field actually then in nonlinear electrodynamic scheme, then actually uh, magnetic field can uh, induce electric displacement. That is unusual thing. And similarly, electric field also induce the magnetic uh, first step magnetic permeability, yeah. So this is entirely most general. And this, uh, this two term actually enter in pure magnetic field. Uh, we have only half of them, so simple. That is the reason why it is simple to find uh, refraction index even in supercritical field and also propagation of polarization vectors. Uh, however, uh, when you have wrench effect due to non-vanishing or induced electric fields, then this term play very important role, make things very complicated. We have uh, analog in condensed matter, so-called uh, magnetoelectric material or multi uh, peronics where we actually see these, these two terms affect the physics for uh, electromagnetic theory. Just because electric field uh, contribute, sorry, magnetic field contribute to di dielectric and electric field contribute to uh, magnetic permeability. That is very uh, unusual new physics. And the possible to find vacuum by represents actually this uh, yep, already published in, so you, you can take a look. Now this is the real calculation. Uh, with my collaborator, we spent one year to find, to calculate this term, but actually Volker and uh, your collaborators uh, you introduce covalent formulation here, 
we use three plus one formulation. That is just because adapted for real observation. Very similar concept used in GR, general relativity. Covariance looks really good, but for real calculation, three plus one formulation, decomposing time component and the space component, that is easy and can translate or were interpreted in directly in terms of the, the relative physics. This is the uh, pulsar model. There, the North Pole, the, the uh, pole of magnetic field, there in this electric field point the same direction, parallel. There, so uh, close to uh, northern the pole or southern pole, actually, we have to include both the uh, the the wrench effect, the magnetoelectric response for vacuum by reprisons and also polarization vector. This is the uh, more generous uh, the theoretical uh, framework to find polarization vector and Pauli, Volker and uh, Lamazal and Marshalls. I uh, introduced very beautiful covariant form. However, we need three plus one, three plus one the formulation to provide a template for precise observation. That that is the motivation. There must be always a physical motivation. Okay, now this is the conclusion. Uh, as I explained, uh, strong field equity processes. Very interesting. It involves, it predicts many interesting new physics such as vacuum propagation, photon photon scattering. But more challenging thing is that actually the electron positron pairs produced by Schinger mechanism in the background of supercritical, super strong electromagnetic field. There we have plasma of electron positron pair and also QED. That will be very challenging, but we need that for realistic understanding. I, I mean, realistically understanding the black holes or neutron star. Otherwise, the, we, we do not have the neutron star without plasma, surrounding plasma, or black hole magnetize or charge black hole without surrounding uh, plasma. That is not physically realistic. So this is a really challenging problem for, yeah, for researchers, in particular for uh, young generation. Now, I would like to uh, the finish my talk by explaining, uh, repeating again, laboratory physics. Now, it is possible using ultra intense laser, we can simulate the extreme environment for astrophysical phenomena. What we need is 100, 100 or 200 petahertz laser or exawatt laser. It will cost more than billion dollar or billion euro. And we need, like in Germany, you have been the accelerator, we need 10 or 20 GB accelerator. Then that is the perfect the, the, uh, uh, experimental uh, tools were set up for really this uh, so-called laboratory astrophysics. So thank you for uh, listening to my talk. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah, actually, this is the simplest uh, uh, field configuration, but we have more uh, elaborated model just based on the encoded space time, incl even including gravity. We have a better configuration. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yes. Yes, yes. What is the, as you know, only rotation is doing? Uh, yeah. What minimum rotational frequency is required? Oh, actually, you see, uh, here I skip all theoretical uh, part the equations. Now you see that actually here, induced electric field coming from this dipole model, uh, so called uh, Gold Rage Julia model. Uh, because of uh, highly spinning, it induces electric field proportional to omega. So the high rotation will induce a stronger electric field. Very slow one, the actually electric field induced one, electric field smaller, just because of power law already. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Two months. Yeah, okay, okay. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, actually Gregory changed the schedule, yeah. so I had to return to bring my notebook and I realized that I was wearing uh, short, so I went to my room to change the clothes. So the, 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 the last one third, but I know I, I study black hole physics too, so yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, 
Красная флешка оставалась, нет? Не ходили, я ее сейчас не видел. Я тоже. Since you are chair, yes? Uh, I can make this six in a row. И там надо найти ПДФ с Ереваном. Вот здесь вот последний. Так, у вас доклад сейчас, сегодня? Или завтра? Вот. Ну, по-моему, четвертый, что ли, по порядку. Бронников. Ну, здесь надо... Бронников? Бронников, да. Все, все, все. Ну, вы записываете, наверное, под именем фамилии Захватчиков, да? Бронников. Правильно написано. Сейчас я вам флешку верну. Могу открыть, чтобы вы посмотрели. Так. Ага. Нормально все. Все? Ну, все правильно. Все. Отлично. Так, а дальше как я управляю? Вот это я управляю. Это предыдущее, а это планер у нас. Да, что-то не работает. Сейчас просто переключены. Вот это да. Батарейка а могла сесть, что можно Не, не, не. На экране работает все нормально. Ну, отлично. Все. Спасибо. Вам тоже. Дайте мне. А кто имеет на ней? Ну, а мы дадим так сказание, микрофон на имя
կարաջան դավիթյա կոնվերանսը նայր էր նշան։ Կումատանեք, մենք 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 կումատանե
Start on the back of the night stand, with the two of the flamenco club then fully waited for five more minutes because we have a long program to catch the moon so let's start now. Uh, and the uh, the speaker, this is the uh, Alan Sahalan and uh, he would like to talk about Latin heritage or past frame and the future of this time. Okay, thank you. I'm grateful to organizers for this possibility. Uh, I will speak about combined effects of uh, gravity and topology. Step. Combined effects of gravity and topology uh, on the properties of the vacuum state for quantum fields. And uh, this is the topic which, is, uh, which belongs to quantum field theory on curved background and uh, among the founders of this direction in gravitational investigations was uh, Professor Jakob Borisovic Zildovic. Uh, outline of my talk will be as follows. First, I will uh, shortly describe what are cosmic strings. After that, some motivations why we consider anti de Sitter space-time as a gravitational background. And then I will pass to the problem setup we are solving, uh, well, we are going to solve. And I will speak about vacuum expectation values for scalar fields, after that some uh, features for fermionic fields and some further devel developments in these directions of investigation. So cosmic strings are well known uh, topological defects, in fact, the most popular topological defects which uh, can form during the phase transitions in the early uh, universe in uh, high energy field theories, grand universe theories. Uh, alternative mechanism uh, was considered recently related to the brain inflationary models uh, within the uh, framework of the string theory. Uh, so the uh, observation of the cosmic microwave background have shown that the cosmic strings cannot be the main source for the uh, seeds of the large scale inhomogeneity formation in the universe, but cosmic strings uh, uh, still are sources of a large number of gravitational effects. And here I have listed some, uh, on some of the gravitational lensing, generation of gravitational waves, high energy cosmic strings, gamma rays, bites, and, uh, ray bursts, and so on. Uh, global strings, uh, they are just uh, uh, the simplest example uh, which uh, shows the string type defects. This is the complex scalar field with Mexican had, pot Mexican had potential with this type. In this case, we have global string. Uh, more physical is the scalar field plus gauge field system. In this case, we have the local or gauge string. In this case, uh, the uh, gravitational characteristics exponentially decays with the distance from the string. And uh, uh, if we consider the gravitational field uh, from cosmic strings, in this case, we should solve the set of equations with the Einstein equations, and no uh, exact solutions are present. Uh, uh, for that reason, uh, for most cosmological applications, we can uh, take the simplest model when the, uh, we consider the string as a linear defect. And in this case, the gravitational field has a simple structure. Uh, uh, if we consider the string with zero weight, uh, this corresponds to the energy momentum tensor, which is located on the uh, line. And you can see in this case, we have a uh, Lorentz invariance along the direction of the string. And uh, the line element uh, corresponding is this, this one. There, mu is the linear mass, de mass density for the string. If we pass to new angular coordinate, this will be just a Minkowski metric. The only difference is that the, now the uh, angle phi, uh, effective angle 
see changes in the region from zero to some phi zero, and this is just uh, some uh, planar angle deficit. If you just cut uh, from uh, uh, plane this uh, angle and glue this one, you will obtain some conical geometry uh, with this top. Uh, everywhere except this top, the geometry remains the flat. The only effect here will be the just a non-trivial topology related uh, to the planar angle deficit. And this non-trivial topology induces, uh, uh, modifies the vacuum fluctuations for quantum fields and uh, uh, vacuum expectation values for physical characteristics will obtain some contributions coming from non-trivial topology. And large number of uh, investigations are present in this direction, but a main part of these investigations consider flat space-time geometry. For cosmic strings in current space-time, we will have two contributions to the vacuum polarization. The first one comes from the non-trivial topology, and the second one yeah, that, that comes from the uh, polarization uh, induced by the gravitational field. Uh, exact results can be obtained, of course, for highly symmetric background geometries. And uh, from this one, the most popular, uh, most simplest cases are the Desitter and anti desitter space-time, which are maximally symmetric solutions of the Einstein equations with positive and negative gravitational constants, uh, cosmological constants. Uh, now, some uh, words, uh, why anti desitter space-time we take as a background geometry. First of all, as I said, the anti desitter space-time is uh, uh, maximally symmetric, and for that reason, a large number of problems can be exactly solved on this background. Uh, second, here uh, the also uh, is an uh, uh, arena where we can uh, test the quantization uh, procedure in curved backgrounds. Uh, uh, quantization of fields in anti desitter space-time is not just a simple rewriting of the corresponding procedure in Minkowski space-time. Just for that, the anti desitter space-time has causal boundary and special boundary conditions should be imposed on the quantum fluctuations uh, to uh, not lose the uh, unitarity of the theory. Uh, also, anti desitter space-time appears as a ground state in extended supergravity and string theories, and recently, to uh, additional motivations appear related to ADS-CFT correspondence and also brainward models. A large number of brainward models are formulated on ADS background, like the Randall syndrome model. Uh, the problem set up uh, for our case uh, for the scalar field is the following. We will consider the, uh, this geometry. This is anti desitter space-time in Poincaré coordinates. And here, uh, the cosmic string is encoded here on this parameter. If the cosmic string is absent, this Q is 1, and we will obtain just the pure anti-desitter space-time. This means that this is locally anti-desitter space-time, but topology is different. Here, uh, z equal to 0 corresponds to ADS boundary, and ADS horizon is presented by z equal to infinity. We will consider the scalar field with general kavachi kaplan parameters. And uh, the, we are interested in the local characteristics of the vacuum, like vacuum expectation value of the field squared and the energy momentum tensor. In order to evaluate these expectation values, we use the following procedure. We solve this equation. We find the complete set of solutions. And then this Weitman function, two-point function, can be evaluated just summing this series with this uh, classical function. Uh, this uh, describes the correlation of vacuum fluctuations at different space-time points. Uh, we uh, uh, decompose this function into two contributions. This is the uh, Weitman function uh, in anti desitter space-time when cosmic string is absent, when Q is equal to 1. And this is induced by the uh, non-trivial topology induced by the cosmic string. And by using that decomposition, we can evaluate the vacuum expectation value of the field squared just taking the consensus limit. Of course, uh, this consensus limit is divergent. But the good thing here is that the presence of the cosmic string doesn't change the local geometry outside, the, outside of the string core. This means that uh, 
divergences are contained, uh, contained only in this part. Just for that, the divergences are very unsensitive, only the local geometry. And the local geometry, in the presence and in the absence of this thing, remains the same. For that reason, the divergences here are the same as divergences here. For that reason, the, uh, uh, there is no need for the renormalization in this part. This means that this, this decomposition directly solves the problem for the renormalization uh, of the fifth sphere. This part is well investigated. Uh, Poincare vacuum is maximally symmetric. For that reason, this is just constant. And all the dependence of space-time coordinates appears in this topological part. And this topological part can be presented in this form. This square brackets means the integer part. And this function is related to the associated Legendre function of the second kind. This is valid for all values of the Q. And this new parameter is this. From the stab stability condition for the vacuum uh, state, one needs to have this uh, inequality. You can see that here, this vacuum expectation value depends on this co radial coordinate. This is the uh, radial coordinate distance from the string. And this z coordinate in, in uh, Poincare z coordinate uh, in, the com in this combination. This is the proper distance from the string. Uh, of course, this is the uh, consequence of the maximal symmetry of the ADS space time. The simplest case would be the uh, conformally coupled massless field. In this case, the curvature coupling parameter is this. And uh, it can be seen that, uh, seen that topological part in this expectation value uh, is related to the Minkowskian part by this standard uh, topologic uh, conformal relation. But here, the uh, crucial point in the following. Uh, and the sitter space-time is conformally related to Minkowski space-time, but with additional boundary. And this is the conformal image of the anti desitter boundary. For that reason, this is the expectation value in Minkowski space-time for cosmic string. And this is expectation value which is induced by this boundary in Minkowski space-time. This is the Dirichlet boundary. This means that operator of the field vanishes from this boundary. Uh, let us consider the asymptotics. For points near the string, uh, the leading term is given by, and this is this coincides with the Minkowskian result. This, this shows that the effects of gravity near the string are weak. The gra influence of gravity is, is, is essential at large distances, and in this case, you can see that we have power law decay. In the Minkowskian case, uh, for example, we can see that in this case, the for massive field decay, decay, uh, decay is exponential. Here we have uh, for massive field, as get, as get for, uh, that's powerly uh, decay. On ADS boundary, the vacuum expectation value vanishes like this. And on uh, near the horizon, we have this derivative. And the similar investigation we have done for the energy momentum tensor. Uh, energy momentum tensor is of the, has of diagonal component. This is this component. This is the topological part. Here, I give uh, this for conformally, uh, the, for small distances, and these are related to the Minkowskian string, and these are the large distances, again, with uh, power law decay. And this, you can see that energy density can be either positive or negative. This is the characteristic feature for vacuum. As this is the function of the planar angle deficit. We have also done similar investigations for fermionic field. We have evaluated the fermionic condensant. This is the part induced by the cosmic string. And similar formula you can see here related to the associated Legendre function. Uh, these are the asymptotics for the uh, fermion condensate near cosmic string at, at large distances. Again, we have here some conformal relation with the Minkowskian case. This is the uh, fermion condensate. And uh, this is the uh, any, uh, vacuum expectation value of the energy momentum tensor. Unlike to the scalar case, here the energy momentum tensor is diagonal of the diagonal component is zero. This is the relation with the Minkowskian result. In the Minkowskian case, for a, ma uh, for a massless fermionic field, the uh, behavior is this. But at large distances, we have uh, completely different behavior. This means that gravity essentially changes the behavior of the topological part 
at distances larger than the curvature radius of the background spacetime. And some other uh, further developments, we have also uh, usually the uh, strings also have some magne magnetic flux confined inside the string. And this magnetic flux induces also vacuum currents. You have vacuum states and some azimuthal currents along the cosmic string. Uh, we have also considered the cosmic strings which are compactified along its axis. And in these papers, we have considered this effect. We, are, we have also considered the effect when you have cosmic string and perpendicular brain. This uh, is appropriate for the case of a Randall syndrome brain work geometry. And we have also considered a uh, finite temperature effect. And uh, some co also papers related to the space spacetime vacuum. Yes. Uh, for example, if we have cosmic, okay, we have cosmic string. If we have cosmic string in uh, anti Dessiter bulk, and we consider a CFT, this means that we will have some cosmic string in conformal field theory, which lives on the boundary of anti Dessiter spacetime, and we have considered defects which for example, are two-dimensional, not linear. But their uh, projection on the ADS boundary from the point of view conformal field theory, this is just the usual cosmic string. This means that having these expectation values, we can get some information for string in conformal field theory. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry? Uh, yeah, it's quite related to the earlier talks. Uh, and uh, also, uh, we have a good contact uh, with those groups. And so, um, in short, uh, actually, uh, first, uh, good afternoon, <laughs> everybody. I'm Dimitri Litvinov. And uh, in short, uh, the title is indeed quite long. In short, uh, it's uh, uh, I'm going to present you the results of our research on what kind of uh, gravitational experiments with uh, current and uh, next generation atomic clocks will be possible in the very near future. Uh, this uh, work uh, outgrown of our recent research, uh, which we published in a classical quantum gravity paper, uh, on the concept we proposed of uh, a gravitational redshift experiment with two orbital satellites to test the Einstein equivalence principle. It is uh, well known that uh, a direct consequence, uh, one of the direct consequences of the Einstein equivalence principle is the gravitational redshift. And uh, to the lowest order, uh, the gravitational redshift uh, of uh, an electromagnetic wave is proportional to the difference of the gravitational potential uh, between the points uh, between which uh, the wave propagates. For example, uh, if you send a signal uh, from an orbit to the ground or to another satellite on a low orbit, uh, its uh, electromagnetic uh, gets blue shifted. Its uh, frequency shifts to the higher uh, and uh, if uh, you send uh, a signal, uh, say, from the ground or from another uh, spacecraft in low orbit uh, to a spacecraft on a high orbit, its uh, signal gets redshifted, hence uh, the name for the effect. And uh, we considered this experiment uh, 
on how accurately you can measure this quantity, but actually uh, you are interested not in uh, currently, not in confirming the validity of equivalence principle. Uh, we all are trying to find uh, very tiny deviations from this principle. And uh, in one uh, possible ways, uh, it can be broken like this. Uh, in Einstein's theory, this uh, epsilon violation parameter is zero. But uh, for example, uh, if there are some scalar fields, uh, this can result uh, which are coupled non-universally to other net fields. Um, uh, this can result in a non-zero value of the epsilon parameter. So the goal is to measure as accurate as possible this uh, epsilon parameter. And uh, we suggested this configuration, as I said, uh, for this uh, measurement. A uh, few words on what it is. Uh, it's actually two satellites on the same geometrical uh, orbits, but in antiphase. They are all, always moving on the same sides of the Earth, but uh, when one pass, passes uh, perigee, another one passes uh, aperture. So uh, this uh, provides for uh, uninterrupted visibility, a large redshift modulation, and also uh, good bonuses, uh, no atmospheric interference. So in this experiment, uh, we determined its frequency, uh, sorry, its accuracy. Uh, here is the accuracy of the experiment. Here is its duration. So after three years, with uh, one uh, of the best uh, currently available clocks, uh, we showed that the accuracy can be achieved uh, of uh, something about 10 to the minus 10. So it's quite high accuracy. Current level for this uh, uh, measurement is uh, five orders of magnitude uh, lower. And uh, considering the value of the gravitational potential of the Earth, it's obvious that uh, uh, second order effects in the gravitational potential or a fourth order effects uh, in the reverse speed of light uh, become uh, possible to be measurable. And uh, uh, this uh, is uh, the result of the investigations of what kind uh, of measurements can be performed at this level is what I'm going to tell you about now. But uh, first, a few words on what uh, these uh, names are, what are these curves, and how we estimated the accuracy uh, in uh, this paper because it's basically the same approach we followed uh, also in this research. So this are uh, just uh, three clocks. VCH1010 is the hydrogen maser clock which f uh, flew on board radio astron spacecraft. It's a hydrogen maser, quite accurate and quite stable clock, but the least stable of these three. Ferro is uh, the cesium fountain clock we all expect uh, to be flown onto the International Space Station soon and become part of the ACET experiment. And uh, this is uh, Gila Stronsum clock, one of the best uh, currently available laboratory clocks. These are space qualified clocks, and this is currently only a laboratory clock. And uh, uh, how you characterize a clock? Uh, one of the most convenient uh, uh, clock characterizations is uh, the LN deviation. It depends on the average time. Uh, and uh, actually, for uh, estimating the accuracy in such experiments, what you need is the power spectral density. Uh, but LN deviation, which in some sense is uh, the root mean square of frequency fluctuations uh, for non stationary processes, uh, random processes, uh, it's an equivalent for this case. Uh, in our case, for clocks, uh, which usually uh, have their noise composed of white, uh, flick, and brown uh, noise components, there is one-to-one -one correspondence, so it's quite easy to obtain this curve uh, from open sources uh, for these clocks. And from them, uh, we can quite easily compute the power spectral density, which we actually need. And uh, from this, uh, uh, basically, after we uh, state the measurement equation, uh, it's all we need to estimate the accuracy of the parameter we are interested in. Here on the left side is uh, what we measure in the experiment, the fractional frequency shift, the gravitational part of the frequency shift. Uh, here is the uh, regular component which, uh, with the gravitational potential difference, uh, which we compute from the orbit uh, provided by the ballistic centers. And here is an unknown parameter, uh, which is the difference. Uh, the clocks might be slightly mistuned, so there is this parameter, which uh, can be unknown also, but it's a nuisance parameter. We are not interested in it. 
And this is actually the parameter we are interested in estimating. And after we specify the parameters of the clock, as I uh, told you on the previous slide, uh, we can use uh, the standard theory of parameter estimation. We used, uh, thank you, uh, the Kramer R bound. Uh, also, uh, we computed in quite convenient form the uh, covariance matrices for this noise. And then, using this Kramer R bound, we obtained uh, that curve I showed you before, two minutes ago. But actually, uh, this equation is not what you have in a real experiment. In a real experiment, you send a signal from a spacecraft, for example, to another spacecraft, and it's con contaminated by various other effects. Uh, in the zero order, of, co of course, there is no contamination, but in the first order, in the reverse velocity of light, there is an unrelativistic Doppler shift, which is basically the rate of change uh, of the radial distance. And then there is the second order effect, which is the gravitational effect we're interested in, and some combination of kinematic parameters. And all this should be subtracted from the measured value of the frequency shift. Uh, and only after this we have uh, this gravitational experimentally determined frequency shift. The real problem is with this, that to compute this term from the orbit, uh, you need an insanely accurate orbit for a clock to, with an accuracy and stability of 10 to the minus uh, 18, you need an accuracy determination for velocity at the level of sub, sub nanometer per second. This is unrealistic currently, uh, but uh, for the second uh, order terms, there is also quite high requirements uh, about micrometer per second, but this is realistic, this can be achieved. It's state of that, but it's possible. So the problem is to deal with this term, to eliminate it somehow. And it turns out that this is indeed possible if we have a, a two-way uh, frequency link in addition to the one-way. So uh, this probably can be better understood in this scheme. Uh, if you send a signal to the spacecraft from a tracking station or, or another spacecraft, coherently retransmit it and receive it at the originator, then you have a two-way signal. And uh, also you simultaneously send a one-way signal locked to the onboard clock. And then if you combine these two frequency shift, uh, you arrive at a combination which is free because the two-way link is uh, twice, has twice the Doppler shift. Uh, you get rid of this nuisance term and you have only second order and high effect. So the actually interested uh, uh, interesting uh, equation for us is not the one-way frequency link. In the real experiment, you need to have a theoretical expression for this combination of uh, measurements. And uh, this is what we, uh, we are, uh, have been working on quite heavily. And we obtained this result at the fourth level, uh, fourth order of, thank you, uh, uh, speed of light reversed. Uh, uh, this expression is to the third order in the reverse speed of light, it has an equation some, some time, uh, but it looks quite uh, complicated, but not as the one I'm going to present you now. Here is a really huge expression we obtained. It's the frequency shift of this combination to the fourth order. It's really incomprehensible, but there is gravitational terms here, kinematic terms. Uh, let's uh, go to this simpler form of this uh, equation. Uh, not all of it, but parts, two parts, which are proportional to the PTN parameters gamma and PTN parameter beta. For the beta, the expression is quite simple, it's just a combination of gravitational potentials. But for gamma, there is also a combination uh, of kinematic parameters. And this is actually what we are interested in if we are to measure the gamma and beta uh, PTN parameters. Uh, just uh, a very quick reminder of what these parameters are, because some astrophysicists here might not quite remember what it is. If you expand uh, the metric terms uh, uh, around the Minkowski metric uh, in the big gravitational potential, you, in the very simplest model of this expansion, you get two parameters, gamma and beta, uh, which are ones in uh, general relativity. So uh, it's quite interesting to measure the deviation, possible deviation from these uh, values. Uh, because, for example, in uh, Brans Dicke scalar gentle theory, we have values that differ from this. So that was our goal. This is just the general expression for this expansion. 
to Raimondo. So we uh, return, uh, I need, I think, a bit, two minutes more. Can I help? Okay, thank you. So uh, I return to where I started. Uh, we pick uh, the two sets of light experiment. Uh, we uh, make a slight ad hoc modification to it. Uh, in our original research, uh, which I talked about uh, five minutes before, uh, we have a completely anti-phase configuration where the passage of pergy apogee were simultaneous. Here we added uh, a small uh, shift so that uh, the signals come sometimes quite close to the earth. So uh, this is ra rather ad hoc, ad hoc modification just uh, to look at uh, what we can have uh, in some possible configuration of an experiment. It's not an optimal configuration. And uh, another interesting thing is uh, we can see not only Earth orbiters, but also Sun orbiters. So this is uh, the parameters of the uh, two orbits. Uh, they are the same as I said, but shifted by, uh, in the mean anomaly, by 150 degrees. And this is the signal we are to measure if we are going to uh, uh, measure the beta uh, PPN parameter. This is the frequency shift, uh, which we will have proportional to the beta parameter. It's fourth order in the reverse uh, velocity of light. Uh, as you can see, it peaks under 10 to the minus 18, so probably we will not be able to detect it. And as you can see from this graph, here is the accuracy of beta experiment duration. Indeed, even with the best clock, uh, after two months of uh, data accumulation, you do not even have a uh, hundred uh, percent accuracy. This is understandable because the effect is indeed small. Let's see what we have for the gamma parameter. Here we see the same orbital configuration. Here we see that the effect is larger, so we can hope uh, to measure it with some accuracy. And indeed, uh, for the auxiliary strontium clock, we can measure it uh, to about 10% accuracy after uh, two months of data accumulation. So in a few years, it will be about uh, uh, like 3% probably. Uh, but uh, still not quite impressive. Uh, it tells us that uh, uh, these contributions should be taken into account in future experiments, but this uh, really is not a good means, looks like, not like a good means to uh, measure those PPN parameters. Let's look at uh, what we have with sun orbiters. Here we have uh, an orbit quite similar to the one of Mercury. The signal, even for beta, now peaks at 10 to the minus 15. Uh, just one minute more, please. And indeed, uh, for Zilla and even for Ferro, uh, we have after uh, now two years of data accumulation. For the sun, the is larger, of course. Uh, we have a value of beta measurable to three digits after the decimal point, quite good compared uh, to the current best, which is determined from Mercury perihelion shift, just uh, uh, about uh, 10, uh, a factor of 10 words. And let's finally look at the gamma. Here the signal for the same orbital configuration peaks almost at 10 to the minus 12, and the experiment accuracy for this ad hoc orbit configuration uh, reaches uh, 10 to the minus five after two years of data accumulation. This is better than Cassini experiment result. So uh, after orbit uh, optimization, we can hope uh, that uh, probably one or even two orders of magnitude improvement could be reached with some orbiters for PPN parameter gamma. And uh, I just mentioned that uh, I promised uh, in my abstract to talk about light curve dark matter. This is possible in the same kind of experiments, but uh, uh, I knew beforehand that I would be <laughs> possible to talk about it, so I'm sorry, it's only spoiler. We have quite interesting results here, but uh, next time at some other point, I hope I'll tell you about this very interesting uh, side of this experiment. So this is the summary of what I said. Uh, basically, uh, we obtained uh, an equation uh, to the fourth order in the reverse frequency of light for the comp Doppler compensated two-way frequency transfer and explored some of its consequences for ad hoc orbit configurations. And this turns out that this, uh, in the very near future, can result in a completely new kind of uh, measurements 
uh, determinations of uh, BPN parameters and possibly other ways of form explore the fascinating features of gravity. Thank you very much. That's all. Dear colleagues, uh, first of all, I am very grateful to the organizers uh, for this possibility to give a talk on this conference. Uh, I will speak about uh, some toy model um, which uh, considers a so-called gravity assist maneuver uh, as a possible test of uh, relativistic gravity. Uh, this work uh, is in collaboration with Professor uh, Bronikov and uh, Dr. Kvartsova. Uh, the main idea of uh, this work is the following. Uh, we consider the gravity assist maneuver. Uh, the gravity assist maneuver, uh, GA, this is a correction of uh, spacecraft motion uh, at its person near a some planet as a tool for evaluating the post-Newtonian parameters, beta and gamma, uh, which characterize uh, vacuum spherically symmetrical solutions uh, in metric theories of gravity. Uh, and uh, we try to estimate the effect of variation of these two parameters on a particular trajectory of uh, some probe launched from the Earth uh, orbit and passing closely near Venus, uh, where relativistic corrections slightly change uh, the impact parameter of probe, uh, and uh, uh, the measurements of uh, the probe destination point shift, uh, amplified by uh, gravity assist maneuver, uh, can improve our knowledge uh, about values of these uh, two parameters in controlled space experiment. Uh, as I said, uh, this uh, maneuver uh, is a type of maneuver in the neighborhood of a massive celestial body, for example, a planet, uh, using its gravitational field to adjust a spacecraft's trajectory, changing its velocity uh, and save fuel. Uh, and uh, historically, uh, there are many examples of usage. Uh, for example, missions Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 uh, used this maneuver near Jupiter and Saturn, which gave them a record speed of recession from the solar system. And uh, an important aspect of this uh, gravity assist maneuver is a high sensitivity uh, of a subsequent spacecraft trajectory to variations of its initial parameters. Uh, uh, hence, the for revealing the difference between Newtonian gravity and Newtonian relativity, uh, as uh, was proposed in work uh, by Professor Efremov. And in this work, uh, we consider uh, gravity assist as a possible precise test of metric theories of gravity. Uh, we know that for a spherical symmetric field, uh, there are two Livingston parameters, beta and gamma, uh, post-Newtonian parameters. Uh, and uh, in uh, general relativity, these parameters are equal to one. Uh, and uh, these uh, two parameters affect the probe motion before a uh, gravity assist maneuver. And then this maneuver uh, greatly amplifies uh, this influence, uh, determining measurable quantities uh, of a subsequent motion of, the, of this probe. Uh, and uh, now 
these parameters are known up to uh, approximately 10 to minus 4. Uh, and um, um, this uh, possible uh, gravity assist experiment, in principle, may improve uh, our knowledge uh, of these parameters. So this is a, uh, it was a main idea. Uh, the main assumption, uh, we consider the following scheme, the following trajectory of a probe. Uh, the probe is launched from Earth at a certain point A. This is a Earth orbit, and this is a Venus orbit. And this is the trajectory of, of the probe. Now uh, the probe is launched at a certain point A. Uh, and uh, the main assumptions are the, are the following. Uh, the spherical symmetry of spacetime uh, and the circular orbits of Earth and Venus. And uh, we assume that initial conditions of probe motion such that its Keplerian elliptic orbit crosses the orbit of Venus at points B and C for such values of uh, angles. And uh, a relativistic correction, delta phi to the probe motion, will slightly uh, move the intersection point from C uh, close to the Venus location at this time, which will strongly affect its further motion on this stage of trajectories, say to point A prime or, or and, uh, double prime, uh, depending on uh, slightly change of impact parameter near to Venus. Uh, let's consider the theoretical setup. Uh, consider the general state spherical symmetrical, symmetrical metric in uh, post-Newtonian representation containing two parameters, beta and gamma. Uh, we can uh, e evaluate uh, the invariance, uh, geodesic motion, with this motion, uh, this is a conserved energy per unit mass and the conserved angular momentum per unit mass. Uh, and uh, mm, using some accuracy assumptions, uh, we can conclude that a reasonable, uh, reasonable accuracy of delta phi is uh, 10 to minus 8, and we neglect smaller contributions. And uh, we can obtain the general formula for uh, angle phi covered between the radii R1 and R2 in the region of, uh, monoto of mon monotonic uh, changing of the radius. Uh, the formula says the following form. Uh, I, I will not uh, consider the calculations in detail because of time. Uh, I will speak about a main, a main idea. Uh, and to extract uh, the relativistic correction delta phi from this uh, general uh, angle phi, uh, we should subtract the corresponding Newtonian value. Uh, and uh, this Newton, Newtonian analog of this equation is the following. Uh, this is a well-known formula. Uh, and in particular, uh, we can uh, obtain uh, the well-known formula uh, which uh, can be found, for example, in Weinberg's uh, book, um, Gravity, uh, um, for um, change of the angle uh, for one period of evolution, uh, containing the two uh, parameters, beta and gamma. Uh, and in dry, in dry our case, uh, we can uh, obtain the form, f famous formula for a Mercury um, orbit precession for Pregelion shift. Uh, but for point E, uh, where the probe arrives, uh, we have a more complicated formula containing uh, two contributions uh, corresponding to the motion from the point A to uh, Pregelion P. Uh, this is a, this part of motion from A to P. And uh, the second uh, contribution is, to, uh, is, is uh, due to P to C. Um, so uh, 
then we can uh, consider uh, immediately uh, gravity assist maneuver near the Venus. And it can be shown that an intersection point B and C, uh, the component Bx of the probe orbital velocity coincides uh, with, the, uh, with the velocity of, uh, with the, 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 this projection of velocity of Venus. This is, can be easily shown. Uh, and uh, we use some initial conditions and numerical uh, parameters of orbits of Earth and Venus and their velocities and consider uh, the gravity assist near the Venus as an instantaneous event uh, because the planet steel sphere, the sphere of its gravitational influence, is small uh, and interplanetary scale. So this maneuver can be considered as an instantaneous event. This is so-called single instant hyperbola method. So uh, we can transform to the Venus reference frame uh, and uh, the trajectory of the probe near the Venus uh, will be uh, a simple hyperbola with some uh, numerical parameters. Uh, and uh, we can change, uh, we, we can, uh, um, we can um, consider the deflection angle in such a motion. And uh, we obtain uh, this deflection angle and the projections of the probe final velocities at the end of this gravitational assist maneuver. Uh, so uh, we can uh, obtain the resulting probe orbit parameters after this maneuver. Uh, and uh, in particular, aphelion perihelion radii. And of interest for us is the sensitivity of the probe aphelion position uh, when we change the impact parameter, for impact parameter B of the gravitation, uh, of the gravity assist maneuver. Uh, uh, it, uh, the gravity assist uh, serves, serves as amplifier of the relativistic correction, delta phi, uh, and uh, leads to uh, essential uh, change of the position of aphelion point of the probe. So at a small change delta B of the impact parameter, we have radial shift of the uh, point of aphelion and its tangential shift. Uh, these uh, two shifts lead to uh, shift of the uh, point A prime to the point A two prime, double prime. So uh, we can make some numerical estimates for uh, various um, values of the impact parameter B from uh, kilometer, uh, in kilometers. And uh, calculate the relativistic correction depending on uh, post-Newtonian parameters beta and gamma. Um, and uh, the main conclusion which uh, we can make, make in this case is that the parameters beta and gamma are uh, today unknown up to uh, 10 to minus 4. So to improve the knowledge about uh, values of these parameters, we need to determine the aphelion position uh, of the probe better than up to 50 kilometers, which in principle looks quite possible. So uh, this is the uh, end of my talk. This uh, we, see the, we see here concluding remarks. Uh, and um, uh, I must emphasize that uh, for demonstration purposes, we consider it uh, a toy model. Of course, a real experiment would require, would require taking into account all significant factors affecting the probe motion, such as the elliptic nature of uh, planet orbits, not, not of a circular perturbation from other planet gravity, uh, and uh, other uh, factors which uh, can correct uh, our consideration. So uh, this is the end of my talk. Thank you very much for uh, attention and uh, sorry for my bad English.
Uh, as I said above, uh, we consider uh, three models. This is the simplest model, uh, which is uh, which is aimed at uh, estimation of only uh, contribution of two post-Newtonian post parameters, beta and gamma, and um, uh, we do, do not make uh, estimations of uh, some other parameters. Well, uh, dear colleagues, uh, let me begin uh, with the words of gratitude for the opportunity uh, to be here and to uh, be, uh, give a talk before you. So the, I thank the organizers for that. Okay, uh, so uh, uh, the topic uh, about which I, uh, I'm going to, uh, to talk is uh, wormholes. I don't think that uh, wormholes is a subject uh, to be characterized in detail <coughs> in this audience, but nevertheless, I would say uh, that uh, as, uh, as soon as people uh, understood that space-time may be curved, uh, they understood that it, it may be very strongly curved. And uh, examples of such strong curvature are very well known. These are certainly black holes, and wormholes, uh, actually, they are even simpler than black holes, uh, but uh, they are more unusual because they, um, <coughs> they, they require uh, quite different conditions to be satisfied. So, um, uh, the, here is uh, just a, pr a, pr a small presentation of, it, of a quote from the famous paper by uh, Thorne and Company. And uh, they say that um, something that is um, uh, just a, a motive for wormhole studies uh, for many years, that what constra which constraints uh, to the laws of physics uh, place on the uh, activities of a uh, an arbitrary uh, advanced civilizations. And this will lead to some intriguing queries about the laws themselves. And I can say that uh, this subject is uh, very popular. Uh, just I <coughs> performed uh, a search in the archive and found that there are more than two, two and a half, uh, two and a half thousand results for all t years and uh, about 200 results for the past uh, 12 months about wormholes. Okay, uh, so um, wormhole is by definition, uh, in, in simple words, it's just like something like a tunnel bet between uh, universes or between distant parts of the same universe. And uh, to be more formal, let us restrict ourselves to spherical symmetry. In this case, things are much more clear, uh, evident so uh, the, the general spherical symmetric metric can be uh, just a moment. Well, well this other slide, yes. Uh, so this is the general, general form of uh, spherical symmetric metric. Then a uh, rigorous mathematical um, <coughs> definition can be given to a throat. Uh, the most narrow part of the uh, of a wormhole. Uh, so it's just a minimum of the uh, radius of the, uh, of the coordinate spheres attached to a, some uh, special section. In the case of uh, static wormholes, 
Uh, this is uh, really evident because uh, there is a special section that is uh, <coughs> distinguished among others. This is just the special sections which is um, orthogonal uh, to the uh, time-like killing vector. In the um, case of dynamical space-time, time-dependent, this is uh, not, uh, not uh, so evident. And uh, there are several definitions of wormhole throats. And the uh, most rigorous uh, definitions are connected with uh, the behavior of null con congruences. But uh, uh, for our purposes and for the situations that uh, we will consider, uh, the, uh, it is sufficient uh, to adhere to uh, a more evident uh, intuitively um, definition just as a, uh, select, we select, uh, <coughs> select uh, these this, um, special sections uh, being attached to uh, co-moving reference frames uh, with, a, with respect to matter we are considering, and just a regular minimum of the function R, uh, the spherical radius, uh, as a function of X and T. So, uh, what, uh, there are some general observations, and the main of them is uh, that uh, in the static case, it is necessary to have um, some exotic matter as a source of, uh, of gravity. In the case, uh, certainly, that we're using general relativity. Just one of the equations of general relativity, just a combination of different Einstein equations. Well, uh, well uh, just look up. I, ca I cannot uh, switch on uh, the pointer. <laughs> Okay, so that uh, the second derivative must be positive, and then uh, the sum of uh, density plus radial pressure must be negative. This is a violation of the null energy condition, and uh, this is what is called the necessity of the exotic matter. But what is very important, that uh, when we have a dynamic space times, uh, so if we want to consider the dynamic wormholes, then uh, this a restriction doesn't work. Then, for some time, in general, we may have wormholes uh, that uh, do not exist uh, eternally, but for some time they do exist and uh, may, for example, uh, <coughs> be used as a means of transportation or a means for uh, observing another universe and so on. So, um, then, uh, it, uh, an important point uh, for dynamic wormholes is that such a, uh, such a throat may exist only in a non-static region. So this, uh, this excludes many opportunities. For example, uh, if we uh, try to connect uh, such a throat with the usual infinity, it will be always uh, under um, a black hole horizon. So, uh, but uh, the things are different if we attach uh, wormholes not to uh, asymptotically fluid space time, but to cosmology. And uh, an example of such a wormhole will, uh, will be shown here uh, on, on the <coughs> using uh, that well known, uh, the method Tom and Bondi. A solution for the collapse of a dust cloud. Not, not necessarily collapse, just evolution of a, of a spherically symmetric dust cloud. So this is uh, quite an old problem uh, solved by uh, Tolman and other authors uh, almost uh, 100 years ago. So here are just some formulas for that. That's, I'm using uh, traditional notations, so uh, the large letter R means simply a, co a coordinate of a um, thin dust layer or dust, dust surface. <clears throat> in, it may be uh, called an address of such a surface or a number of such a surface. So this is uh, when we <clears throat> uh, change uh, the R coordinate, it means that we uh, just are coming from uh, one uh, commoving dust, surf dust surface to another. 
Yeah, uh, yeah. Then uh, here are the equations, uh, the Einstein equations uh, for this system, and uh, uh, there is a conservation law which uh, gi gives uh, <coughs> a relation for the density in terms of some uh, functions. And here, f of r is just an, ar an arbitrary function which appears due to integration in time. And then uh, another, uh, another arbitrary function, f small, appears uh, when we integrate also one of the Einstein equations. And uh, using that, we, um, we, we find an equation for uh, radial velocity, r, r dot, uh, which already includes two of these uh, arbitrary functions. So these are two many other, uh, two main other arbitrary functions. Then f of r, f large of r is connected with a mass function that is certainly related to the density, uh, initial density distribution of this dust cloud. And f small is related to initial, initial velocity distribution. And uh, as, uh, see, uh, although uh, the equations may be uh, integrated um, uh, in, in, integrated analytically um, for the case of non-zero cosmological constant and in the presence of our, an electric or magnetic field radially directed. But uh, the, if uh, the, there is no cosmological constant, it is very simple to interpret uh, the uh, function f small. Uh, if there is a non-zero, it is not so simple. But and, uh, <coughs> with a cosmological constant also, the further integration leads to elliptic integrals. So just to avoid this, <coughs> we will be using only the case of a zero cosmological constant. Then uh, positive values of uh, f small co correspond to hyperbolic motion of dust particles or even dust layers. And then uh, f equal to zero correspond to parabolic motion and uh, f smaller than zero to elliptic motion. So again, and so now let us discuss what, uh, what can we do with, how can we define von Hoek rules. Just uh, according to the definition which we already formulated, we must uh, try to uh, impose uh, the, the conditions r prime equal to zero, so this will be a minimum, and then uh, two pr uh, double prime uh, must be positive. And this leads to some uh, requirement, requirements applied to these um, arbitrary functions of the radial coordinate. And namely, it, it turns out that uh, the function f at such a, thro a throat is necessarily equal to minus one. And this means that uh, only elliptic motion is compatible uh, uh, only to, uh, is, is compatible uh, with wormholes. Then, and uh, after all, we obtain uh, just a number of requirements to the arbitrary functions, um, uh, which are in, in, in necessary to uh, be satisfied on a wormhole throat. Then we are using uh, <coughs> uh, further integration and a very well-known parameterization of the solutions in terms of the uh, so-called eta uh, time coordinate. And in this case, it is possible uh, to, uh, <coughs> to match such a wormhole solution to a Friedman solution, which is also a um, uh, special case of the Tolman, uh, limited Tolman border solution. And uh, such, a, <coughs> such matching takes, uh, well, th these are uh, just uh, pic uh, pictures of how uh, the wormhole throat is evolving from one singularity to another. It has a, uh, has a finite uh, existence time, uh, so lifetime. And then when we um, match uh, the wormhole solution with a Friedman solution, we obtain, we can obtain a number of uh, uh, numerical estimates with, 
uh, for particular solutions. So uh, for the wormhole um, region, we take uh, the, the uh, arbitrary functions which are uh, in, in the uh, upper frame. And uh, for the Friedman model of the universe, uh, we have uh, the functions which are in the uh, lower frame. And then we have um, estimations uh, as follows. So if uh, the wormhole region has, uh, the wormhole throat um, has uh, just a uh, human being um, size, for example, 10 meters, then uh, we will have a huge uh, density of dust. So this is quite, quite impossible uh, to imagine uh, in reality. But when we uh, apply cosmological, uh, not cosmological, astrophysical um, size of the long hole throat, let us say one uh, parsec, then uh, the density will be more or less reasonable. Uh, this is astrophysically. And uh, after all, uh, but uh, the size of the wormhole, uh, of the wormhole region will be much larger than the si uh, many orders of magnitude, larger than the size of the throat. For example, if uh, the throat is of one parsec, then uh, the, the whole region will be in uh, a number of megaparsecs. Then um, this is uh, a proof that such wormholes can be traversable. And despite the fact that the throat leaves uh, uh, quite a little time, for example, uh, <coughs> a throat, a parsec size throat, leaves 20, only 20 years, but nevertheless, um, uh, the <coughs> photons which are in, uh, emitted at proper times can, uh, can reach uh, uh, the, 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 the wormhole um, with the junction surface and uh, any observer uh, for, further. So uh, if there is a cosmological constant, certainly such local things as a wormhole cannot change uh, very strongly, and the same is true if we include a non-zero magnetic field. Uh, but uh, the, the whole picture will change drastically because uh, with the cosmological constant, we obtain cosmological models with acceleration, and there will be also such uh, wormhole solutions. And uh, with a uh, charge, uh, we have the following picture that uh, the uh, <coughs> Uh, lines of force must converge again in the, our uh, spherical universe, and then we must have another wormhole which leads uh, further, and we can have such a picture like a uh, church hell, let us say, that such a uh, sequence of universes. So um, I think I have no time, so I will not pronounce uh, the, uh, this uh, concluding remarks, but uh, what I want to pronounce is uh, that uh, what, what can be done further in this direction. For example, uh, certainly it's of interest to study the possible emergence of wormhole in different stages of the universe because what was said about it was uh, a wormhole which uh, emerges together with the universe. But then uh, then uh, it is necessary to analyze possible wormhole solutions which matter other than dust or in addition to dust. And uh, a very interesting point is to analyze possible observational codes because it is of utmost interest. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir, for the very useful questioning for today. You said that you can have Wormhole. I'll approach you. <laughs> you can have wormholes which exist during finite time. Yes. Yeah, uh, the whole wormhole, the whole wormhole region, the whole wormhole region exists as long as the as the whole universe. But the throat uh, has a very short lifetime. Yes. Yeah. Uh, this means the topology is changing. Yes. Uh, uh, the point is that. Uh, 
each layer of dust in this solution has its own lifetime. And it is changing from very small uh, quantities uh, for a throat to a very large quantity for uh, uh, the junction surface. Uh, so let's thank Mr. This one, yeah. And, and the uh, the <laughs> thank you. Um, first, thank you very much for the organizers uh, for giving me opportunity to give a talk. So I'm uh, going to talk about quantum gravitational corrections in a closed universe. Uh, as you know, the quantum gravitational uh, effects are um, strong at very high energies. So, such energies have been present in the very early universe. Therefore, we hope to find um, quantum gravitational corrections to the um, power spectrum of anisotropies of CMB. Um, so I'll briefly, um, let me give the brief overview of my talk. Uh, so first, I'll uh, motivate uh, my topic, why uh, we consider closed model of the universe. Um, as you know, there are different approaches to quantized gravity. Uh, the approach that I'm going to use is canonical quantum gravity, so I'll briefly uh, give uh, how is it constructed. Uh, it starts with Hamiltonian formulation, and as you know, the um, anisotropies of CMB are expected to be originated from the um, fluctuations of inflation, uh, inflaton. So uh, therefore, I'll start with Hamiltonian formulation of inflationary FLRW universe. Um, then uh, I'll quantize and uh, the quantization will lead to the Villa David equation. Uh, in between, I'll also um, introduce uh, curvature perturbations, uh, which are important to relate the um, power spectrum at the end of inflation to the uh, power spectrum of anisotropies of CMB. Uh, instead of directly trying to solve the Villa David equations, we will apply semi classical appro uh, approximation. Um, Okay. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, so I'll apply some classical approximation. And then um, using that, I'll derive the power spectrum for uncorrected case and uh, quantum gravitational corrected case. And I'll finish with conclusion and outlook. Okay, first, why is it interesting to discuss closed model of the universe? So as you know, uh, usually um, it's mentioned that Planck data uh, favors the flat universe, but um, from Planck data 2018, uh, it doesn't really completely rule out the possibility of a slight curvature of universe. So uh, also there is current discussion about correct interpretation of data and um, indications were found that speak in favor of specially closed universe. Uh, I mentioned uh, this one paper published uh, in Nature in 2020, but there are also other papers on this topic. Uh, particularly in this uh, paper, the authors mentioned that from Planck data, um, the positive curvature explains the anomalous lensing amplitude and it also it removes the tension within Planck data set concerning the values of cosmological parameters derived at different angular scales. Uh, also, it is expected that the closed model might explain the observed low amplitude of quadrupole and octopole modes. As you can notice uh, uh, within the, uh, this diagram uh, that the power spectrum uh, of Planck data, you can see there is lack of power in this region uh, in uh, very large scales. And so, um, yeah, as I mentioned, uh, I'm going to use canonical quantum gravity as an approach to quantize gravity. It starts with Hamiltonian formulation of GR. To do that, we follow it uh, um, four-dimensional space-time into three-dimensional uh, three uh, Hebert surfaces, and the line 11 takes the following form where Hij is the uh, three metric, the induced metric on the hypersurface, Ni is the shift vector, which describes the, temp uh, the, the special evolution, and N is the Leibniz function, which describes the temporal evolution. Uh, this decomposition leads to the following uh, constraints um, uh, after working with uh, uh, Einstein-Hilbert action. Um, the first constraint is known as Hamiltonian constraint, and the second constraint is, is uh, known as diffeomorphism constraint. Now, to rule, uh, the rule to quantize this constraint system is um, based on a Dirac approach, uh, where you have to take the uh, constraint as an operator 
act on the wave functional, which is a functional of the metric, uh, the three metric in this case, and set this equal to zero. So the first constraint leads to the villa david equation, and the second constraint leads to the quantum diffeomorphism constraint. Also, I should point out that villa david equation does not contain any classical time variable uh, because of the reparameterization invariance of the theory. But later I'll show that uh, after applying some classical approximation, we can recover the notion of time. Okay, so as I said, um, this, um, fluctuations, the anisotropies are expected to be uh, originated from um, inflationary fluctuations. Therefore, we uh, the, uh, consider inflationary field in Friedman universe. The metric of the um, FLRW uh, is given by this. Um, because of the special symmetry, there is no uh, shift um, vector entering. So now using this line element uh, in Einstein-Hilbert action and deriving the background Hamiltonian, uh, we obtain the following form, um, uh, where uh, the dynamical parameters are the scale factor and the uh, scalar field, and the corresponding uh, conjugate uh, momentum. The next step is uh, to add perturbations to the metric and inflationary field. This will lead to the following total Hamiltonian. And uh, by Halliwell and Hawking, it has been already shown that this can be decomposed into the background part and perturbation part. And also it comes with first order Hamiltonian constraint uh, as follows. Uh, because we are interested in scalar perturbations, uh, we will take only the scalar part of this um, perturbation Hamiltonian. In general, the result obtained by Halliwell and Hawking is not gauge invariant, the perturbation part. Therefore, one, uh, before moving on, one has to take care of this. Uh, this was done by uh, David Langlois in 1994, where he obtained the gauge invariant form of um, this perturbation, scalar perturbations, um, where Qn is the uh, gauge invariant variable and Pn is the uh, c c conjugate momentum. Um, however, this form is not very uh, convenient to work with. Therefore, uh, we perform a canonical transformation as follows, and we obtain very compact form uh, for the perturbation Hamiltonian. And to make sure that we are in a right, right track, uh, we can take a large wavelength limit and prove that we uh, recover the uh, flat case, where V and tilde, uh, we call in this case generalized Mukhanov Sasaki variable, V and tilde becomes uh, Vn, which is Mukhanov Sasaki variable for the large scales. Okay, um, because V and tilde is some random um, gauge invariant variable, we need to relate our results to the uh, observational data. So we had to introduce another gauge invariant uh, variable, theta PST introduced by this, uh, where phi is the Bardeen poten potential. Um, the importance of this variable is that we can, uh, if we obtain the power spectrum of these curvature perturbations, uh, at the end of inflation, we can relate this power spectrum to the anisotropies of CMB. So, <clears throat> uh, therefore, our next step should be to relate this uh, uh, gauge invariant variable, the, the curvature perturbations, to V and tilde. So, as soon as we obtain the power spectrum of V and tilde, we can recover the power spectrum of theta BST, which is uh, finally going to be used to calculate the angular power spectrum. Okay, as I said, <coughs> the quantization leads to the Villa David equation, and uh, we particularly are interested in slow roll approximation because uh, it is um, in, uh, um, say, uh, it, it's uh, working uh, compared to data. So it's valid. Uh, so uh, for this approximation, uh, the assumption is that kinetic energy is much smaller than the potential energy. So introducing the um, slow roll parameters, epsilon and delta, uh, as follows, uh, we can um, rewrite the villa david equ equation as follows. So as you can see, the first part, the first bracket, is the background Hamiltonian, and the uh, second part is the perturbation Hamiltonian. So, uh, as I said, we have to take this uh, uh, Hamiltonian, the total Hamiltonian as an operator, act on the wave functional, and set it equal to zero. Uh, also, to obtain this equation for each mode, uh, for each psi n, we have uh, used the product ansatz by assuming that, the, that the, these different modes do not interact with each other. Okay, as I said um, in the beginning, we are going to apply semi-classical approximation because we can assume that we have a uh, kind of um, 
heavy part and light part. So the heavy part is the background and light part are the perturbations. To do that, we apply board oppenheimer approximation and uh, we have to start with uh, WKB-like answers as follows. Then <coughs> we can expand this function uh, with respect to the Planck mass as follows. Then we can substitute this into the villa david equation um, and gather corresponding orders of Planck mass and set them equal to zero. And then we get the following equations uh, uh, with corresponding orders. At the order of mp to the four, we get the background conditions, which basically indicate that the background spacetime is independent of perturbations as expected. Um, next, we will obtain hamilton jacobi equation of the background, which is basically equivalent to the Friedman equation. So we obtain the result for the classical GR. Next, uh, we obtain the Schrodinger equation of perturbations which are uh, propagating on this classical background. Uh, initially, we obtain an equation of S1 uh, function, but then um, doing some uh, calculations and simplifications, we can uh, obtain the um, Schrodinger equation. And as I said, the villa david equation does not have any notion of time. So here we can recover the notion of time by uh, introducing it as follows. And finally, at the next order, mp to the minus two, we obtain quantum gravitational corrections to the Schrodinger equation uh, given here. Also, uh, I'd like to draw your attention to the term, this non-unitary term, um, which for this uh, uh, calculations have been ignored, but um, it has been shown but by um, Leonardo Chatenier and Manuel Kramer that it is possible to absorb this term within the definition of inner product, so this should not worry us. Okay, to solve these uh, Schrodinger equations, the corrected and uncorrected ones, we have to apply Gaussian ansatz. So we um, use this uh, ansatz for the uncor uncorrected case, and uh, substituting this into the Schrodinger equation, we obtain the following equation. Next, we also use some corrected wave function, uh, Gaussian ansatz for the corrected Schrodinger equation, and end up with this. So basically now we have to solve these two equations, and uh, finally, we can derive the power spectrum. Okay, for the uncorrected power spectrum, it can be shown by starting uh, with two-point correlation function. You can show that uh, the power spectrum is given by this. So basically, we have to solve this uh, previous Riccati equation that we obtained, take the real part of, uh, of it, and um, substituting it into here, we obtain the following result. Our goal, of course, is to um, obtain the power spectrum of curvature perturbations uh, using the relation that I showed uh, earlier. So we get the, the following uh, power spectrum. And as expected, uh, to compare these two uh, power spectrum uh, for the flat case and for the closed case, we show explicitly that there is significant uh, suppression of power. So uh, indeed, um, uh, this can solve this uh, lack of amplitude, the issue with the lack of amplitude in Planck data. Also, I should point out that this power spectrum for the closed case, because of the explicit scale dependence, the power law approximation doesn't work. So um, the Planck data is analyzed based on this approximation. Therefore, uh, to be able to analyze Planck data properly for the closed case, we have to use this power spectrum instead uh, in the codes and um, um, analyze the data based on this, which is uh, planned to be done with uh, Eleanor Roati Valentino soon. And finally, uh, let me also mention about the corrected power spectrum. So the corrected power spectrum can be given by this. As you see, there is this uh, small correction on top of this uh, uncorrected power spectrum. And already with um, uh, Brizuela uh, and Kramer, uh, Professor Kiefer uh, has shown that this term is very, very small, 10 to the minus 10. So because this um, correction is within the range of co cosmic variance, unfortunately, we do not have hopes to be able to confirm this by the uh, observations. Yeah, to finally uh, conclude, so we started with villa david equation, applied born oppenheimer type of approximation, and then uh, at corresponding uh, orders, we recovered the power spectrum for uncorrected and corrected cases. Next, um, the angular power spectrum can only be calculated by sophisticated numerical methods. By employing a closed model, one might be able to explain the observed lack of power for large scales. 
And finally, due to the smallness of quantum gravitational corrections um, to the power spectrum, we do not expect to confirm them by observations. Thank you very much. No. No, it's not possible because, because the corrections are in this region and because there's this fundamental issue with cosmic variance. So I guess it doesn't matter how good the technology is, we still have this fundamental issue. That's why you can't really prove it. Yeah. But it's still nice to see that there, there can be exact predictions from the quantum gravity. Yeah. Uh, no, I haven't, but uh, I know that there are some also, uh, yeah. Yeah, because if, if it was possible to uh, really confirm this um, observationally, it would be really interesting to compare these two and claim which one is correct, so, yeah. I just forgot about this possibility to upload files. Yeah, and that would be easier to ask everyone. But you will download both actually, there is another thing. I just was talking to you. can download both. You can just give it this, 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 no, like this. Oh, right now I'm... No, not. I have no to go. Yes. Fine. Okay. Can you show me better? Yeah. No, actually I don't want to no, show no. you TV. No, no. I want to give you TV, like power. No, no, no matter. We are uh, showing no, no, no. PDF. Okay. Then I will come with PDF. Yes. 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 Yes.
Thank you, Luke. <laughs> I can go back. <laughs> okay, yeah. Yeah, I know this works a couple of times.
вот есть, да, можно вот эту штуку переключать, не знаю, значит, вот эта вот кнопка глубокая. Так, только ее выключили. О, отлично. А, сейчас их переключать. А в ней вот эту штуку и переключать. Можно еще держать. Сейчас попробуем. Сейчас подожду. charge particle 
Uh, and uh, it was uh, shown uh, that uh, in this case, uh, uh, multiple uh, components uh, of field with large numbers are tends to zero uh, when uh, particle uh, tends to event horizon of uh, sparse black hole. Uh, what is related to the result of uh, moving particle? Uh, Uh, in this case, uh, the problem uh, was uh, solved uh, for, for the case of uh, in, in, in full general relativity only for the case uh, when a, a particle moving uh, on geodesic. Uh, the also interesting uh, result was obtained for for the case where uh, arithmetic radiation reaction uh, is taken in, into account. Uh, for example, this was done in the following papers, uh, but uh, in these uh, uh, papers uh, was uh, used a non-full uh, general relativistic uh, approach and uh, uh, simplified equations. Uh, but uh, L uh, system of equations was obtained in the monography by Eric Poisson, uh, 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 but uh, there are no uh, uh, numerical uh, results uh, corresponding to these uh, equations. Uh, but uh, there are open questions uh, on, on uh, this problem. Uh, for example, in the paper uh, by Shatsky, Novikov, Lipatova, was mentioned uh, that uh, if uh, uh, black hole uh, has a mass uh, 10 power 11 uh, kg, uh, then in this case, uh, the energy radiated by particle uh, more than uh, mc square. Uh, that is a non-physical uh, result. Uh, Uh, the also uh, interesting uh, result uh, that uh, uh, it uh, was mentioned uh, that uh, the electromagnetic field of failing not fixed uh, particle coincide uh, with uh, electromagnetic field of fixed particle. Uh, when uh, this particle uh, tends to event horizon of the black hole. Uh, this was mentioned, for example, in the uh, in book uh, by uh, Torn Price and McDonald. Uh, and uh, our, uh, uh, in, in this picture is presented a result for fixed particle, and uh, is this uh, shown uh, that uh, when we uh, tend particle to event uh, horizon, uh, we observe uh, simply spherical symmetric uh, distribution of electromagnetic field. Uh, this uh, consists of only a radial component of a electrostatic uh, field. And the uh, main purpose of our uh, uh, work is to general, generalize uh, this uh, result, uh, result on the case uh, when uh, particle uh, moving in the vicinity of black hole, it's uh, not fixed because it is well understood uh, that uh, fist particle on the, in the vicinity of black hole is a non-physical uh, problem uh, because of uh, particle can be fixed only in the presence of external force uh, that is uh, influence uh, on the uh, space-time according to uh, Einstein's equation. Uh, we will start uh, with uh, Maxwell equations. Uh, uh, we can write down uh, right hand side uh, uh, in the following form four point particle moving along a, a certain uh, time like uh, curve. And the solution of uh, whole system of Maxwell equations uh, can be found in the following form. 
uh, this uh, ansatz was uh, presented, for example, in the paper by Hani and Rufini. Um, we uh, use uh, Schwarzschild uh, in the, uh, our case, uh, Tartos coordinate. Uh, the following uh, uh, abbreviations can be introduced for uh, simplifications of the equation, and uh, we obtain uh, the following equation. This is well known Ridge Wheeler equation. Uh, and uh, this is well known uh, that the boundary condition for arithmetic field uh, must be chosen in the following way. Uh, such that on sp special vicinity uh, they uh, have uh, uh, a shape of uh, ongoing uh, electromagnetic wave uh, and uh, uh, near the horizon uh, uh, ingoing uh, wave. Uh, this is a uh, uh, Fourier transform of uh, our components is presented. Uh, and uh, also this is uh, well known that uh, uh, the equation uh, Ridge Wheeler uh, in uh, uh, homogeneous uh, case uh, is mathematically an, uh, coincide with uh, Schrodinger equation in quantum mechanics uh, with the, cell, uh, the following uh, potential energy. Uh, and uh, we can write down a general solution for this uh, equation uh, using Green's function method. Uh, uh, this uh, solution in integral form uh, can be uh, simplified uh, for the following form. Uh, and we have uh, for two cases, uh, for the case uh, when uh, multiple moment is zero and uh, for the case when uh, multiple moment uh, larger than uh, zero. And uh, the, the main uh, difficulty in this uh, 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 expression is to calculate this integral. Uh, this is uh, consists of uh, potential function and a solution of uh, homogeneous uh, Ridge Wheeler equation. Uh, uh, firstly, we consider uh, case uh, monopole uh, where uh, multiple moment is uh, zero. Uh, in this uh, case, uh, uh, mentioned binary con condition conditions cannot be, uh, cannot be used uh, because of uh, uh, monopole uh, uh, component uh, does not consist uh, of wave solution and repre represent uh, only static uh, field. Uh, but in this case, uh, we uh, can apply uh, Stokes theorem uh, to the Maxwell equation uh, and uh, we can obtain a very fastly solution for uh, component uh, B, uh, mon monopole component. Uh, and uh, this has uh, the form uh, of well-known uh, from uh, uh, electrostatic uh, uh, form. Uh, this is uh, Q uh, when uh, charge is inside the surface, and uh, this is zero when uh, charge is outside the surface. Uh, we can show that uh, this result coincide uh, with our previous uh, formulas uh, because of if we, if we chose solution in the following form, uh, we add to the previous solution, uh, general solution of homogeneous Ridge Wheeler equation uh, with following constant f. If we chose this constant in the uh, special uh, form, uh, we obtain the following uh, solution and we, we can uh, see that uh, this is, uh, in fact, uh, the previous uh, expression. Uh, for the case uh, when multiple moment uh, ledger uh, than one, uh, uh, we use the following approximation of uh, Ridge Wheeler potential buyer. Uh, we uh, represent it uh, by delta, Dirac delta function. Uh, and from uh, quantum mechanics, uh, it is well, exists well-known solution for this case. Uh, we chose two solutions of uh, homogeneous equations in such a way uh, that uh, boundary conditions are satisfied. Uh, this is a picture, for example, 
uh, for uh, uh, first solution of homogeneous equation. Uh, and uh, in order, uh, and uh, in this case, we can simply com calculate our integral because of uh, uh, potential barrier represent, uh, represented by the Dirac delta function. Uh, and uh, we can calculate inverse Fourier transform from the obtained expression. Uh, this uh, uh, integral can be calculated using uh, Cauchy residue uh, theorem. Uh, and uh, result will uh, depend on the sign of the factor in the exponent. Uh, we can this uh, calculate and we obtain the following formula. If we uh, add to this integral uh, previous terms that uh, contain a general solution for a Wheeler equation, uh, we obtain, uh, uh, in finish, we obtain the following of formula. And uh, it is, uh, can be shown from this formula uh, that for large time, uh, our solution uh, tends to zero. Uh, th this uh, means uh, that uh, large times uh, t uh, correspond uh, to the case where our particle uh, tends to event horizon. Uh, and uh, because of this, we can say uh, that uh, when particle tends to event horizon of uh, spatial black hole, uh, we can observe uh, spherically symmetric uh, distribution of uh, field that is uh, described only by uh, the component uh, of uh, B. Uh, uh, also, this result can be obtained in slightly more, more, more general uh, case when we uh, uh, simplificate our potential uh, not only by Dirac delta function, but uh, uh, also by uh, rectangular potential, this case is, is considered in a preprint of our uh, article. Uh, uh, from, apart from this, I uh, can mention that uh, this uh, re result uh, in general does not uh, depend on the uh, concrete view of the function t. Uh, this function is uh, determined uh, law of motion of the particle, uh, we consider uh, only uh, radial motion of the particle uh, to the uh, black hole. And due to this, uh, we can say uh, that this uh, result can be valid uh, also in the case where uh, radiation reaction of electromagnetic radiation also included. Uh, thank you for your attention. What happens to the particles under the horizon? Uh, uh, outer or inside? Inside. Ah, inside. Uh, 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 I, can, I probably cannot say about uh, this, uh, this interesting question. Uh, 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 this interesting question, I, I think uh, this also cannot be considered in, in literature, but uh, if using this approach, it is in, uh, possible in principle to calculate, for example, energy. This is uh, fall uh, into event horizon, and we uh, uh, can calculate, for example, uh, uh, not uh, field, but uh, uh, energy of, of electromagnetic radiation that uh, uh, goes into the event horizon. Yes, yes. Uh, this uh, well-known boundary condition is described, for example, in book uh, Tor MacDonald. Uh, this uh, simply, uh, uh, this uh, general case of 
boundary solution uh, if we have uh, set an electromagnetic radiation and if we have, for example, black hole. Uh, in the case, in the Minkowski case, it is well known that we have only boundary condition on a special infinity, this is an ongoing wave, but in the case uh, where we have uh, black hole ELSA, uh, we can have uh, two boundary condition on the uh, special infinity and uh, near the event horizon. This corresponds to uh, in going waves uh, to event horizon. Uh, maybe I I do not uh, speak about this terminology. Maybe, but, but mathematically, this is simply in going waves. And, uh, 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 I, I think so. Uh, yes, yes. So that's Hello everyone, uh, my name is Shukru uh, Faridi and I'm a postdoc at Zarm Institute in Germany, Bremen University. Uh, this talk is about physics of uh, quadrupolar compact astrophysical objects. I divided my talk in two different parts. First, I will speak about the space-time uh, constructive, constructive of almost a new solution, generalization of the Q metric. It's better now? Okay, thank you. Uh, the first part is speak about the space-time and construction of the new generalization of the Q-metric that Audrey Turova yesterday spoke a little bit about this. And the next uh, part, I will go to the astrophysics aspects of this uh, solution as much as possible in this time. Q-metric, uh, as uh, you said also yesterday, or probably you know it before, uh, is a... Um, Simplest generalization of Schwarzschild with quadrupole. And this describes the exterior of the deformed compact object. This deformation can cause by a quadrupole, and this is alpha parameter here. Mathematically, it could be between minus one to infinity. And the sign of this parameter gives us the oplate shape or parallel shape of the compact object. This metric is aesthetic and axisymmetric and asymptotically flat. As uh, always is natural to a study, to a start with a study of isolated objects, which means that asymptotically flat, is also uh, very interesting to ask a question that what happens if I don't, have a, I, I don't have an isolated object? In other words, what if I relax the assumption of asymptotically flatness and still I want to solve the vacuum Einstein field equation? I don't want to consider anything you knew in the right hand side. This metric here is the answer of this question. The red uh, metric functions that you see here encoded the uh, presence of external matter that uh, you just assume that I have a deformed compact object in the center and I can consider some external distribution of matter around it in its vicinity. Uh, then it gives me the uh, property of I don't have asymptotically flat space time. This metric is still is aesthetic, axisymmetric, but is a local solution because it's not isolated. Of course, if alpha is zero and this psi hat and gamma hat are zero, I have Schwarzschild. If alpha is not zero and psi hat and gamma hat are zero, I recover the Q metric itself. You see the solution of this psi hat and gamma hat, this two metric function uh, up to quadrupole here. There is uh, also some uh, if alpha is zero, there is also another version of this. If alpha is zero, but gamma hat and psi hat are not zero, it describes the distorted Schwarzschild. And now we describe here distorted Q metric. I mean, I have a deformed compact object, and around I have some external matter. And this metric is valid between this compact object and the external matter. 
in the vacuum part. There is no time that much that I go to the how I derive this solution, but um, without with um, just uh, ignore the ignore the technical mathematical technical details here. The key point to construct this solution is the assumption of aesthetic. Because if I have aesthetic space time, I can have the three dimensional sub manifolds orthogonal to the aesthetic Killin vector that uh, Einstein equation in this uh, flat space, I mean, this metric in the flat space induce a uh, normal metric. I have a, I have a normal metric in the flat space in this three D manifold. And the Einstein equation reduced to the Laplace equation on this sub manifold. And uh, I can solve this equation for psi hat and gamma hat. When I have psi hat, the explicit form of psi hat, I can solve the gamma hat. As a first step to have this solution, I like to, to write this equation, uh, this metric, in the prolate spheroidal coordinate. Why? Because the field equation that at the end I need to solve looks uh, easier because it looks symmetric. And this is, uh, you see here, the transformation that relate this coordinate to the normal Schwarzschild coordinate here. These are the field equations that I need to solve to derive this psi hat and gamma hat for all multiple expansion. And the first one is some kind of a Laplace equation that psi is satisfied. I need to solve it for a very general solution of the harmonic, harmonic function that is a solution of the Laplace equation. And in short, this is uh, possible to write down uh, psi hat as you see it here. I can use the separation of variable in differential equation very easily. And the uh, psi x part of the solution satisfy the Lojan polynomial, y part also satisfy Lojan polynomial. But for y part, I have a first kind and second kind of Lojan polynomial that by asking as in not having asymptotically flatness, the coefficient for the second one should be zero. And you derive the psi. When you have the psi, you solve these two uh, last equations and derive gamma. This is the final solution for psi and gamma. I mean, this is the second term is psi hat, and second term here is gamma hat. But I add the psi for the Q metric in a way that when I put the external matter zero, I recover the Q metric. Why I can do this? Because the superposition of the Laplace equation, superposition solution of the Laplace equation is a still solution of the Laplace equation. Then if I have a two harmonic function, the uh, superposition of these two, again, is a harmonic function. That's why I can do this. I add the pro appropriate function to psi to recover the one that I want. And I solve for this general psi, the gamma. Uh, you can solve it almost uh, in a standard way, but it took time to write it in a very nice and short way that you see it here. But up to now, about just a little bit the comment on the physical interpretation of this solution. We have mathematically a solution that is not asymptotically flat. But what is the physical interpretation of this? Psi is a harmonic function. It means that if, uh, and we have a smooth, we wanted it to be uh, in the vicinity of the object, be a smooth. If I have a, a smooth harmonic function and it's not a constant, then it will up infinity. If it's a constant, I can set it to zero with coordinate transformation with the Liouville theorem, it's very straightforward. Then I don't have asymptotically flat space time. But this is a possibility that I extend it to asymptotically flat space. How? Instead of I define psi in general as a harmonic function, I define psi a harmonic function in the vicinity of the object, of the object that I want, and in some neighboring group. And after that, I ask that the psi hat and gamma hat tends to zero, to infinity, when I make a limit to infinity. It means that after this region, out of, out of this region, this psi hat and gamma hat is not the solution of the vacuum Einstein equation anymore because it's not uh, harmonic, it's not the solution of the Laplace equation. It means there is some matter present in this region. And this matter can interpret it as causing this, this, this formation. This is the physical picture of this solution. There are a lot of results that we discovered in this uh, in space time, uh, motion of the circular, uh, circular orbit of the particle in equatorial uh, plane and dynamical stable analysis and all the things related to the circular orbit in this uh, space time. But the most important point that I wanted to emphasize here is the place of ISCO, innermost stable circular orbit that for 
as you see it here, the blue line is related to Schwarzschild, E score for Schwarzschild, and the green one is related to the E score for the negative quadrupole moment, and the positive for uh, the, mm, the red one for positive quadrupole moment. It means that the place of E score is goes further away for positive quadrupole moment for oblate object and come closer to the central object for negative quadrupole moment. This is important, why? Because, for example, in accretion disk, there is some good reason that consider the, the inner edge of the accretion disk as ISCO. Then it has a good influence there, we'll see it a little bit later. Now let's go to the astrophysic part. In astrophysic part, I wanted to speak about two aspects that we discovered with Odis Rova. The first one, I don't want to go to the detail, probably you had it there yesterday from the O3. This is about the QPO and difference model. This is just uh, the pattern of the spectral density in the X-ray emission that we have, a, especially for black hole, we always have the ratio of 3 over 2 for these two peaks. And the most important point of this is they scale with the inverse of mass. And there are good reason to believe that they are produced from the inner part of the disk. That's why people believe that the QPO encoded the information from the space time and central object itself. That is important. What we did here, the difference between this work and the work that presented by Audrey, it is uh, here we, instead of the particle, particle approach, we consider the disk approach. It means that we, we studied the uh, tri thick disk, thick aggression disk. Thick aggression disk is a kind of aggression disk that is in equilibrium. This is not really accreting matter, like a thin disk. This is a tori that uh, we can consider the oscillation of this tori to consider this QPO. And there is another approach that people consider the oscillation of tori and do the other things to this that are related to QPO. But what we did here, we started to modify the model of QPO that already we have for particle. And we just modify it and replace it by the oscillation of the disk in tori instead of oscillation of the particle. First, we considered the, some uh, thick disk tori. We constructed them because we wanted the equation to, for this to perturb and have this uh, frequency from the oscillation. What I plot here is just a patch of this tori, and you just imagine yourself to rotate it around the z-axis, and you have the full tori here. Uh, just one comment here. As we expected, uh, the place of the disk is further away for a positive quadrupole moment rather than for negative one as we expected from the place of this school. Now here, you, it's just a little bit calculation of the dispersion relationship. Just we uh, uh, apply the normal standard procedure of the perturbation in the equation of the tori, and we end up with the radial epicyclic frequency because we wanted to just study the axisymmetric mode of the tori. And this is the uh, result. The first result that uh, we have a, a improvement rather than particle approach the first one is related to the mass and um, estimation of the mass that you saw it yesterday in the particle approach. We have a better estimation now with the disk approach. And also in the second column, you see that, uh, second row, you see that different sources, that um, the green line related to the test particle approach, red line related to the oscillation of the uh, disk, and a different line of studies a different space time. In general, I can emphasize that the oblate shape, if we consider the oblate shape, and also consider the oscillation of tori, we have a much better fit with the data rather than the just Schwarzschild curves or, or other cases, or particle approach. Just one comment on the shadow also on this space time that we discussed. Here, uh, if you were in the talk, in the nice talk with uh, Dr. Perlick uh, in the morning, uh, this, uh, it's um, the same situation almost for the shadow, but there's a differences in his talk there is a source and also there is an observer, and between them there is plasma. Here, in this work, we have a source and we have a regression disk around, and the observer is far away. It depends on the, which model of regression disk you employ, you will have a different pattern in the optical appearance, appearance of the shadow. Uh, as you see in the picture, the very left side is a prolate shape, and the very right side is an oblate shape, with effect of external matter in all of them. The effect of external matter, again, it depends on the positive or negative quadrupole moment, can affect the size of the shadow. But in general, for a prolate object, oblate object and prolate external matter, we have a smaller size. For oblate, in both cases, we have a bigger size. But very interesting things also happen. If I consider the external matter for some choices of the parameter, 
I can have the multiple rings in fundamental, that is the fundamental differences between this space time and all others. And we can expect it somehow because we have some source in here and we have some external source here and I study the bending of the light. And that's why intuitively we can expect that something really fundamentally different. But uh, just for some range of the parameter, I can have some multi-rings also in this space time if I consider the external distribution of matter. And the disk, uh, region disk that we consider here is uh, optically thin and optically thick. Uh, sorry, optically thin and geometrically thin also. Geometrically thin to doesn't have that much effect on the space time and to the bending of the light. And optically thin because I wanted the disk be transparent to the, uh, its radiation itself. If you want, I can explain more about these pictures later. In summary, after the derivation of the new solution of the Einstein equation and I studied the thick disk in this space time, I presented a QPO modification and also the shadow. The conclusion that I can say is that um, a very small change in the quadrupole uh, can lead to the significant change in different quantities in astrophysical uh, observation. And um, there are always, if we don't check first the assumption of a space time is a care or not, and just by looking at the observational data, there is always a care of a space time with a given value of a spin parameter that can be mimicked by a particular quadrupole parameter. And uh, especially very close to the compact object, the low oblateness of the object can produce almost the same result as a higher spin with care. Thank you. Uh, there is two quadrupole moments in this metric, one related to the external source that is alpha and one related to external source that is beta. Uh, you see it in the psi head and gamma head at the, at the bottom, this is in green. Beta is also quadrupole moment that encoded the information from external matter. Uh, this is exact yes, no, it's the exact solution of the Einstein equation. I solved the, this uh, Einstein equation in this, uh, under this assumption, this reduced to this three equation. And this is the sol exact solution that construct all, ex all multiple expansion of this solution. Okay. Uh, the gamma here. Here, yep. Right? Yes, uh, we have a singularity in this space time. Originally, the, the first term, the first term of gamma and psi here, you just, uh, if you just uh, ignore the second term. The first term of psi and gamma here uh, is chosen in a way that when I plug it here in the original metric of the Q metric, if in this new generalization of Q metric, it gives me the Q metric itself. It means that if I put uh, the second term, zero, in psi and gamma that you see it here, I recover Q metric. Oh, okay, no, because in this case, uh, the original metric itself the horizon of the original metric itself, the Q metric, is a singular. And always there is a, there is a work with the Professor Quevedo that uh, we can construct the interior solution for this one that cover this singularity. And all other singularity, even in the stationary case that we have a rotation, if you consider all happen inside of this 2M. Okay, next question. Uh, you are in space time? Uh, on the equator plane. Yes, on the, on the equator plane, circular geodesic. We just discussed this one. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so let's uh, thank our speaker again. Yes. <laughs> and we continue with Virginia uh, Design. Then exploring massive neutron stars for Samaria. Constraining the high energy, no, the high energy. Uh, yeah. Okay. 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 Okay.
Okay, uh, hello everyone, good, uh, good afternoon. So my name is Zinia, I am a PhD student from India and today I want to share with you some of our results relating to massive neutron stars, specifically those that could serve as mass gap candidates. So um, to start with, there is no uh, Chandrasekhar type fixed maximum mass for a neutron star because so much of what happens to nuclear matter at high densities is still unknown. So this means that there is no theoretical reason for us to rule out neutron stars of masses to solar mass or even higher, 2.5 and so on. Uh, observations support us in this regard. As you can see that there are these recent pulsar observations which give us all masses above two solar mass. Additionally, gravitational wave observations are bringing us closer to the observational mass gap that exists between 2.5 and 5 solar masses. For example, in GW19814, there was a 2.6 solar mass object that was observed and this could very well turn out to be a massive neutron star. Other massive compact objects like Super Chandrasekhar White Dwarf have been analyzed in uh, similar ways in recent years and that sets a general sort of precedent for this kind of study. So we want a massive neutron star, how do we achieve that? So how does a neutron star enhance its mass? There is a few different ways. Classically, through the neutron star's magnetic field rotation and any sort of anisotropy present, it can lead to an increase in its existing mass. Apart from that, the neutron star can be massive microscopically through equation of state itself. But we find that for the mass, of mass ranges that we are looking at, due to the competing effect that exists of hyperon softening, this might not be enough on its own. So hyperon softening is the phenomenon that occurs when uh, exotic particles like hyperons and deltas are present in the neutron star core and that leads to an overall decrease in the pressure in the core. Uh, we expect that energetically um, these particles are present, so that's why we need to also take care of this effect by introducing some other new physics. So as I mentioned, we are uh, targeting the theoretical study of massive neutron stars. For this, we have chosen a subset of some equations of state called relativistic mean field models and specifically added magnetic field and anisotropy to the system to see how this can help us in our goal. Here the anisotropy can be a result of not only the magnetic field itself but also due to the uh, matter effect that the matter composition in the star could be such that the pressure is different in different directions. So this is a continuation of previous work which was done in this line by Dev Mukhopadhyay Weber who did similar analysis for neutron stars with non-relativistic equations of state and for white dwarfs. So uh, to construct our massive neutron star, we have to solve the TOV equations. The TOV equations are general relativistic hydrostatic balance and here they get modified because we are adding magnetic field and anisotropy. Magnetic field here is B and the anisotropy is represented by delta. You can see that when B and delta are set to zero, we recover back the standard TOV equation. And here you can further see that depending on how the field is oriented, whether it's radial or transverse, uh, the pressure gradient equation has a uh, different form. To close this system of equations, we introduce a model for delta, which was first introduced by Boas Liang and modified by Dave Mukhopadhyay Weber in their work, where the delta, para, uh, delta factor takes this sort of form. Again, it takes different form depending on radial orientation and transverse orientation of the magnetic field. Here kappa is a model parameter that uh, controls how much anisotropy is in the system. Again, this anisotropy is a combination of both matter and field effects. And by analysis by both Boas Liang and Silva, they have found that kappa is constrained within this range of minus two thirds to two thirds. To make the system of equation completely solvable, we need two additional inputs, that is the equation of state and the magnetic field profile. So as I said, the high density nuclear equation of state is not well known and because of this there are many models that are proposed. 
for the uh, equation of state. We have focused on this subset of relativistic mean field models, which are phenomenological equations of state. And from these models, we have picked out a couple of equations of state, which we felt best satisfy both the constraints on the equation of state, which is that they reproduce the properties of nuclear matter within their experimental bounds, as well as uh, help us with explaining the observations we are targeting, which is in the mass gap range. So I have plotted the equations of state here. Equation of state is pressure as a function of density. And you can see that these dotted lines are actually the nucleon only equation of state. And the uh, solid lines have hyperon and delta admixed into them. So this is the phenomenon of hyperon softening, which I was mentioning earlier. Uh, because of the presence of these exotic particles, the uh, equation of state softens. Also, in all our subsequent analysis, we have only used the solid lines because, as I said, as per our current information, current uh, yeah, current information of neutron stars, we do expect that these particles are part of neutron star cores. So we need one last uh, piece for our massive neutron star, and this is uh, tidal deformability, which is a relatively new constraint that has come about. So. Um, in the presence of an external field, such as that of a companion star, a uh, star gets tidally deformed and it develops a quadrupole moment. This is, qua this is characterized by this quantity called lambda, which is called the tidal deformability. Further, you can link tidal deformability with the love number, which is a constant that comes up in the gravitational multipole expansion at the L is equal to 2 level. So in that case, you get this expression. Further, if you want to make tidal, if you make tidal deformability uh, in a dimensionless form, then you see that it is related not only to the love number, but also to the compactness of the star. So since tidal deformability leaves an imprint on the gravitational waveform of the, um, of the star, what we see is that there have been recent limits that have been placed on this parameter. Uh, from observation of, say, GW17817. So these are two of the limits that we saw repeated in the literature. The difference between the limits and the limits themselves are largely model dependent, but we have anyway applied those limits to our um, analysis to ensure a consistency check. Okay, so now we have all the ingredients that we need to create our massive neutron star, and now we can look at some of the results that we obtained through the scheme. Uh, so first of all, we are looking at non-magnetized and non-isotropic uh, uh, non -isotropic, isotropic stars, where we are not including any magnetic field or anisotropy. So this is a pure equation of state effect that we are looking at. You can see that for the five equation of states that we have picked out, all the masses are um, above two solar mass, but not quite at 2.2, uh, not quite in the mass gap, sorry mass gap range, it's only up to around 2.2 solar masses. So that's what motivates us to further add magnetic field or anisotropy to really reach those mass gap kind of values. Uh, also, you can see that all the equations of state that we have chosen uh, come under at least one of the observational bounds of tidal deformability that I had explained earlier. We now add magnetic field and anisotropy to the system. So anisotropy is added in terms of the kappa parameter, which is set to 0.5. Again, this anisotropy is not purely due to the magnetic field. It could also be due to the matter composition itself, that it is distributed in such a way that there is some anisotropy inherent to the system. Uh, to the system of, uh, to this anisotropic star, we have added magnetic field of different orientation and strength. You can see that even in the zero field case, due to the presence of the anisotropy, the mass gets enhanced to 2.54. To this anisotropic star, if we further add a transversely oriented field, with increasing field um, strength, we actually get an enhancement in mass, all the way up to 2.76 solar masses for this high field case. Apart from this, if we add a radially oriented field, with, we see the opposite, where in um, uh, increasing field actually leads to a reduction in the mass, which is expected because radial fields tend to decrease the pressure along the radial direction. Uh, so, sorry, I didn't mention. This is the field profile that we've used throughout this work. It's from Bandopadhyay. Also, we have chosen the parameters in such a way that this is the field within a sample star, and it is fairly broad, as, if you can see. So uh, these are the results for a particular equation of state out of the five that I showed you, but similar analysis was done for all the other five. So now if we look at particularly for this case, the tidal deformability results, this is what we get. 
and immediately you can ski, see that this sky blue sort of um, line which corresponds to the extremely high field case 1.2 times 10 power 18 which gave us a very high mass is ruled out because of it satisfies neither of the bounds on tidal deformability but the rest seem to still be in play. And uh, this is the general trend that we saw for all the equations of state. So here I have just compiled all the equations of state that we had used in this work. The, the results which I showed you were for this particular equation of state, but you can see that the general trend follows. Uh, there is an enhancement of mass as you go introduce a toroidal field or a transversely oriented field. And there is a reduction of mass as you introduce a radially oriented field. And even if we are forced to, you know, uh, eliminate this row because of tidal deformability constraints, there are still enough mass gap or mass gap adjacent candidates that are present that we can consider for further analysis. So this is a, just a quick snapshot of the other four mass radius curves corresponding to the other four equations of state. So um, we saw that in the previous case because um, of tidal deformability constraints, it seemed that very strong field and st high mass stars were ruled out. But uh, that was the result for a particular profile, specifically this blue profile, which is a broad profile. There is no reason to uh, favor this profile over any other profile uh, because, um, yeah, there is no reason to favor this profile over any other profile because no one knows what goes on inside a neutron star. So we wanted to see if we can still save high fields and strong masses by change of profile and that is what we did. So just to recap, the blue profile is what we saw till now. It is a broader profile. It gave us very high masses in close to 1.32 times 10 power 18. Before I had used 1.2, I'm just using 1.32 for easier comparison. But yeah, we got very high mass and uh, it seemed to be ruled out by tidal deformability. Additionally, we have also calculated the stability in the form of the Me by G factor, which is the magnetic energy to gravitational energy ratio. And you can see that for the blue profile, it is quite high, which gives us another reason to sort of get rid of this strong field. But when we change the profile to this red profile, which is a shallow profile, and then compute the corresponding quantities, you can see again the same trend is followed where we have the zero field result and addition of mass due to um, increasing transverse field. At the same time, it seems that the mat uh, field effect only comes into play around 0.5 times 10 power 18 or so, which is when the field actually starts significantly adding mass to the star. So for the same field in the red and blue profile, 1.32 times 10 power 18, the central field, we see that the mass reduces uh, mass supported by the star, maximum mass supported by star reduces from 2.8 to 2.6. But at the same time, the Me by G factor is also reduced. And in fact, for the same strong field, due to a change of profile, we get a much more reasonable value for the stability factor. So let us see if this profile change also helps us to save tidal deformability. So if we calculate now the tidal deformability for the red profile, this is the results. So you can see again, this is, these are the results for these red profile that is more shallow. You can see that all of the equations of state, including the one that gave us a 2.6 solar mass star, support even the higher bound on the tidal deformability, which is that capital lambda at 1.4 solar mass should be less than 580. So that shows us that our results are profile dependent, both on grounds of tidal deformability and stability. And it could be that we can still support strong fields under all constraints with the appropriate profile. So yeah, more work is to be done along this line. But for now, um, yeah, we I will just summarize quickly. We have explored the theoretical possibility of massive neutron stars, specifically targeting mass gap candidates. We found that pure equation of state effects were not enough for mass gap. So that's why we had to introduce additional effects. And these additional effects were magnetic field and anisotropy. Here the anisotropy um, was of course due to the magnetic field itself, but it could also uh, contain information of the matter composition of the star and this could lead to the star having different pressure in different directions. Other than this, we saw that simply adding a field does not help us to enhance the mass. The geometry is also important, whereas adding a radially oriented field decreases the mass, adding a transversely oriented field increases the mass. 
Uh, we applied tidal deformability as a consistency, consistency check and we saw that under the current uh, observational limits, some very strong field and high mass stars seem to be ruled out. But with appropriate choice of profile, it can be that they can still be uh, candidates for uh, further analysis. So even with all these above constraints and caveats, we found that 2.5 solar mass neutron stars are still very much possible even across profiles and such. So uh, thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Yes, I know. <laughs> I should correct. I will say. Yeah, I, I should have mentioned. Uh, Uh, so that is kind of a model which is constructed from certain physical uh, reasons that you're imposing, like the anisotropy should, for instance, vanish at the center. So there are a few conditions like that. And based on that, this model was established long ago based on uh, anisotropic spheres in general relativity. We modified it to further include magnetic field, which adds its own anisotropy. The kappa interval uh, comes from, again, ensuring that everything is nice and physical in the sense that the pressure is still a monotonically decreasing function and the mass and radius are positive, all those kinds of things. So I think that's where it comes from. Yes, all right. Thank you very much. Uh-huh. 
Well, okay. Uh, so good afternoon. Uh, uh, right. Yes. Uh, so good afternoon. Uh, I would like to present uh, some work of a uh, uh, general radially moving reference frames in spherically symmetric background. I should add, so we, we never uh, consider it rotating space time. Now this is uh, it's in our future plans, but uh, currently it is uh, spherically symmetric space times. Uh, so this work is uh, have been done with, in collaboration with Alex Zaslavsky, who is also participating in our conference, and uh, we have uh, his own presentation tomorrow. Uh, so uh, uh, as we know, this is a static coordinate for spherically symmetric metric. This coordinate are divergent and near horizon, and in order to uh, consider free fall uh, into black hole, for example, uh, uh, it, it is better to use coordinate system uh, which are uh, regular at horizon. Uh, the, this uh, classic uh, such kind of uh, metric is the Lemaitre metric, uh, well known. Uh, we uh, consider some generalization of Lemaitre metric. First of all, we do not uh, fix uh, the function f, so all of our presentation uh, is valid for any f, so in principle we need not be restricted by Einstein relativity. Uh, all these results will be valid in uh, uh, any metric theory. So we require only that uh, this uh, theory should be metric. Uh, so the particle moves along geodesics and we need not fix uh, a priori some function of, uh, of phi. Of course, for uh, uh, GR, it is well known that it is more one minus gravitational radius over R. Uh, so that uh, if this parameter is equal to one, this transformation transforms this metric to the matter metric. But we keep this parameter uh, in order to uh, cover a matrix which is associated with a free fall of particle which have not necessarily zero velocity at infinity. So the metric, the matter metric is uh, presented by particles which have uh, usual three velocity equal to zero at infinity, but in, in principle we have other possibilities, and so that this, this parameter characterizes this initial, in initial energy if it is bigger than unity, and if it is less than unity, it indicates that particles start their fall not from infinity, but from some finite, finite distance. Uh, so that when we do this uh, transformation, when P is by definition this, we get uh, the metric if we transform only radial coordinate uh, or only time coordinate and still use radial coordinate, then we, we have metric in this form, which is known as gilstrand penderwe metric. So this is generalization of gilstrand penderwe metric uh, for any uh, E naught. Uh, sometimes this P is, is written as V because it is this factor here is not only some coordinate factor, but it is real physical velocity uh, uh, over a particle uh, having energy E with respect to stational frame. So this, uh, this term has, has a physical meaning. That's why some, sometimes people use V here. However, it's necessary to, to be in mind that uh, under the horizon, there is no stational frame, and, and this, uh, this factor is bigger than one. Uh, so that we cannot interpret this as a local velocity. We can interpret this as a local velocity only uh, uh, outside of the horizon. Uh, so that th this is the general form of uh, gilstrand pendleve like metric for, uh, uh, for a frame uh, which, which, is not, uh, which has not uh, zero velocity at infinity. Uh, what happens when uh, E0 goes to, 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 to this E uh, goes to zero? Uh, there is no, uh, there is no uh, uh, regular limit because in, in this case these two two uh, coordinates start uh, to be collinear, and that's why I cannot uh, define good frame. Uh, and so that uh, this, is, uh, this is impossible to do this transformation in this form. However, if we, if we uh, transform not only time, but, on, uh, but also uh, space-time coordinate, space-like coordinate to, to rho, as it's done in the matter metric, this unfortunately I erased, I, I seems to erase the explicit view of, of the matter metric when I erased Many many slides to be in time, this to, to be in time, uh, but I think everybody knows the Lemaitre metric. They have uh, spatial coordinate rho, and in this case we can go to the limit 
uh, of zero E naught. After this uh, reparameterization, we get uh, the metric which appears to be uh, 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 homogeneous. The dependence on, on rho disappears here. And so that it is well, well known, uh, this no, maybe Novikov metric or kantovsky sachs metric. kantovsky sachs is cosmological metric, but it appears that inside black hole we can consider metric as kantovsky sachs there, there, is, there is a possibility to, to uh, uh, write this metric in this form. So it is, it is really interesting that Lemaitre, Lemaitre metric, which is of course not homogeneous, and kantovsky sachs metric uh, inside of black hole, despite their uh, absolutely different appearance, they belong to one parameter uh, uh, family of metrics. So it, it is, there is some continuous transformation from uh, Lemaitre metric to kantovsky sachs metric, just turning uh, this parameter E from unity to, to zero. Uh, okay, uh, so there is no limit for uh, the Stratton-Levy metric for uh, E uh, going to zero. However, we can rewrite this metric into new form, which allows us to use this uh, limit. And uh, the hint how to do this is just uh, understanding then under the horizon, uh, both these coordinates are time-like, so it is not so good to use a metric with two time-like coordinates. So instead of R, it's better to use Schwarzschild T as a second coordinate. And in this case, if we, if we rewrite this metric uh, using uh, this uh, 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 Lemaitre metric, Lemaitre uh, time, and, and Schwarzschild time instead of Schwarzschild R, we get this form of the strand metric, which we, we can call a dual the strand pendeleve metric. We have not seen it in the literature, at, at least I haven't remarked it. Uh, so in this case, it's possible to go uh, to the limit E uh, to zero uh, absolutely without any problem. Uh, and uh, this form of metric can be used under horizon, and it's much, ma much more reliable than, than original strand pendeleve metric, because now we have uh, two coordinates. One, one is time-like, and one is space-like, space which is better uh, for uh, for understanding physical properties of metrics. Uh, so going further, uh, we can consider three velocity with respect to this metric. So if we, if we consider them as a frame, uh, it is possible to ask a question about uh, three velocity of a particle uh, with respect to this frame. So now we have two E. One is, uh, belongs to the frame itself, so this E naught. And one is E of the particle. So if particle moves uh, in, in uh, a black hole background, uh, uh, so what, what will be three velocity with respect to this frame? And uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this question uh, have posed uh, several times in the literature, and there are some other variants of these formulas. Uh, our variant, I think, is, is uh, rather symmetric. Uh, it is clear uh, uh, that if E is equal to E naught, then the velocity is, is zero. Of course, if uh, particle moves in, in the frame, which coincides with this particle, the relative velocity is zero. It, it, it is clear from the structure of this formula, and in general, the structure of this formula is rather symmetric and easy to, uh, to remember, so that we, we propose such kind of, of this formula. However, of course, uh, this formula has been uh, written, at least uh, similar formula has been written down, uh, I think, decade ago. Uh, but this, this formula is rather, is rather nice, uh, this form of formula. Uh, if we consider angular uh, motion so that we get the third component of, of, uh, uh, of the velocity with respect to the frame in this form, also general form. Uh, so what about, uh, what about limits? Uh, what is good is that uh, this uh, radial, radial uh, relative velocity is, is not equal to one uh, in, in the units of speed of light at the horizon. Because if we consider velocity with respect to stationary frame, then it is known that at the horizon it is always equal to one. But it is not due to the, some kind of uh, similar motions of different particles, but just because uh, stationary frame uh, diverges at horizon, it cannot exist any, anymore. And that's why we have uh, this limit for all particles, never, uh, despite the real motion of uh, particles can be, can be rather different. But this formula catches uh, this, so uh, the uh, radial velocity at horizon can vary from, from zero to unity, uh, depending on particular properties of, of the motion of a, of a particle. And this, this is the horizon value for uh, angular coordinate. This is true if both E and E naught have the same sign. 
Uh, however, it is possible that particles have, uh, for example, negative sign. Negative uh, energy is allowed in T region, so under horizon. Uh, also, under horizon, we can, uh, we can consider frames with, with negative energy. In this case, if, uh, if uh, signs are different, then the limit of uh, this velocity, radial velocity at horizon, is equal to 1, and uh, the uh, angular velocity at horizon is equal to 0, so exactly the same as, as in uh, stationary system, uh, as, as with respect to stationary coordinates. Uh, so near singularity, we have another limit. Near singularity, what is it uh, funny that uh, velocity, uh, uh, velocity, radial velocity goes to zero. So despite some kind of low velocity, how you can uh, in, uh, define it, it doesn't matter, but uh, our intuition tells us that this velocity diverges. Uh, uh, but uh, the relative velocity with respect to any frame so this, there are no dependence on E naught. This velocity goes to zero. Uh, as for angular velocity, it goes to one. That's why the pure radial motion appears to be unstable. If, if uh, angular velocity is not strictly equal to zero, then uh, near singularity, uh, the uh, of velocity will be dominated by angular motion. That radial motion co goes to zero. Uh, what is else also I can say? Uh, oh, yes, it's already two minutes, so that's uh, very quickly uh, this. Uh, we can also consider not only ingoing motion, but on, or also outgoing motion. So we, can, we consider not uh, also contracting, but expanding frames simply by reverting sign of phi. And so that uh, I consider uh, we, we get something like this, but with, uh, with in, uh, another sign. And the question is, we know that uh, expanding frame uh, cannot, uh, cannot, uh, can, uh, can live only in our region, so outside of horizon. It's impossible to have to, to, uh, for particle to move out, uh, outward uh, inside the horizon, but uh, uh, our formula seems not, not to know about it. Uh, but uh, uh, in reality, yes, uh, the uh, analog of good trantelometric uh, for expanding, uh, expanding uh, frame exists and is regular on the horizon, but not in, in, uh, in, in, the crucial, in the crucial diagram, not in the region of black hole, but in the region of white hole. So this is okay. Uh, uh, th there is no singularity at the horizon, but it exists not in only this region. So if we, we, if we think that we have a white hole, that of course we, we should use uh, these uh, uh, expanding frames. So our formula cover both uh, contracting and expanding frames and uh, uh, in a single formula, and we simply can to, to select uh, uh, the necessary sign depending on whether we will consider black hole or white hole. Uh, since there are, uh, and, and so that the, the general results about uh, horizon asymptotics uh, are listed here, so if uh, both signs coincide, sign of uh, uh, energy and uh, sign of uh, uh, motion, either inward or outward, then we have some kind of finite uh, uh, values of uh, velocities as horizon. If sign are different, then a radial horizon uh, tends to, to one, so speed of light, and angular horizon tends to zero. Uh, so that, uh, so I, I skip very interesting thing about uh, what we could see when we fall in uh, ourselves in, in a black hole. Uh, this can be, uh, can be found in our references. And so that's, I have two minutes, yes. So it, it's better for me to summarize, and not, not some, even summarize, but uh, pay attention on our, our, uh, on our works in where all these formulas are derived step by step. And so if you are interested in, in some detailed de derivation and discussion, uh, you can refer to our, our uh, our references. So we consider several cases when uh, free falling frames are better than uh, stationary frames. But stationary frames depend only on time, and uh, free falling frames depend on both uh, two coordinates on time and on a spatial coordinate. In some cases, it's better to, to use them. Uh, one is the di direct derivation of uh, red, blue, red or blue shift for free falling observers. Uh, sometimes there are pedagogical discussion about cosmological redshift. Because it is not purely Doppler, 
it is not gravitational redshift in the, if we consider gravitational redshift as just a difference in gravitational potential because in cosmology, in random cosmology, uh, there is no different gravitational, cosmology, uh, gravitational potential. Uh, so sometimes people propose some cosmological redshift as a third special part of redshift. But to our mind, it is, it is not the case. And as an example, we derived here in this paper the redshift for black hole using the matter system the same way as usually people derive uh, a redshift in cosmology, showing that there is no some kind of spe speciality for cosmology. Uh, the, the special for cosmology is just a synchronous coordinate system. If we use synchronous coordinate system in black hole, we will use the same derivation for uh, black hole and we get correct results. Uh, another thing is a uh, high energy collisions near horizon when uh, using a free falling frame gives a, a better understanding on this uh, and uh, particles which are slowly moving uh, with respect to stationary frame become uh, very fast moving with respect to free falling frame and vice versa. And that's, uh, and uh, for, uh, to our mind, uh, this gives us a uh, more intuitively clear uh, uh, consideration of high energy con uh, collision near horizon. Uh, uh, understanding free fall time to singularity, which I skip here, but it, it is rather interesting discussion uh, about uh, proper and limiter time when we fall into black hole because they behave rather differently. And those who are interested can, can refer to this uh, our paper. And uh, general formulas for three velocities, which I presented here, they are derived here rather uh, step by step. And also in this uh, paper we just uh, submitted to archive and it still is not uh, published, uh, we generalized this formula for uh, radial motion, not only radial motion of uh, particle, but radial motion of frame. So we consider also frame, which are, uh, sorry, radial motion, angular motion, of course. Of, of particle and angular motion of frame. So we consider not only not, radi uh, not radially falling a particle, but not radially falling frames. And so that in this paper, we, we got the most general uh, um, formula for three velocity for radial, uh, for not radial, for, for free fall into uh, spherically symmetric uh, black hole background. This is uh, our references and thank you. So, uh, many thanks to organizers for nice meeting and invitation. So, I will speak about a um, certain model with anisotropic fluid, and uh, we will consider this talk I just should mention was based on our paper with Sergei Bulohov. And uh, so, <coughs> I will not uh, give the introduction uh, physical because uh, it was done in many reports, even nice report of Professor Yuta Kunso, uh, that why it's important uh, the, the study of black holes and uh, connection with many other things, say gravitational waves and other. So, uh, we, uh, I'm sorry, um, I, and uh, we consider here some black hole solution which was obtained maybe 20 years before in our paper with uh, Denon and Professor Melnikov. 
this is uh, solutions which are parameterized by some natural number q. Or q equals to one, it uh, becomes uh, the rise and north term solution charge, uh, black hole solution. And for q to infinity, go, go, it's, uh, we have a Schwarzschild network. So uh, here the brief plan here. So uh, and uh, next we uh, just consider the network. Uh, this is a four-dimensional metric, spherical symmetric, which describes black hole solution, uh, which is supported by a stress energy tensor of anisotropic fluid. Uh, we see here. Mm, well, uh, this is stress energy tensor. So uh, radial pressure is negative uh, and less or equal to minus rho. And uh, tendential, tendential uh, pressure is opposite inside this radial. So it may be uh, verified that all energy conditions are satisfied here for this. Uh, equation of states. Then we consider the Einstein equation that we may just verify that there is a solution, black hole solution, or with such metric and with such density parameter. Well, uh, that here mu is, two mu is just the radius gravitational radius and uh, uh, as I and uh, sorry it's important here that uh, the metric depends upon some uh, function which is uh, so-called modular function which depends upon two parameters one is mu uh, and one is p p just uh, for q equals to one we have a uh, rise and north term solution with q squared equals to p times p, p plus 2 mu. And here uh, the parameter q is also just presented. Well, uh, as I told that for infinity we have a short solution. So in, uh, you may say that there is a, some stairs between rise and north term to Schwarzschild solution. And Q is just uh, label these stairs. Well, and um, then um, the global structure is just following that for uh, for even Q we have just uh, Carter Penderon's diagram just like for Schwarzschild, and uh, for uh, odd uh, one, three, and five we have like for Rystam Nostrum. Then, uh, so in this case, we have two horizons, and in this case, only one horizon. Uh, and, uh, well, uh, well, I will not consider here this talk the extremal case, so it's not important for this consideration. And uh, we may just calculate the post intended parameters, which are, sorry, gamma is one, like for Schwarzschild and for Better, we have some deviation from Schwarzschild case, uh, and which are related to this parameter p. So, uh, just a standard calculation for Hawking temperature and uh, Bekenstein Hawking entropy give us the following formula. We may see that the product is just proportional to mu, and not and there are no p there in this product. After that, uh, quasi-normal modes. Oh, well, this is a very nice topic. Uh, a lot of papers, uh, maybe 50 years uh, before it was a uh, pioneer paper of Vishweshwara, who just suggested this. Uh, and uh, as was told in some talks here, that in ring down stage of this uh, major uh, process of black holes, which uh, <coughs> and um, the gravitational rays emitted, maybe just described by uh, quasi-normal modes. 
that here we consider just a toy model for here we consider only test uh, scalar field this is just general uh, consideration of uh, for the normal normal modes that uh, we well we here consider some test uh, scalar field and consider massless this uh, Klein Fox Gordon equation uh, on the background on this uh, matrix, so neutral scalar field, and uh, uh, just uh, by separation of error variables, this angular part standard and the part dependent of radial coordinate here, you get a radial equation. Uh, what is uh, just uh, here we use technically this torture totus. Uh, coordinate R, uh, R star. Well, um, uh, uh, the quasi-normal mo mo quasi modes are unusual from the point of quantum mechanics because it's unusual uh, boundary conditions. So uh, usually we in quantum mechanics have a discrete spectrum when uh, the wave functions goes to zero for infinity. But here the wave function uh, functions goes to infinity, not zero. But in some, uh, another difference is that here the frequencies are complex, so it's contained in some imaginary part which give us the increasing, uh, decreasing in time of the uh, wave function. So, and here we just calculated the, by using this, uh, a reduction to the effective potential uh, and uh, just separating the uh, aconal part of it. We just calculated this quasi normal modes in aconal approximation when L, the angular momentum uh, number, is very large or goes to infinity. So it's just calculated by standard formulas. Uh, here, sorry. Well, uh, standard formulas where here the potential, effective potential at the point of maximum, and it's the second derivative. This formula just may be obtained from the formula, if you inverse the potential, from the formula for unharmonic oscillations uh, and just uh, certain rotation here. There is a method of Hatsuda when we need to uh, make a continuation in, sorry, in uh, Planck's constant, but th there are many other approach. And we just, uh, for this model, we have calculated this, uh, in, in aconal approximation, these uh, frequencies, thank you, uh, just real part and uh, imaginary part. Well, and uh, the important, uh, just for, uh, uh, Rice and Norton case, we obtained the good correspondence with uh, the Anderson paper, and for uh, Q goes to infinity with uh, other paper for Schwarzschild. And uh, after that, uh, the, mm, there is a problem how to calculate this uh, point of maximum. Uh, by the way, this uh, uh, radio coordinate for the maximum point of effective, effective potential is just the radius of photonic sphere, so it's no effect. For, and we get uh, for this uh, uh, case a uh, master equation for a different Q uh, here. Sorry. Uh, well, uh, and the main, uh, one of the main results here that we uh, just uh, test the so-called hot conjecture, that uh, hypothesis that relate the imaginary part of quasi-normal modes with Hawking temperature. Uh, it was suggested by Hot, and we just verified that this is, uh, conjecture is satisfied just by using the A canal approximation for all Q except Q equal to one. Uh, and this, it was just uh, necessary to prove, to verify, prove this 
and equality. It was done analytically. But for Q equals to 1, <coughs> the situation is more complicated. That means that uh, it should be less than 1. And uh, there is some critical uh, charge when it's, uh, thank you, it's less than uh, this critical charge that it's maybe proved for uh, Reston Nordstrom or Q equals to 1. But if it's more, then you should consider not a canal approximation, but lower uh, multiple numbers and it should be considered well, separately. There is some paper very close to that with uh, our Kazakh people. I just should mention the paper of Tsvetich Gibbons Pope mm -hmm. that a lot of things important were done there. Well, um, just conclusions. Well, uh, I maybe in two words say that we consider our uh, old metric just and calculate it in a canal approximation, this quasi-normal normal modes, and just uh, have tested this whole conjecture, and it was okay. So, thank you. <laughs> These two cases uh, were done in earlier papers. I, I just uh, cited the Anderson paper and it was some other paper. I forgot the name. Uh, uh, I forgot. Just uh, uh, so it was done. And we simply generalize in some sense. What is the convenience? Uh, well, uh, this is another metric, so. It's not, uh, it was not done, not for Schwarzschild, just for maybe another application because it may be considered some local uh, manifestations of dark matter very far from us. So. Yes. Uh, uh, Sorry, um, your question is about dependence of this temperature upon this Q, Q, Q parameter. It's not your Q, 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 Q parameter, your metric, but another, not quadruple <laughs> moment. So um, Q parameter, what is it? Uh, maybe, uh, well, it's some, there exists some effective uh, field theory with such Q that maybe, uh, just uh, mo effectively modeled by this uh, anisotropic fluid. Well, but this is standard uh, calculation for uh, Hawking temperature. So in paper of York, so maybe I don't understand the question, but maybe we discuss it later.
давайте микрофон. А что про указкой? Вот. Good evening. <coughs> This is our current joint work with uh, the postgraduate student Ivan Kichikin, who actually made most of the calculations here. The work is about the motion of charged particles in Gutsunayev Manko space time, which is an exact solution of Einstein Maxwell system. The solution is magnetostatic. It is axially symmetric. <coughs> It also has a mirror symmetry with uh, respect to the equatorial plane. The magnetic field in the solution is asymptotically dipole. And uh, if you turn off the magnetic field, then the solution reduces to Schwarzschild. The solution has two singularities near the poles. Uh, here are some details. Uh, <coughs> it is written in prolate ellipsoidal coordinates, which we have seen today already. <coughs> uh, the singularities occurs, uh, occur when uh, the denominators vanish. The similarities are essential, not only metric, but uh, also curvature and uh, the magnetic field diverge on singularity. <coughs> uh, the solution depends on two constants, alpha and T, and uh, those constants are related to mass and dipole moment. <coughs> so we can see here that uh, the parameter alpha has this maximum value. It is convenient to make equations in ellipsoidal coordinates, but for illustration, we use uh, logarithmically scaled, scaled uh, cylindrical coordinates. The motion of the particle is driven by the standard Lagrangian. Because of the symmetries, the energy is conserved and uh, the projection of angular momentum is conserved too. If we substitute these conservation laws to the four velocity <coughs> norm equation, we will get this equation which can be interpreted as uh, the sum of uh, effective kinetic energy and uh, effective potential energy. And the sum is equal to constant. So the problem is effectively reduced to the motion in two-dimensional effective potential. Uh, the potential depends on three parameters, <coughs> alpha, uh, angular momentum, and uh, the charge. So depending on these parameters, it can behave very differently. For example, if we fix the value of magnetic field, we will have these areas of charge and momentum uh, with uh, different numbers of stationary points of potential. The dashed lines correspond to the vanishing Hessian in equatorial plane, and solid lines correspond to the vanishing Hessian in Uh, above the plane. So in this region we have one stationary point above the plane, here we have two points, and uh, here we have no points above the plane. We start uh, the calculations here in this region because uh, the effective potential here resembles the classical problem the most. In this case, the control lines are like this. Here we can see uh, one, two, three, four points in equatorial plane, uh, two maxima and two minima. And here is uh, the minima above the plane. Uh, still in uh, 
this case, the, uh, the variety of possible types of orbits is great. So we restrict ourselves to only simple periodic uh, orbits, symmetric with respect to the equatorial plane. Uh, here is also the effective potential in equatorial plane. Uh, here we have one well. Uh, we can interpret it as the magnetic well because uh, the potential for magnetic dipole behaves like distance in minus three and the potential for gravity behaves like uh, distance in minus one. So here <coughs> the Lorentz force, force dominates and here the gravity dominates. If we lower the charge, the left barrier lowers and uh, disappears at some point. And if we increase the charge, then uh, the barrier between the well uh, lowers and uh, disappears also. And here are the types of simple periodic orbits. These are poloidal projections. So actually, the particle moves like this. It moves upward and then it returns along that curve and spontaneously it rotates about, rotates about the symmetry axis. The classification of such orbits was proposed by Markelos for classical problem of motion in pure dipole magnetic field. So here we have uh, the same types of orbits, uh, even ones cross the equatorial plane at uh, one point, and uh, odd ones cross the plane at two points. The classification depends on the, those curves. Uh, here on vertical axis, the square of energy, and uh, on horizontal axis is the starting point, point for an uh, orbit. Uh, all the curves start on the effective potential and end on effective potential also. Uh, here is the F0 family, also called principal family. Uh, this family also has separate branch in gravitational well. Uh, the stability of orbit changes at these dots. <coughs> so, the, for example, the F0, F0 family is unstable here. Then in, it has a stable region, and after it crosses the F one family, it becomes unstable again, and here at the bottom it is, there is a small stable region again. Uh, odd families are stable here at the top and uh, near the bottom. <coughs> the stability is determined by Poincaré mapping method. If you launch the particle from equatorial plane upwards, then you wait when it crosses the equatorial plane from below. If uh, the trajectory is periodic, then the beginning of the, uh, of the trajectory and the end should coincide. But if you have some displacement of initial condition, then the intersection coordinates also displaced, uh, are displaced. And if they are small, we can write that linearized mapping. Uh, for symmetric orbits, the stability is determined only by this parameter R. It should be less than unity. Uh, here its excellent value should be less than unity. So this is an example for F3 family. Uh, this is the stable part. 
You can also see the stability of the trajectories on one crest of the section. And stable trajectories form this islands of stability. For example, this is F second. Uh, this is F5, which has two islands because it crosses the planet at two points. And here is the F4. And for other energy, we have stable F0 and F3. Unstable trajectories uh, give rise to chaotic behavior. The intersections with the plane um, fill some two dimensional regions on this surface. Uh, so we have for this exact solution of Einstein Maxwell equations similar behavior as in the classical problem. Next, what we want to do is to change uh, parameters of the problem and to see what will happen to these families of trajectories. Uh, so what we have already done is the increase of the charge with the increase of the charge, this uh, barrier between two wells, between the magnetic well and gravitational well, disappears, and this additional branch of F0 family uh, merges with the main part of this family. So that's all what was done. Thank you for attention.